Hey, thanks for that gracious introduction. Uh, I'm often confused with one of my older brothers, Theodore, but it's Theodis, actually. But I do appreciate that, uh, Grant. Um, and thank everyone for joining us on this day. This is a very historic day. Um, this year's Medical Cannabis Day, we want to commemorate this by dedicating to the late great, our civic leader, our queen mother, Miss Marcia Joyner, who has passed on um, recently. So we want to give our gracious thanks to all the hard work that she has done for us. I'm going to play a video of some of the past Cannabis Chronicle events on Think Tech TV, in which Camo, Camo helped co-host and co-found. Um, I think you guys are going to enjoy this. You're going to see some special appearances from a couple of people that you may be familiar with. And we're going to get started. In the background, you're going to hear a dialogue with Ms. Joyner. I'm talking to Dr. Clifton Otto, who you'll hear from next about the importance of this very day. Enjoy. For me, but even then, we had a federal aviation regulation on the books since 1970, specifically exempts the carriage of marijuana aboard aircraft if it's authorized by either federal uh, or state law or federal or state agencies. So this is a situation again where state law can directly impact upon the federal regulation of cannabis. And yet, well, is no one, does no other than anybody, does anybody know that? We all, sure they, sure they do. Um, you know, this information uh, has been given to our state lawmakers for the past two years. Uh, this year, my focus was on submitting uh, as much testimony as possible uh, because I just didn't have the time to go sit through all these public hearings. Right. And so, so some of, I think some of that information uh, is being looked at and is being incorporated. I, I, I did submit testimony for the Interim Transportation piece that was incorporated into this bill that's now on the governor's desk. So, oh, but, uh, but, but, but this is an issue that, that's so, has been so controversial over the years, and because of this misconception that everybody's violating federal law means that people just don't want to deal with it. They would rather not be associated, and, and I'm afraid that that is really just perpetuating the current dilemma and, and actually causing a lot of patients who could benefit from this to shy away completely because of this fear of violating federal law. Now, you mentioned uh, that, you know, your relationship with, with the um, medical school. What about the law school? Because I just saw an attorney, a young attorney, who knew nothing of what you're saying, and he was saying it's all illegal, it's da 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 and it was clear that he did not know. So what have, have we reached out to the law school? I've reached out professor to professors at the law school asking if they had any students who would like to Notion need you to unmute comes into this and and how there has to be a interaction between state and federal law in order for things to run smoothly and and it's because that we are not recognizing that interaction that we're in the situation that we're in right now. Now speaking of interactions. You sent me this beautiful proclamation uh, about Hawaii Medical Cannabis Day, which is again June 14th. So I'm going to read the proclamation. Whereas the authority to accept medical use of controlled substance is retained by the states under our system of government known as federalism. And whereas the state of Hawaii determined that cannabis has medical use in Hawaii on June 14, 2000, when Governor Cayetano signed Hawaii's Medical Use of Cannabis Act. And whereas Hawaii's Medical Use of Cannabis Act was codified as Act 228 
under Section 9 of Hawaii's Uniform Control Substance Act. And whereas Hawaii has upgraded a state regulated medical use of cannabis program for the past 19 years without any opposition from the U.S. Department of Justice. And whereas Hawaii's medical use of cannabis program has enabled tens of thousands of patients with debilitating medical conditions to benefit from the personal medical use of cannabis in Hawaii under medical supervision. And whereas the medical use of cannabis in Hawaii is currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, which means that the federal regulation that lists cannabis as a Schedule One controlled substance does not apply. Uh, does not apply to the medical use of cannabis in Hawaii. Therefore, I, David White, E. Gates, Governor, and I, Josh P. Green, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Hawaii, do hereby proclaim June 14 as Medical Cannabis Day in Hawaii, and ask the people of the Aloha State to join us in recognizing that medical use of cannabis in Hawaii is lawful activity under both state and federal law. Done at the state capitol, executive chambers, on the loop, this 14th day of June, 2019. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you. So now what should we do? Well, now that you know, with the proclamation, what, what do you want us to do? Well, I, I should point out that this is a proclamation request, and this was the form that was submitted to the governor's office. So this is, it has not been approved yet. Some people I've shown this to say, wow, this is great that we have a proclamation, but we're still waiting for approval from the governor's office. And this came out of um, the fact that back in April, right around April 20th, I was receiving some emails from some of us that were advertising 420 as a special day with special sales offers to patients. And you probably didn't know 420 is a recreational term that um, uh, was adopted by that culture. And so my feeling was why do our dispensaries that are, that are providing cannabis for medical use to our patients having to associate with a recreational use holiday? And so I was trying to figure out, well, couldn't there be a better day that we could use to educate patients and to support the medical use of cannabis in Hawaii? And I did a little research and realized that well, actually, June 14th is that day. And as you can see, I'll come back. Oh, okay. well, June 14th is Wednesday. Well, and maybe there will be a flag flying above the Capitol on that day, because I did put in a flag request to our Congresswoman Gabbard as well. So that would be quite a nice coincidence. But, but the idea was to recognize what our state really did. And unfortunately, when you read about this in the paper, they say, oh, Hawaii legalized medical cannabis. Well, the reason that that term is being used by the media is because they go off of whatever the Associated Press has in their style book. And the Associated Press does not have the term accepted the medical use of cannabis, which means none of the media can use that term. And and I've asked uh, Associated Press to consider adding that term to their book, and they said, well, they're in discussions about it. But anyway, I, I think it's very important that we use the correct terminology and that we recognize that actually what Hawaii did was accept the medical use of cannabis. Congress never defined accepted medical use uh, in the Federal Controlled Substance Act, which under federalism, also leaves it up to the states to decide uh, whether they want to give medical use to controlled substances. So that term, accepted medical use, is critical because then that impacts upon the Federal Controlled Substance Act, which says that a substance cannot be in Federal Schedule One if it has accepted medical use 
and we already have very good uh, history, uh, case uh, history on the various pieces that support uh, state accepted medical use being currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States. And the guys enjoyed that quick video um, and enjoy this medical cannabis today it's very important to us we've all worked very hard to get this day accomplished thank you to the governor the attending governor's office all the mayors and all the patients just remember keep patients first and we'll be talking to you throughout the rest of the day thank you very much thank you Brent um, and it's it's really a pleasure to see all this come together Aloha, everybody, and, and welcome to Medical Cannabis Day 2021. Um, this event was created back in 2019 to honor our patients and recognize their right to engage in the state-authorized use of cannabis for medical purposes. Before we get started uh, with introducing our keynote speaker, I just wanted to thank all of our local organizations again on each island for all the work that they've done. Uh, especially Hawaii Patients Union for hosting this year's virtual event um, through primarily a volunteer uh, effort to create an experience uh, that we hope will mark the beginning uh, of a new chapter for Hawaii's medical cannabis program. I'd also like to thank Governor Ige, uh, Governor uh, Langiari, Governor Kawakami, and, and Governor Roth for uh, accepting our requests for uh, proclamations for this year's event. Also, an extra thanks to Mayor Kawakami for very graciously preparing a recorded message for this year's event, which I think really captures the intent and, and the spirit of, of this, uh, this event. So uh, I'd like to play that for you right now. Aloha. This is Mayor Derek Kawakami from the County of Kauai, and I hereby proclaim June 14th, 2021 as Medical Cannabis Day. Since the year 2000, tens of thousands of patients have been able to utilize medical cannabis to help their severe ailments and debilitating illnesses. This has provided very much comfort and relief, not only to the patients, but to the families that have to see these individuals suffer. To all of our clinics, our medical experts, our doctors, and especially to all the patients and families, we want to thank you folks for bringing this to our attention. May you folks have a wonderful day, have a wonderful meeting, God bless, and aloha. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, a uh, medical doctor in California who has been practicing cannabinoid medicine since 2008. Um, which includes providing not only direct patient care in the clinic, 
but also education on cannabis healthcare to providers across the globe. Education that is critical to our understanding of the exceptional ways that, that patients are using cannabis for medical purposes and quite literally saving lives. Luckily for us, Dr. Goldstein has collected this information in a form that uh, will make it possible for even more of us to understand the appropriate use, medical use of cannabis in a way that really highlights uh, an attitude that we are trying to cultivate here in Hawaii, which is that cannabis is medicine and deserves to be respected as such. It is my honor and, and pleasure to welcome Dr. Bonnie Goldstein to Medical Cannabis Day 2021. Well, thank you so much and aloha to everybody who's uh, there. I wish I was there with you in Hawaii, uh, hopefully soon. And I put together a little presentation for today. Believe it or not, there's so much information that I want to share that like, you need a couple of days to really go through it all. So I've condensed it down, hopefully into... Uh, a half hour. So wave at me if I go over, um, but I'm happy to um, share um, some of the basics as to why cannabis is medicine, um, what I've seen with patients and the direction that I think that we're going um, as more and more people um, change their minds about this and decide to ignore the propaganda and look at the science and, you know, it's interesting, yesterday I read an anecdote uh, or I read a quote that said, if um, the anecdotal evidence or anecdotal reports don't meet uh, or don't um, support what the science is showing, and remember we have so much science showing that cannabis is bad for you and that was directed 1970s, 1980s and so on, still today doctors repeating this stuff um, not realizing that there was an underlying agenda um, and not even knowing about the endocannabinoid system at the time. But I, this quote said, if the anecdotes don't, um, aren't the same as the science, you're obviously doing the science wrong. And I love that because I know my patients aren't lying to me. I know that millions of people out there who are getting relief from cannabis are not lying. Um, it's just not something that people who are suffering will do. They will tell you when it's not working. They will tell you when it is working. They will continue to use it if it's helping and they will stop if it's not. And it's, it's not any more difficult than that. So let me just get started here. Um, and so just a little bit about me. I've been a California uh, licensed physician for 30 plus years. I trained at Children's Hospital LA to be a pediatrician and was chief resident there and then I kind of got the bug for uh, critical care transport medicine, which I did, uh, which was very exciting for a few years. And then I transitioned into pediatric emergency medicine, where I worked at the LA County USC Medical Center, very busy hospital. I did that for about 13, 14 years. And then in 2008, uh, my eyes were open to cannabis. It wasn't really on my radar. A friend got sick, uh, asked me about it. I didn't know anything. So I just did some research for her and it completely blew my mind um, and made me realize that this is medicine. And um, I transitioned from emergency medicine work, which by the way, is very hard when you're a mom also, um, to working in a cannabis clinic here in Los Angeles. And I just fell in love with the practice. And since then I've treated, our office has seen over 18,000 patients, including over a thousand children, which is what I specialize in now. And then I uh, wrote a book back in 2015 or 2016 and self-published it. And then it was picked up by a publisher and completely updated and revised just in the last few, uh, last year. And it came out at the end of September last year called Cannabis is Medicine. And so in the book, I do try to just get rid of all the propaganda and just put what we know, what we've seen, what the science supports. Um, really um, no frills, just all the data that you need to be able to make a decision as to whether or not cannabis is medicine. I think it is. Um, as you all know, cannabis was used as medicine for thousands and thousands and thousands of years before it was uh, made illegal. And we know in the 1840s, Dr. William O'Shaughnessy from um, the UK uh, decided to use a scientific method to determine whether or not it was medicine. And he concluded that it was medicine in, when, in his scientific research. 
Uh, and between 1840 and 1900, there was over 100 medical reports documenting medical value. And by the way, if you're interested in seeing these reports, you can go to Google Scholar and you'll see there's, you can pick years and you pick your years and put in either cannabinoid, you can put in ganja, you can put in um, hashish, all kinds of different terminology, and you can see these medical reports and they're fascinating. There's a report of a doctor treating a baby with epilepsy from the 1800s, where he showed that the baby stopped having seizures, amazing stuff. And then as we know, cannabis was prescribed by doctors until 1937. And here's just some bottles that I always find interesting. And there are people out there who collect these bottles. I think it's terrific. I'd be so excited if I was at a, a, a flea market or something and found one, <laughs> I would pay whatever for it. Um, but certainly we know that people use this for thousands and thousands of years as medicine. Um, and uh, then here comes along uh, this nonsense. And as you can see, we have all this brainwashing you know, I love this one with the uh, devil uh, and, you know, uh, having their arms around your child. Um, and certainly we know that this is still propagated by some people uh, today. And it's really unfortunate because remember at the time that this was put out into our world, they had no idea of the endocannabinoid system. They didn't know what THC was. It hadn't been identified. They didn't have any idea really even of how the human brain worked. Um, and so um, it's nonsense. And I find it crazy that people still buy into this today. And as was mentioned in the last uh, presentation by Theo, um, uh, they were talking about cannabis being on the schedule. And as you can see, unfortunately it is schedule one. Um, and from my understanding um, and my opinion is that we do not move it to a schedule two or schedule three. It needs to be descheduled. It doesn't fit the criteria for uh, the Controlled Substance Act. It needs to be completely descheduled. Uh, we need to be allowed to do the research. And we also uh, know that cannabis is so extraordinarily safe. And how do I know that? Well, 13 years of treating patients, I have yet to see anybody harmed by it, including young children who I have treated, you know, um, hundreds and hundreds of them under the age of 10 with high dose cannabis to either save their life from cancer or from epilepsy and you know 50 seizures a day. It is so safe. I, and I'm a chicken. My husband jokes around, if you unzip me, there's a chicken inside. I'm very conservative physician. I'm very careful. I would not give medicine to a child that I wouldn't give to my own child. And certainly uh, cannabis has no business at all being on the Controlled Substance Act, much less as a Schedule I uh, substance. So hopefully we will see this soon. Hopefully there's somebody brave enough in the federal government to finally listen to what we're saying. Um, so let's move on here. So if you look at this graph, what you can see is um, and I got this from PubMed and PubMed um, will show you from any um, articles if you search. So all I did was search medical cannabis and uh, these are the articles that came up. And I may have missed a few articles just because it wasn't, uh, the, the, the search terms weren't applied to that. But what you can see is here, um, you can see um, that uh, the research uh, it goes all the way back to 1840 because there are reports back then. And you can see a little blip around 1945, but notice the little blip in interest in the late 60s and early 70s. And that comes from a research uh, that was being done when the Controlled Substance Act was uh, being uh, formulated. And uh, there were numerous studies that show that it shouldn't be there, but they disregarded it. And then you can see kind of the lull and a lot of that lull over, you know, this area, I hope you can see my pointer here through this area here. This is all part of, you know, there's a few scientists interested. They're looking at uh, data mostly in Israel and a few other places, but really no um, significant publications about the use of medical cannabis or its medical use. And that's because the Controlled Substance Act dictates that. If it's a schedule one, you may study the detriment, but not the benefits. And we are still fighting that right now, even though the DEA says they're gonna open it up. Uh, hopefully we're making some movement, but as you can see, you're, you're now seeing um, 
what happens uh, over time. And when you look here around 2013, 2012, 2013 is when CBD starts to be um, uh, mentioned in the media. And there's a documentary about a little girl with epilepsy. And sure enough, then the scientific world is paying attention and the uh, articles explode. And as you can see last year, so remember 2021 is not done yet. I assume it will be at least as much as uh, 2020, but certainly 2020, there were a lot of articles published, maybe because people were home and productive because of COVID, they weren't sitting on the freeway in traffic. Um, but we see a huge number of articles documenting medical cannabis. And uh, luckily, um, um, science, the scientists and researchers and physicians are starting to pay attention. And as you can see, here's the highlights of uh, the various important kind of um, times when uh, uh, we can see the research really changing. So in terms of major scientific discoveries, remember 1964 was when Dr. Mishulam, who's pictured here, um, uh, was teaching and he's a professor, a PhD in Israel. And he was curious about natural plant medicine and compounds. And in 1964, and believe me, this is probably not very easy to do um, because in 1964, we don't have great scientific equipment. Um, but he discovered uh, the compound that was the intoxicating compound. He isolated this compound out of cannabis and gave it to young, healthy volunteers who have the, the um, expected THC effects. He isolated CBD and gave it to young, healthy volunteers, and they didn't really feel anything. I'm assuming if they had given it to uh, those of us in my age group with arthritis, we would have felt better. Um, but young, healthy volunteers, they didn't... Um, say that they had any of the intoxicating effects. So he discovered THC in the plant, named it. And for 24 years, we still lack the understanding of how it worked. And in 1988, researchers here in St. Louis, at medical school in St. Louis, um, discovered the first uh, cannabinoid receptor. And in 1992, the second, I'm sorry, in 1992, they discovered the first endocannabinoid. So when they discovered the receptor, they realize that all receptors in our body, like we have serotonin receptors because we make serotonin. Um, we have dopamine receptors because we make dopamine. Well, they discovered a cannabinoid receptor that binds to THC. Well, we must make a compound that binds. So they found our endocannabinoids in 1992. And that, just think of endocannabinoid as your inner cannabis uh, molecules. And in 1995, scientists discovered the second endocannabinoid. And then within the scientific kind of researcher laboratories all over the country, the endocannabinoid system was kind of being looked at and studied, but it really didn't trickle down uh, uh, until, uh, and remember, by the way, at the same time, I was in medical school in, from 1986 to 1990. I didn't learn about it. And remember the AIDS epidemic hit around this time and people in, in, that had uh, HIV AIDS were using cannabis illegally. And that was kind of the push, especially you know, here in California, we have 1996, a Compassionate Use Act that gets voted in. And that's not um, uh, an isolated event. It was because there was now some scientific proof that the endocannabinoid system regulated um, appetite and helped uh, these uh, poor patients with HIV AIDS who were at that time had no other medications, uh, at least to um, uh, have some uh, influence over their HIV wasting syndrome. Now let's talk quickly about the endocannabinoid system. So this is a system that the way to kind of think about it is it's a feedback loop um, and it's a system that is meant to balance you. So in this uh, picture, we have a neuron here, that's a nerve, a, a brain cell, and we have a neuron down here, another brain cell, and they're communicating with each other by sending neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitter gets released from this cell and heads down and um, binds to a receptor like a key in a lock on the receiving cell. So let's say the message that's being sent is a message of nausea. Uh, when this binds on, then this cell then transmits that same message. When I was in medical school, I learned that cells only talk to each other in a one-way street fashion. This cell talks to this cell and there's no feedback. And it turns out that the endocannabinoid system is that feedback loop. So if the message of nausea is being sent, 
Um, usually it's when there's too much message. So when you think about nausea, anxiety, pain, hyperactivity, seizures, it's all over firing. It's like too much message. What's supposed to happen is this bottom cell, the receiving cell gets annoyed, turns on a little factory, taking healthy fats from your diet. Oh, by the way, remember doctors 30 years ago told us not to eat healthy fat or fat at all. So that's part of the problem too. Um, but it takes healthy fat and puts it together and makes your inner cannabis compounds, what we call endogenous or endocannabinoids, which then travel backwards, opposite of what I was taught. The uh, key in the lock, the little uh, uh, inner cannabis compound binds to the receptor, which is this funny looking structure right here on the cell wall, sends a chemical message and this kind of uh, non arrow here, this block is basically telling the neurotransmitters dial it back. So if you've ever seen anybody with severe nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy, they take a puff off a joint and within minutes, they are feeling better. And in fact, they're able to eat a whole meal. How does that happen? Well, this receptor also accepts THC, uh, attaching to it, binding to it, um, the same way our inner cannabis does. And what we know is that people who have chronic stress, chronic illness, and overwhelming event that sometimes the endocannabinoid system cannot keep up. But understand, most important thing is this, this is a signaling system that functions to balance um, the cellular messages that are being sent. So again, what is the role? Is homeostasis balanced. So when we have a trigger like an illness, infection, inflammation, traumatic insult, even something like chemotherapy, anything that causes that imbalance where the body is saying, oh my goodness, let's, let's counteract this. The endocannabinoid system goes into uh, action, protecting, repairing, and recovering. And I'm sorry, that's uh, a little uh, defect or a little mistake there, but I apologize for that. Um, phytocannabinoids like THC, CBD, CBG, et cetera, all can influence the endocannabinoid system. They can also influence what we call non-endocannabinoid system targets. The endocannabinoid system doesn't exist in a vacuum. It crosses over with a lot of the other uh, compounds and, and uh, pathways in our body. So it's important to understand that we're not only targeting the endocannabinoid system, we're also targeting non-endocannabinoid system. And all of that leads to protecting, repairing, and recovering. So by using cannabis, you are augmenting your endocannabinoid system. And there are times when you might not want to do that, but certainly in face of chronic illness, people who are having a, um, any type of illness, infection, insult that causes anxiety, pain, appetite issues, sleep issues. These are all things that are balanced by the endocannabinoid system. So um, once the endocannabinoid system was discovered, these receptors were discovered, scientists decided to map where they are. Why does cannabis help? Everything is buried as cancer, fibromyalgia, sleep disorders, epilepsy, uh, pain that you have in your toe. How is it possible that cannabis can treat so many things? Well, look at where the receptors are. They're everywhere. They have a density in your brain, in your gut, in your immune system, but also it is the most widespread receptor system in the brain. And this is what drives me crazy as a physician is that like 95% of doctors ignore the fact that you even have an endocannabinoid system, because if they acknowledge it, then they have to acknowledge medical cannabis. And unfortunately, we're uh, still medical schools aren't teaching this, but you know, I call all of us here today enlightened. And we're enlightened to the idea that our body has all of these receptors and that we can use this plant as a wonderful tool for health. Why wouldn't we take advantage of the fact that these receptors are everywhere in our brain and body? All right, in 2003, my friend, um, Ethan Russo, who has been what I, who is what I call a medical cannabis guru, um, he hypothesized the idea of an endocannabinoid deficiency. So what if you don't make enough endocannabinoids when you have a trigger, how are you supposed to respond? And he um, hypothesized that people who have migraines, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, but also what he calls treatment resistant conditions. I know everybody listening knows somebody or maybe yourself suffering from chronic illness, 
go to 10 different doctors, try 50 different medications, and they cannot seem to find the solution. And so I always tell people two things, diet and, ca and cannabis. You got to think about those two things. And what are both of those things? Natural, mother nature, right? So we have to be understanding that there can be this glitch in your chemistry where you may not make enough endocannabinoids, but you may be able to achieve an endocannabinoid homeostasis by augmenting the system. And so he, he uh, outlines, and I highly recommend, there's a few articles with a similar title because it evolved over time, um, but this concept is similar to other human chemical deficiencies. So if you don't have dopamine, you have Parkinson's disease. If you don't have insulin, you have type one diabetes. And if you don't have acetylcholine, you may have Alzheimer's dementia. What are the drugs, the pharmaceuticals that we give to people who have these conditions is to um, fix the chemical deficiency or at least augment it as best we can. Um, since Dr. Russo posited that idea back in 2003, um, so here we are going almost 20 years, a deficiency or dysfunction of the endocannabinoid system has been implicated. And all of this information comes from the, the scientific literature in all of these different conditions. And again, how can it possibly be so many conditions? Well, remember these receptors are in many places in your brain and body. So anything related to you know, anorexia, obesity, metabolic syndrome, FTT is failure to thrive, uh, which is a condition in children, but also can be in adults. Anxiety, depression, so mood disorders, autism, autoimmune disorders, and again, the triad that Dr. Um, Russo outlined, migraine, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, epilepsy, schizophrenia, chronic motion sickness, PTSD, and more. It's almost hard to keep up, which is very exciting that there are scientists dedicating their life to researching the role and the manipulation of the endocannabinoid system to try to impact human health in a positive way. Now let's talk about the plant. And so um, we know the plant has over 500 different natural compounds, over 140 phytocannabinoids have been described. Of course, the two most famous compounds or most studied compounds are THC and CBD. We also know there's uh, terpenoids and flavonoids and um, so many other compounds in the plant that we don't even really know a lot about again, because research has been prohibited. Uh, but what we know about the plan is that there is this idea of the entourage effect, which some people still doubt, uh, but yet there's research, very recent research coming out showing that this idea actually um, uh, does exist. And what is the entourage is that each of these compounds has their own medicinal properties, but when taken separately versus taken in the natural form, what we would call full spectrum, broad spectrum, along with all the other compounds, not removing it out and isolating it, but taking it along with the way mother nature gives it to us in the flower, as you can see, there's a female flower here, um, that it actually works better. You have a decrease in unwanted effects and an enhancement of the desired effects. And so that's a very important concept. Um, and in my experience, there's no question in my clinical experience that I see entourage working very well for many patients. And of course, the picture here is just a close up. The middle picture is a close up of the flower with its trichomes. And those are the little factories where cannabinoids are synthesized. And then the picture to the right just shows the three ring, 21 carbon basic skeleton of most uh, cannabinoids. And as you can see, they all kind of look very similar. And many of them overlap in their medicinal properties and many have some singular medicinal properties. Uh, very, it's, a, it's quite fascinating. Here is a um, schematic of um, how the plant actually uh, makes all the different cannabinoids. So remember there's raw cannabinoids when you have the raw flower. You're gonna have CBGA, which is the parent uh, precursor to all of the other cannabinoids. And depending on the genetics of the plant, you're gonna see uh, different, um, G, um, different expression of enzymes that convert CBGA, cannabigerolic acid, to various compounds. It's kind of like 
Uh, your genes determine your eye color in your hair. So your genes for the, the plants, genes determine which way it's gonna go. And of course that can be manipulated by breeding and some other methods. Um, but what we see here is remember in the raw form, A at the end. And uh, when I first started in this field back in 2008, we did not think that the raw forms had any benefits whatsoever. And I had this patient that came in that told me he ate raw cannabis and I thought he was nuts but he said it helped him with his inflammation. He was a bodybuilder and he said it. if he didn't do it, he had tremendous um, pain after working out. And if he did do it, he felt great. And so I thought, okay, you know, whatever works. Um, and it, lo and behold, the studies certainly support the anti-inflammatory nature of rock uh, cannabinoids as well as other uh, things that they do, including anti-epilepsy, um, anti-cancer and so on. Uh, we know humans heat up cannabis, and so uh, when you heat it up, you cleave off one carbon and two oxygens in a process called decarboxylation, and then we get uh, these compounds, THC, CBD, and so on. And then as cannabis ages, you also get a whole slew of compounds as well. And then I put a list here of compounds that I actually have treated patients with. When I started in this field, all we had was Delta 9 THC. That's it. Take it or leave it. It either worked for you or it didn't. And then in 2012, CBD started to become available here in California. And then slowly, um, it just, every time you turned around, there was a new compound on the market. So the main ones that I use mostly, Delta 9 THC, THCA a lot. Uh, CBD, CBDA, and CBG. Uh, CBC is just now available, and I'm starting to use that in some patients. CBDV was available for a short time here in California, but I haven't, um, I think the grower stopped growing it. Delta 8 THC is now kind of in the news. It's like the new uh, CBD media attention getter. And what's amazing is that now a patient, if THC didn't work for you or you didn't like the way it made you feel, you've got so many other options. My goodness, the plant is what Dr. Uh, Mishulam called it, which is a virtual treasure trove of uh, medication, medicines. Now, everybody knows about terpenes. There are essential oils found in the plant. There's over 2,000 um, that have been identified, but 200 have been described in the cannabis plant. We know terpenes give cannabis its aroma and occurs cross species, and they work synergistically to enhance medicinal effects. The terpenes are very important. Uh, there are patients, when a patient says, I like this strain and not that strain, that's not because of the, let's say the THC is equal in both. It's because of the effects of the terpenes. And again, that entourage effect and that synergistic balance that you get when you, um, when you uh, make sure to uh, keep those terpenes present. Now, in terms of adult conditions, we know, my goodness, so many different conditions, but my practice, which right now I focus on children, but I've seen so many adults, uh, this is kind of the order in which I've seen people. So chronic pain by far number one, and then um, uh, other psychiatric, number two, psychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression. But remember, chronic pain comes with this. A lot of people who never had depression before have it because they have chronic pain. That's not being treated properly. Uh, sleep disorders for sure is a very large one that we see. And I have to say that I ask every single patient about sleep and they all about 90 plus percent will say that cannabis helps with sleep. And then you can see the rest of the list, cancer, autoimmune, GI disorders, neurodegenerative, uh, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord and palliative care end of life. In pediatrics, very similar treatment resistant epilepsy, autism, cancer, genetic syndromes, uh, CPM spasticity, and then some of the um, a psychiatric stuff and then chronic pain, which luckily is not that common in pediatric. And then of course, very sadly, end of life care. And then I just throw in here, I just wanna share with this, share with you this. I got this text message um, and in the picture here where he's a little guy, where sporting his little faux hawk there, uh, was the first day he came to see me and he was this, this um, uh, beautiful little boy was having seizures on his DEG just about every minute. And he had never responded to any medication. And the super sad thing was he has a brother, uh, an uncle who is completely debilitated from the similar condition. And the, when they came to see me, the mother said, I cannot have my son end up as my, end up like my brother. I need to find something that works. 
And uh, he's been my patient. Now we're going on six or seven years at this point. He's like this big, huge teenager. Now um, you can see the picture down at the bottom with his new little baby brother. And the mom sent me this beautiful kind of reminder, five years seizure free today. So how that is not, how doctors look at this and say, it's still not a medicine I don't understand. I'll just never understand it. Um, it has completely changed this child's life and has allowed him to develop normally without seizures interfering with his brain function. And so I have two minutes and I've got two case reports and then we'll wrap up. So um, this is the story about a little boy that came to me. So he's six year, he was five when he came to me, six years old now, and he had three strokes right when he was born and nobody knows why. Um, and he ended up having cerebral palsy, seizures, sensory processing disorder. Uh, when he came to me, he had self-harming behavior, poor attention and speech delay. I think he had a few words, no, yes, but only in response to what uh, his his parents would say to him, uh, he never had spontaneous speech. So we started CBD low dose and slowly tiptoed up. And I will say that his parents were a little bit nervous. They all, most parents are. Um, and he had improved speech and cognition. There was clear cut improvement. We added THCA next, but he became drowsy even at a tiny dose. So we discontinued that, left the CBD on board. And then we added CBG. In my population of patients with autism, I've been observing improved speech in about 30%. So for those families that uh, want to see if we can uh, attempt an improvement in speech, we always try CBG. And now he has spontaneous speech, putting three and four words together uh, and, and much better focused and also improved motor skills. And what's interesting is the therapists that work with him on a regular basis have been pointing out to the mom these incredible leaps of achievement in his therapy, and they don't even know that he's on uh, cannabis as far as I know. So that's also a very nice um, testimonials when people who don't know notice the difference in the child. And then um, this is from an email. Additionally, he started drinking from his own straw cup completely independently. He could previously drink from a straw, but this time he's holding the cup, drinking, putting it down until he's ready for more. And he started to try to self-feed with a fork, even telling us no when we try to help. And that's good. We want children to have an opinion and to, and to share with us what they're thinking, right? We're so pleased with all the progress he's made over the past couple of weeks, and he's really proud of himself too. So this is obviously a success story and um, uh, certainly can show you that um, we can try to reverse some of these, especially in a brain that's plastic in young people, um, and I say young people, I mean, even into their twenties, I have a, a patient who I've been following since teenager into twenties, who's still showing improvement despite years of brain damage from seizures. So I don't get, we don't give up on anybody. We try and certainly with a safe medicine. Um, but this shows you that this really can change the prognosis, not just symptoms today, but prognosis for this child. And then um, I wanna just kind of go to the other end of life to an 87 year old man that I've been helping who has dementia. He's been having dementia now for a number of years requiring full-time care, severe anxiety, uncooperative, poor appetite, poor sleep, agitated, difficult to calm down, terrible response to medications. And he stopped smiling and laughing and that seemed to really bother his family. Um, because of where they live and what they had access to, we started with a 10 to one ratio that was easily accessible by the daughter who happens to be an RN. Um, and we start low dose and titrated up and we got up to about 50 milligrams of CBD a day. Um, and we didn't notice he was definitely calmer, but we didn't notice any benefit at a higher dose. So we dialed it to uh, 50 milligram twice a day. And then we added in low dose THC to kind of get down, uh, lower that uh, ratio and titrated up very small amounts, little by little, the tremor, the sleep, the appetite, all significantly improved at just a very low dose added in of THC, 2.5 milligrams, three times a day. And here's the email. Dad is doing so much better. He's calm and pleasant again. And we now have been able to wean him off Haldol. Uh, he's able to tell us his needs and wants. Now, for instance, he has to go for a walk, uh, to the lake yesterday, which he hasn't done in months. He's sleeping through the night, although here and there he has a bad night. 
We give extra THC when this happens and it seems to work well. One more thing, my mom and I think it's most important. He started smiling again after four years of no smiles or laughing. We're so happy with his results. Anybody who wants to deny somebody this at the end of life is cruel and inhumane. This is medicine and it needs to be free to be medicine. And um, uh, that is why I'm here to proclaim and, and try to get rid of all that propaganda and stereotypes and everything else. These are just everyday people. These are our family members. These are our neighbors. Um, these are the children of our community. Uh, there is absolutely no reason that we need to act like this is radioactive plutonium. It's medicine. Thank you very much. We're wishing you well, Kane, if you're, if you're watching from, from the hospital today. And um, Kane has a GoFundMe page. We'll, we'll share that information towards the end. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Bonnie. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. You. Someone had a question. Can I answer it real quick? Of course. It's, it's in there. It says, do I have a particular concern regarding hemp-derived Delta-8 synthesized from CBD precursor, i.e. uncharacterized isomers, et cetera? And so remember, you can get Delta-8 from the plant itself, or you can take CBD and put it through a process called acid catalysis and turn it into Delta-8 THC. But from my understanding from the chemists that I often consult in my world, that doing that acid catalysis and converting CBD to Delta-8 THC can give you some kind of leftover compounds that have not been characterized, that we don't know what they are. And uh, I think it's prudent to, at this point, uh, not necessarily put that stuff into your body until we know exactly what it is. I think Delta-8 THC is an excellent compound for those people who really don't like Delta, the effects of Delta-9 because it works the same way. It's just not nearly as potent. So people who are you know, are sensitive to Delta-9 THC, can they have a kind of like a lower level to use. And so, yes, I am concerned about that. And I am encouraging people to try to avoid um, uh, CBD that's been um, altered from hemp. Great. <laughs> um, when is, is there like any time frames you think are people doing some good Delta eight research right now, or or is that? You know, it's a great question. I don't know who's doing research right now. I think the industry kind of got a hold of it and is doing their thing. So um, I would be curious to know. And look, I am. Uh, I love the garden and I love gardening, but I not nearly a the cultivator that I would want to be, and so I don't really know. Um, uh, really, if you can do this, which is to, you know, breed the plant to be higher in Delta eight than, than Delta nine, I'm not sure. Um, or can you just, uh, work with it and, and pull out the Delta eight in a lab from, you know, whole plant, good old fashioned, you know, THC dominant cannabis. So I, I'd be curious to know, um, you know, from a cultivator, um, uh, in terms of that respect. Um, yeah. Great. Do you want Thank me to continue you. to answer the questions or do you want to go through them or? If, if you could take a couple more. Very Just a couple more. Sure. I'll be real and, quick. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. So um, someone asked about autism protocol. So I, I try to individualize my treatment plans. I try not to do cookie cutter because remember autism is a spectrum disorder and there's kids that every have all their little individual things. So um, there's a study out of Israel that showed that around 50% of kids will respond to a high ratio CBD THC preparation and the rest need more THC. It's 50, 50. Um, I do find that the kids that have more aggression, self-injurious behavior, terrible sleep, hyperactivity, I'll go a little more THC heavy. The kids that don't seem to have that, I'll kind of go a little more CBD heavy, but also I use THCA, which has some terrific, um, effects which I can't necessarily explain because we don't, the THC hasn't really been studied. Is it the little bit of THC in there? Is it the terpenes? It's hard to know. Um, so I don't necessarily have a protocol on autism. Again, it depends on the child, but again, kind of I explained THC versus CBD and THCA. Um, someone asked me if I um, 
where I'm located, I'm in Los Angeles. When people say, do I work with extracts, not whole plants, each molecule is extracted. No, I have my patients going into dispensaries and buying whole plant. Now, remember in pediatrics, do you want to use tinctures? They're gummies and all of that kind of stuff. You want to be able to start very low dose and titrate up. So um, it's whole plant extracts is what we're talking about that I'm um, using in patients. Uh, someone asked negative allosteric regulation of CBD on the CB1 receptor, great question. So this is, and I didn't include the slide, but let me just explain. Here's your receptor. Here's THC that comes along and sticks to what we call the orthosteric site, a specific landing site. There's also a site over here, let's say, where CBD attaches, that's called the allosteric site. When CBD attaches, it kind of changes the shape of the receptor and it changes how tightly CBD binds to the, uh, I'm sorry, THC binds to the receptor. And so it can modulate the effects. It can help reduce some of the unwanted uh, effects. And again, it depends on how much CBD and how much THC. Um, I find one-to-one, -one, two-to-one ratios, two parts CBD, one part THC, you're gonna feel the THC. It's not enough CBD to counteract. But it can minimize like paranoia, anxiety for some people, munchies for some people, you know, racing heart. Um, and for some people, they just need that higher amount of CBD with that little bit of THC stimulate the receptor, but not really feel the effects of that. So it just kind of depends. I hope that answers the question, Amy. Thank you. Um, is the PowerPoint um, available to share? I can make it available to share. And then have you encountered any studies on cannabinoids on COVID? Yes, there's a handful of studies on COVID. Now, nobody's done a clinical experiment yet, but in animals and in a uh, test tube, what you have to understand, why do people die from COVID? They're not dying necessarily from COVID itself. They're dying from the effects of COVID, which is cytokine storm, what's called like an over-release of all your pro-inflammatory chemicals in your body. And what do we know about cannabinoids? They're potent anti-inflammatories. There was a study before COVID, I just share, this is my last statement, I promise. Um, in 2015, um, a group at the University of South Carolina of all places where there is a wonderful researcher who studies the effects of cannabinoids on inflammation. He took mice and put, gave them an infection that we know causes cytokine storm, that massive release of pro-inflammatory chemicals that can kill you. He gave those mice no treatment. And after five days, 100% of the mice were dead. He took other mice and he, pre he gave them the infection and then treated them with THC for four days. And on day five, all the mice were alive. 100% mortality to 100% survival with the intervention of THC. And this was in 2015 before COVID even hit. How, and I just wanted to say, I reached out to him at the beginning of COVID and I said, why don't we do a clinical trial? And he said, if you can believe this, okay, I have the email to prove it. The physicians in his hospital were worried about the patients getting high. And I thought, let's see a death from COVID versus the intoxication. I mean, like it just totally ridiculous. So that is how deep the propaganda is in the medical community. So that is why I'm out here talking about it because I'm over it. It's time to move on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonnie. Uh, Aloha Dale. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, thanks for helping to organize from over on Kauai. I understand you have a, a special guest you'd like to introduce. Yes, thank you. Thank you to everybody who has been participating so far and to all of the amazing knowledge that we're gaining today as well as celebrating. I'd like to introduce Shauna Metch, who I've met her on Kauai. She has been involved quite a long time with her child as well. Shauna, would you please Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the medical cannabis world and some of your personal stories. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, thank you for having me today. Um, we have a daughter who was born in 2006. And when she was born, she was born with a very rare um, gene mutation or variation um, that no one knew what it was at that time. Um, but it had a lot of secondary effects to that mutation, like seizures, um, developmental delay, uh, cortical blindness, cerebral palsy, et cetera. So her seizures were getting so out of control when she was an infant that we just didn't know what to do. Um, and the only thing that was helpful when she was in infancy was the ketogenic diet. So um, we were very grateful to find that. And she's still on that diet today. Um, but they also stacked up a bunch of medications. And so at one point she was on um, such high doses of benzodiazepines that they were adult doses and she weighed 30 pounds. And so they had her on doses that like a 250 pound male would be taking. Um, she still was experiencing 50 to hundred seizures a day on average um, at those high doses and having no quality of life. So in 2013, we were in Colorado on medical travel and I'm from Colorado. So I had friends who had dispensaries and knew about this thing called CBD or cannabinoids, different cannabinoids that would help with seizures. So um, I was very hesitant at first to try her on this, but because we had tried all medications, she has um, a vagus nerve stimulator inserted in her that shoots up signals to her brain that wasn't working. Um, every medication she had been on, and she was on like 13 medications at that time. The doctors told me she could just die anytime, you know, of cardiac arrest because of the high doses of medications. They had very few children on those doses. Um, I started doing research about cannabis and I actually was surprised that there was a lot of information out there um, that pointed that it did help kids with seizures. So we went ahead and started CBD, our daughter on CBD in 2013. And she went from that 50 to hundred seizures a day within a couple of days, she was down to, you know, four or five. Um, a lot of times too, Hannah has like what we call honeymoon periods on different medications when we start where she'll do really well and then um, she'll regress again. So we were, we weren't overly excited thinking maybe, you know, she was going to start having a lot of seizures, but over time, um, we learned how to titrate the medications and get her off of, um, all of her anticonvulsants, except for a tiny little dose of one benzodiazepine that she's still on. And um, we introduced different cannabinoids as well that they were talking about before. Um, she uses different cannabinoids for different types of seizures that she has. So sometimes we'll use THC, THCA, CBN, CBD um, that are all extremely helpful. And she's still on cannabis today and she's able to attend school, have friends, have a good quality of life. And we just couldn't be happier um, that, you know, we were able to find that and that we were allowed to use this because we were in medical cannabis states. Um, I do a lot of advocation work for families with children like my daughter that are in states that I can't access um, these certain cannabinoids that they need for their children. So we work a lot on um, education, advocacy, legislation um, to help, you know, have everybody have access to this wonderful medication that saved our daughter's life. My heart goes out to you, but I'm grateful that you're finding some relief for your daughter. Thank you. We are too. And we just want to make sure that we can keep educating people, getting the, um, you know, a lot of people were really against us using medical cannabis, even though it was helping her. And, and like, like they had said before too, about being, um, getting high, you know, but benzodiazepines make you high. Benzodiazepines can kill you. Um, but yet, you know, there's that such a stigma around medical cannabis. And so just trying to educate people and letting them know that it's okay and that there's a safe way to use it and that it really does help some people, especially with that kids that have intractable epilepsy seem to respond really well to, you know, um, more natural approaches like cannabis products, as well as, um, diet. So just trying to educate and get it, get the word out and, and help other people, um, to find the right dosing, you know, and, or the right people that can help them, the right physicians, things like that. If anybody out there has any questions, please put them in the chat and we can address them. Otherwise 
Shauna, thank you so much for being with us today. I hope that later you can come back. I know you must have a busy day with your daughter, but if you can come and join us for any of the discussions at the end of the day as well, we'll be on again. We'll be open for discussions at three o'clock. So Wonderful. thank you. That'd be a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, mahalo for the inf invitation. I'm very happy to be here today. Happy Cannabis Day. And I see a lot of familiar faces. So good seeing everyone. Um, our story is very similar to Shanna and Hannah's story. Um, my daughter has an intractable form of epilepsy. And we've been battling since 2000 and I think she, 2009. And cannabis came into our life at around 2013. So I'm going to quickly go through some slides that um, shows a little bit of our story. Okay, so this kind of just talks about the learning curve that we had to go through as parents and our eight year journey that I'm going to share with you very quickly. And then if you have questions, please let me know after today. But this is just a case study of our daughter, whose name is Miley Jen Hope kind of Cheryl. And I mean, the cakey are just as determined as ever to fight and do whatever it takes to change laws. And we're just happy to present about our daughter who's just the most determined and feistiest wahine on the planet i think so um she has a form of epilepsy she's, a, she's one of 26 americans who have epilepsy and she has an intractable form called dravet syndrome she was born healthy um she was diagnosed with dravet syndrome at the age of six months um she was diagnosed with autism a little bit later in 2016 she has a rare form, as I mentioned, called Dravet syndrome, and it's Dravet syndrome month. So I thought it was important to point that out. And she has a SCN1A mutation, which it becomes a lifetime condition for her. And she's um, highly resistant to many anti-epilepsy medications out there. So our the beginning of our life, it was just filled with hospital visits. Um, she had her first shot at about four months. And from then she had a febrile seizure and then from there, it was just nonstop seizures over the years. She's had thousands of seizures to date, many different types of seizures. Um, she's been in the ICU many times. She's no stranger to that. Many times in the hospital, um, numerous calls to ambulances and routine um, blood draws. And you know, she's just familiar with being in the hospital situation for most of the early part of her life. Um, we were in the cancer center because a lot of the drugs that she was taking was affecting her platelets. And uh, we've tried all the traditional epilepsy <clears throat> strategies that were out there. We've tried FDA and non-FDA approved drugs. We've tried combinations. Um, we tried drugs before they were age appropriate. Uh, we've also went into hyperactivity medications, which affected her heart. And so we've done everything imaginable except for shock therapy to try to get these seizures to stop. Um, we've tried the ketogenic diet two times and we traveled to Chicago and Miami to see if we could bring some control to her life. Um, by the age of four, she's been on numerous, I would say about two dozen medications. She's been on a diet twice, which limited her ability to eat. So she had a tube installed in her stomach and just a number of different emergency drugs throughout the years. She has tremendous behavior issues that we're addressing now with um, applied behavior analysis versus medication. And that's working very well for her. So this was, as they tell you to tally all the seizures when you stay in a hospital, you can see that our life was basically out of control. Um, I turned to the New England Journal of Medicine and I found that after the third line of anti-epilepsy drugs, your response time goes down significantly. So at that point, we knew the epilepsy meds weren't gonna help her very much more unless we found a new solution for her. So this was our life. I mean, before the age of five, her life was pretty much hospital bound and we were basically just losing her very quickly. So this was my son. He used to spend all his time doing his homework in the hospital and we just decided like, we need to do something different. And so I'm gonna go quickly through this. You just cut me off at any point. Um, we did see online on television um, these, families that were, that have children who have Dravet syndrome, um, Jada and David and Charlotte Figi, and we watched how their parents were administering CBD and other cannabinoids to improve their seizure management. And at that point, I realized that Hawaii had a law um, back in 2000, that if you had a condition of epilepsy, you were qualified to utilize medical marijuana in the state of Hawaii. 
So the challenge was finding a physician or a doctor that would approve us and allow us to obtain this card. Um, we studied everything. We presented a number of different facts to the doctors. And finally, a doctor had um, signed off on our card and we were able to obtain medical marijuana in Hawaii. Um, this is just to show you that we've studied a, a number of different research scientific journals. And what we were looking for is we even studied Dr. Um, Goldstein's articles, but we were looking for a dose that would work for our daughter. And we found that the University of Colorado had found a sweet spot and we tried to use this as our way to figure out how to best um, administer medical marijuana so that we could get the best control for her. Um, that article just says that there was power to THC. So um, we decided we were gonna grow her cure. We obtained her card in 2013 with the help of a very willing physician who was bold enough to give a four-year-old child a medical marijuana card in the state of Hawaii. And then we were faced with how do we get our plants? Um, how are we gonna process this plant into a form of medicine? And then I had a background in agriculture. So I decided that we were gonna do it ourselves. Um, so I'm just gonna show you pictures at this point. We traveled to Colorado. We were invited to the Charlotte's Web clinical trials, which ended abruptly. So then we came home and we had to figure out how to do it ourselves. This was our first plant that someone gave to us. It was called Wizard. We changed her name to Harry Potter. And we just started from here. Um, we just had one plant, which we thought was high in THC, um, but we went from there. We found different ways to obtain plants in Hawaii. We started to get seeds and cuttings from friends. And then one day a man called me out of the blue and he gave me Harlequin, which we believe had CBD. Um, but at that time we had no way of telling if the plant had CBD or not. This was before laboratories were established. So we grew the plants in our backyard and in our attic and in our bedrooms, just to figure out how to get this plant into our daughter. Um, and then we were eating leaves as well. We didn't know that the medicine was actually in, largely in the flowers. So a lot of education took place. Um, these are all photos from our house. We were processing THCA as well as um, THC and CBD. We just weren't exactly sure what we were getting until we found a way to um, test. So. We use our family crock pot. We were making oils for our daughter. Um, and we're just trying to figure out the best way to suppress some of these seizures that were coming. We purchased the, the butter machine. Um, and then we had our share of growing issues as well. But um, in time, we were able to harvest and process successfully. And then it became down to dosing. How did we know that we were giving her the right dose? So back then, this is probably like, eight years ago, there was these color spectrum devices where you could tell if a flower had THC or CBD. And so this is what we started with mason jars and these little color spectrum type of gadgets. And so then I knew we were starting to get some CBD in our oils. Um, I attended Oaksterdam University. We bought these special machines that were available online. Um, our family went to Colorado to learn as much as we could from patients. And we bought these little THC shakers where you put dry ice in the machine. It's like a paint bucket and it'll basically shake all the trichomes off. We were giving our daughter THCA. Um, but in time, I met an auntie by the name of Auntie Jody, and she had a thin layer chromatography machine. And that's when everything changed for us, when we realized that what the power of that oil actually was. So we were able to get CBD and THC in our oils by growing strains like ACDC and Harlequin. And that's when she started to truly progress is when we had this information behind us. So um, this is what our plates look like at home. We were starting to compare our oils versus commercial products and we were getting pretty close. So we were really happy. Um, some of the Associated Press came over to see what we were doing. And you know we were even putting things like into chocolate and little popsicles here like lollipops just because we were working with seniors that had trouble eating and had a number of different medical issues as well. So we've all learned together. Um, a lot of cannabis patients have come over and helped us make creams and different types of edibles as well. So this is my friend Terry and then we started making some oils and submitting it to Steep Hill so we could get a better idea of what we were doing. And really this is what a normal EEG looks like. Um, 2012, we went to Miami. This is what my daughter's EEG looks like. 
And then 2015, it's not ideal, but it's getting a little bit better in time. So we know like scientifically there is some, some things happening. Um, we are able to reduce the number of seizures every day. Um, we're down to one seizure medication. She no longer has five types of seizures. She has one dominant type. Um, she's making strides in terms of cognitive and behavior issues. And, you know, just a better life than what she had before. If you can see her face, she's very happy and we're not living out of that hospital all the time. So we're very thankful we had an opportunity to go and travel to Japan, California. She's had beignets in New Orleans. We walked the Tori gates at Hiroshima when she turned 10. And then this is her today at the age of 12. So eight years later, since we got our card, um, her prognosis, prognosis was very poor at the age of four years old. She wasn't forecasted to live past five, but this is her today. And we owe it all to the families and the patients out there who have helped us along the way. Uh, we met a lot of the patients on Instagram and through there, we've met them through some of the committees and other advocacy, advocacy work that we have done throughout the years. But really it's, it's our responsibility to now pay it forward and do our best to um, advocate for medical cannabis where and when we can. And so these are just some pictures that we've collected that some of the work that we've done. And if there's a student that wants to learn about it, we'll, we'll invite them into our homes and we'll teach them everything that we're doing. Um, nothing's a secret, but we really have a community behind us that supports us and we wanna do our best. And so we've been doing this for many years. My son is exhausted, so I try to keep him out of it. But we've, we've, um, we're trying to do the best that we can to change her trajectory because her prognosis was poor and her outcome at that time was not positive. So we made some changes along the way so that um, the direction that we're going in is different now. And her quality of life is much better today than it was when she was four. So I, I know I had like 10 minutes, I just jammed through that. But, you know, I really want to thank all of you because in some way everyone has supported us and we're very proud of the improvements that she's made. And her life is much different today because of all of you and all your help. So thank you very much. Aloha, this is Brian Applegarth and I'm sending a message from California over to the Hawaiian Islands to all the cannabis patients that are in the Hawaiian Islands and in Hawaii. I want to tell you I'm thinking of you. I'm with you on your journey. Um, I work in the cannabis travel segment and sector, and it's very exciting how cannabis is becoming more and more accessible to patients and largely due to efforts of you and patients like you. When I think of cannabis and healing, I also think of community and healing together and suffering together. That's a deep part of the cannabis roots is the community gathering in safe spaces to be able to consume cannabis and other phytotherapies and herbal medicines and heal together. So sending healing thoughts from California. This is Brian Applegarth with the Cannabis Travel Association. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Ken Walski. I'm executive director of the Coalition for Medical Marijuana, New Jersey, a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization and public charity. I want to congratulate the state of Hawaii on occasion of Medical Cannabis Day 2021, celebrating 21 years of state authorized medical cannabis use. I want to say a deeply felt mahalo the leadership Hawaii has shown on this issue. Hawaii was the eighth state to legalize medical marijuana in the year 2000. It took my own state of New Jersey another 10 years before we became the 14th state to legalize medical marijuana in 2010. Moreover, Hawaii has demonstrated 21 years of successful home cultivation for patients. New Jersey has yet to allow home cultivation of marijuana, despite our successful growing and expanding um, medical cannabis program, and despite the fact that our governor signed legalization and decriminalization bills into law this year. I'm a registered nurse with 45 years of experience, including 25 years working in psychiatric hospitals and prisons in the state. I wanna ask Hawaii to please don't forget the patients and inmates in state institutions who qualify for medical cannabis, who could benefit from medical cannabis. And moreover, the state would reduce the medical cost of institutionalized patients by, by providing access to this population. Please remember the least fortunate among us. 
Once again, congratulations and mahalo. I'm here today just to share a little bit of uh, a story of our family um, and how being a uh, you know caregiver to my father who's going through cancer right now and fighting, but uh, became very real. And um, I didn't know what we would be doing. So anyway, you know, we were just kind of an average family. Live out here in Hawaii. Uh, my dad is a Marine, Vietnam vet, served, and uh, you know he he did smoke earlier, but uh, he's been pretty healthy recently. And uh, unfortunately, in late 2019, we were made aware that he probably was, you know, he had cancer. And in early of January 2020, uh, his diagnosis was confirmed. It was a late stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and for those who are familiar, you know, older people with that diagnosis, it's not really a good thing. So we assessed what they were going to do. They laid it out and we proceeded uh, to do all that. And uh, I was just getting into the uh, mix as a caregiver, learning and reading. So uh, dad had uh, prior to this, uh, just to kind of give a little background, also had prostate cancer, uh, which he successfully uh, treated and also had eight seven, eight heart stents inserted uh, up until 2019 prior to this. And so, um, but he's still in good shape. And so they said, you got to do the radiation right away. So we did all of that. He did the chemo. He did that, made it through. Um, and along the way, I was very fortunate because, you know, I haven't had, uh, I hadn't had any knowledge of, you know, other ways to help treat or, uh, you know, care for the patient, but I did know some people, I was fortunate to get in touch with some somebody I was provided with some, uh, uh, you know, some oil to give him that uh, helped him to sleep at night. So while he was going through the radiation and chemo, he, he, he virtually never got sick, slept pretty well, uh, all because of this. But he went through the whole year. He also did Keytruda, followed by Optivo, Yervoy, the combination and experimental uh, all through that. And... Uh, the combination of all treatments through the latter half of the year, October, and that was kind of over by then. But in December, it was, you know, evident that it might come back. And in January of this year, my dad, uh, you know, was on the bed at six in the morning. My mom called me and he was, you know, curled up in a ball, writhing in pain. And, hey, we got to go ER. So we went down that day. But before we went, I had this bottle of this, uh, this you know, called the magic rub. I rubbed it on his chest where the, the lung tumors were and on his back. We went to the ER. We're standing there. I saw my dad. I said, hey, how you doing? And he's standing there, you know, ER back in January, mask, got to check in. It's very, it was still the same, but it was really, it's pretty strict. So we're waiting to check in. My dad's standing there, but he looked okay. I said, you know, dad, we're at the ER because you were in pain a little while ago, curled up in the bed. And now you're standing looking pretty good he said yeah I feel okay so I on that day I found out this pain rub actually worked it took away his worst pain the cancer tumors anyway he went into the ER did the test we found that all the cancer that they've been treating it all came back it was bigger worse and more mess and so within a period of six months after all the treatment was administered and in, even within three months of being done it all came back um, and so in early January, on, on January 7th, uh, we were faced with my dad's cancer returning um, back at square one, and the doctors had no treatment. Unfortunately, we asked them, and they said nothing. There was one possible experimental exception treatment, but unfortunately, his blood did not allow him to qualify because it could not administer that to him legally. So I said, we got nothing for you. Uh, by the grace of God, I called up my other friend uh, who had given me some of the other, uh, you know, products and information earlier. And uh, in this time frame, I had been doing some research and decided, you know, uh, all this was good. And, you know, we had gotten uh, legal, got some uh, information, but I still didn't know what to do. But I just thankfully reached out to someone and they said, here, try this. And I was given the opportunity to uh, give to my dad a, a Rick Simpson oil suppository. Uh, many of you probably heard of Rick Simpson oil, but, uh, on January 7th, I got them. And then the next day we started them. So one day after we found out that my 80 year old father, his cancer all came back worse, bigger and more, uh, we started this and, uh, 
we started to give it to him that day every day. And, and lo and behold, in 30 days, his blood work got so good, he actually qualified to take the experimental uh, uh, target therapy treatment. <laughs> so, um, uh, which he did start. And then uh, I have some test results I'll share with you. But, but long story short, um, I used a combination of these products and I was so fortunate to get them. And by the way, I did go out in that time and I went to all the dispensaries uh, and I asked everybody there, uh, you know, this is my father's condition. You know, what do you have? What do you suggest? And I found that the 22 year old bud tender was my expert. They did their best and I went around, I got information, but uh, nothing that I had found gave me any clarity. So, you know, my research turned up enough quality that the, you know, the products that I was, you know, using from the, uh, uh, the farm were really good. And in, in 60 days, I could see, you know, my dad was actually getting better. Um, and then the first test we went back. Uh, so we started treatment on January 7th, January 8th, 2021. And on March 29th, we took a CAT scan and his lung tumor shrank uh, by about 40%. So the day after we found out he was his sickest, the next day we gave him 600 milligrams plus of what was a class one drug, but his medicine and uh, gave him organic protein shakes. And, and really we kept him off all the pain pills, the nausea pills, the Ducalox. He didn't take any of that. I gave him, you know, a plant-based medicine and uh, I got it right here. So all the names have been rejected, but we started with uh, 191 millimeters of net tumors. And the first measurement, it shrunk to 154. And then most recently we did an update at the end of May, uh, the 16 week study um, and more shrinkage, but you know, he had lung tumors in his chest up here, the lung tumors, the liver, the kidney, meds everywhere. So our, our second test uh, showed that the, uh, the tumors in the lung did not really shrink more, but they didn't get any worse. Um, but all the tumors down here in his kidneys and his liver shrank by about 35, 40%. And so the total net reduction went right here. You can see that 34% reduction. Uh, and so my dad just saw him today. Um, so he's still, still doing well. By the way, he went to Vegas twice after the doctors told him that he would die in three months if he didn't take the treatment. But he's, uh, he's still living and uh, he's still fighting. He's still working, uh, both the, the physicians, they're still trying to figure out what to do and we're, we're still working together, but he's, he's taking our best and it's been working. We're just, we're very blessed. And uh, we thank everybody who's, you know, thankfully there was somebody for me to call and that's why I'm here. So that in the future, if somebody needs help, you know, there'll be somebody to call and just kind of paint it forward. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. And uh, thanks to Brent and everyone who's putting this event on. And let me say in advance, thanks to all of you folks who are working on this issue from various perspectives, the researchers, uh, the legislators, the advocates to, to advance it. And I, I really appreciate it. I'm a recovering politician. So uh, as such, I think I, I'm not going to argue uh, policies or specifics, but I just want to give a little bit of perspective from my point of view. And it mostly consists of one story. And this is a true story. It's from about seven years ago. I was, it was my first couple of years in office and it was before um, uh, cannabis dispensaries were available. It was before there was any law even proposing cannabis dispensaries. So we had a situation where the medicine is theoretically legal, but no ready access to it. I got a call or an email from a uh, fellow who was newly, a newly one of my constituents. He just moved into the neighborhood. He was a veteran, United States veteran, and he was a disabled American veteran. He was dealing with chronic pain from a military injury. Uh, and being new to the area, he didn't know where he could obtain any medical cannabis, it being so hard to obtain at that time. Well, I, I thought about, well, maybe I can guide him and where he should go. And before I did that, I said, I'd like to meet you. Let me come by and meet you. It's kind of in my neighborhood. I stopped by and I met him. He was out working in his yard. And there he was. He was a, probably about 60, um, you know, walking with a little bit of a, a little bit of pain. 
and he he shows he pulls out of one pocket his medical cannabis license he says i'm legal for this i'm allowed to take it i just can't find it and he literally pulls out of his other pocket two prescription bottles he says this is what i have to take when i can't find it and forgive me if i got the names wrong but i think it was hydrocodone and oxycodone um I forgive me if I got the names wrong, but they were two opioids. They were pretty heavy duty opioids. And this, by the way, was before the opioid crisis was in the headlines. But this man had figured out for himself how bad they were for him. And, and he literally said to me, I hate these. I don't need them when I can find uh, cannabis. And well, uh, that's the story in a nutshell, but this was back in what I would call the snickering phase of medical cannabis. As far as the Hawaii legislature is concerned, that whenever you'd bring it up, people would just snicker and think it's a joke and tell some sort of joke about you for even bringing it up. Fortunately, the snickering phase is past. I think we all know how important medical um, cannabis is to people, even aside from the opioid crisis. But my point is, and that illustrated it to me so dramatically, how important access is. You can't just say something's legal without providing ready access to it. In that regard, I wish we could fix our reluctance to provide edibles and smokable forms at our dispensaries. But I promised I wouldn't go into policy. But I just, it, it's clear to me that access to this medicine is a good thing. Barriers to that access are a bad thing, and delays in access are one of those barriers that we all can do something about. So uh, I hope I save you a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, and thank you all of you for working on this issue. Mahalo, Brent. The key to it all, unmute, speak out. I think that's today what we're doing, is speaking out and saying our truth. Unmute and come out of the dark. For 10 years, I didn't sleep. I slept a little, a few hours a night, but I suffered. And every day that I suffered with cramps, with pain, with PTSD, it went on and on and on. I looked at a lot of different types of therapies. I tried hypnosis for sleep and pain. I tried pills. My doctor gave me things that made me into a zombie. And I remembered way back in college that for me, the second that I took a toke on a joint, I went in the corner, I went to sleep. So I went back to my roots and I started to grow my own strains that had the terpenes that I needed for my endocannabinoid system. And as I did that, I started to sleep longer and longer. Personally, I like to consume as an edible. I only make it for myself but it's certainly easier for me to consume it that way than smoke it. I sleep eight hours a night now. The cramps that used to wake me up and make it that nobody would wanna be in a room with me in the middle of the night because I was screaming, I was crying. I would hold a pillow over my face and scream into it from the debilitating cramps. Now, occasionally, occasionally I'll have a cramp, but I stand up, I do some squats, I'm able to exercise, I'm able to move. And that in itself has helped as well. Like so many before me today have said, it's not one element, it's diet, it's exercise as well, which can't, I couldn't exercise when I was in so much pain all the time. I couldn't face going out on any wilderness trail because I couldn't get back when my feet 
wouldn't go flat. When my inner thigh would not allow me to take a step. I now am hiking three miles a day for sure, five miles many days, eight miles. My life has changed. I'm so grateful that I have a medical cannabis card, that I am an advocate here on Kauai and help others to understand this is medicine. Every part of cannabis is medicine. I shout about it. I help people come out of the dark. Please contact me if you'd like any information. I'm happy to help. I don't wanna see people cry the way that I used to and still do occasionally, but my system is becoming a balanced one. Thank you, aloha. Carl is the founder of Islands for Medical Marijuana. He's been working on this issue for decades, I think has more history and more experience in this realm than anybody else in the country for sure. And, and he offers a very uh, valuable approach uh, that involves uh, involvement with as many stakeholders as possible. Uh, and that takes time and that takes sustained effort and, and he is really a master at that. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Carl. Thanks Carl for joining us today. I, have, I filed for a religious exemption back in 1983. And while that was pending, I joined the normal uh, rescheduling petition in 1985. And all of that fizzled out around 1990. And then I formed Islands for Medical Marijuana as a way to um, continue to advocate for the use of, of cannabis for, for health. It, it's a timeline um, starting with uh, the medical um, laws that were enacted in California and Arizona, which your uh, legislature referred to in the year 2000. I think they referred to maybe a half dozen states or something like that. And the this started out with personal cultivation. You guys have been talking about that quite a bit. Um, and the reason was, is they didn't think about setting up large scale manufacturing and distribution at that time. So Hawaii passed a, a law allowing personal cultivation. And then around 2005, we had Gonzalez versus Rach where a patient was arrested or it got uh, her six plants were seized by the DEA and she filed saying that the state should be able to create an exemption to the federal drug law by legalizing it for medical use. And the federal court said, no, that doesn't create an exemption. There's no, no room for any kind of an exemption in the federal controlled substances act, but they made a big deal out of the fact that this was personal cultivation and they compared it to the personal cultivation of wheat back in 1941 and the, there was an act at that time that wanted to regulate a national market for wheat. And so personal cultivation was found to be a factor that caused the national market to change. And so they couldn't allow the cumulative effect of a whole bunch of people growing it for personal use was, had an impact on interstate commerce. So it, it was the key word was diversion. And of course, when I lost my, my exemption case, the argument was that, um, yeah, there was an exemption for peyote, but the use of marijuana was far more prevalent. I didn't have any controls on my use of marijuana. And so the question was, there was a high risk of diversion. So they had to deny me an exemption like the one for peyote. So then we come down to 2009 and the, uh, during the Obama administration, the Department of Justice issued a memo saying that federal resources would not be focused on cannabis patients. And then the state started enacting these larger programs with the manufacturing and cultivation. And so the Department of Justice came out and said, we're not going to tolerate that. We're going to come down heavy on these large scale operations. Well, then in 2013, um, you know, and then the states like Colorado and Washington just went ahead and legalized recreational use <laughs> after that warning from the, because the Department of Justice at the federal level can't possibly get a grip on, on what's going on. So then the Department of Justice 
changed their position and said, well, if the, if the large scale operation is really strictly controlled, then we'll leave it alone. So then the idea became like, how, how strict can you make your cannabis program and how much control can you show to avoid scrutiny by the U.S. Department of Justice. So Hawaii responded to that in, in 2015 by enacting a dispensary system. And then in 2016, Hawaii enacted an act to bring it into compliance with that 2013 Department of Justice memo. Um, so Iowa comes into the picture in 2017. We set up a dispensary system, but we never had personal cultivation. So all we have is large scale manufacturing and distribution and our products are highly processed, labeled, uh, tested. Um, there's only just, I can't remember how many products there are, but we don't have a whole lot of variety. And, uh, and so the, there's been absolutely no incidents of diversion whatsoever because of how strictly this thing, the patients are only allowed to possess so much. Um, so that was, I don't know if that was to address the U.S. Department of Justice or the rates case, but either intentionally or coincidentally, it certainly does. And then in 2018, the Department of Justice rescinded all those memos, but President Trump said medical use was okay with him. And uh, he said he wouldn't honor the uh, restriction in the federal budget not to enforce federal drug law against medical use. But Trump didn't, uh, the Trump administration didn't enforce that because Trump was in favor of states' rights on medical marijuana and recreational use. So that didn't change a thing and it gave states like Iowa the go ahead to feel comfortable that they could just go ahead with their program. So we began over the counter sales here in December. So I decided that we should, well, I got involved in this from the beginning. I attended every legislative hearing and every administrative hearing. And I kept saying, we need to get a federal exemption for this like the one for peyote. And they had never heard of that before. And they said, well, why hasn't any other state ever done that? And I said, I can't explain that. I don't live in another state, but I do live here. And I'm not going to let that happen in the state I live in. And they said, OK. And so they started listening to me. And in August of 2019, the, the Iowa Medical Cannabidiol Board, which regulates our program, agreed with me that we needed to obtain a federal exemption. They recommended that the Department of Health obtain such an exemption. The Department of Health declined, and so they recommended the legislature obtain a federal exemption. The legislature responded by saying, well, the problem is federal funding, so we'll ask for federal funding guarantees because that would be, well, that would solve the problem that was before them with schools and educational and healthcare facilities. So then the department looked at that in, in September of 2020 and said that the only way to obtain federal funding guarantees was to get a federal exemption like I had originally proposed. And they said they were going to do that. Well, then the DEA comes in and denies my petition that I had filed and said that it was beyond their ability to grant exemptions to the act and that was all settled in the rates case and that they couldn't grant exemptions. So the state cowered out at that point. And so I had to sue the, um, well, I filed another petition with the DEA saying that the rates case didn't have any administrative component. There was no uh, application to the federal administrative agency for an exemption and there was no appeal, uh, judicial review. It was, uh, it was a straight statutory challenge, constitutional challenge and the court even told rates that she hadn't exhausted her administrative remedies. So I replied that case is not controlling because there's no administrative uh, act activity there. And then uh, so President Biden gets elected and he said the same thing as Trump. He thinks that medical marijuana should be legal. States should be able to do whatever they want with marijuana. And he thinks marijuana should be removed, moved from schedule one to schedule two to promote research. So just slightly better than the Trump position. So I had to sue the governor for failure to apply for the federal exemption in April. And while that case was pending, they filed for the federal funding guarantees 
they filed letters with four federal agencies, Medicare and Medicaid, Education, uh, FDA, and DEA. Now, FDA and DEA don't withhold funding, so <laughs> there's something odd about those that common Medicare and Medicaid would be long care term, you know, healthcare facilities, education would be schools, but FDA doesn't have anything to do with federal funding and DEA, the only way DEA would have anything to do with it is if they granted an, an exemption from schedule one. So I uh, took the opportunity to, um, and then the, right after that, the DEA denied my second petition but they failed to address my argument about the peyote exemption. They just ignored that. So that is the weak spot. The DEA can't explain why there's a peyote exemption and doesn't want to address that. So I filed another petition um, hammering the difference between our program and the ruling in the rates case saying that we have highly restricted program and zero diversion answers all the objections in the rates case. Then I filed a detailed um, description of the peyote exemption and how it was created by federal regulation in 1965 and how it was not put in the statute because they wanted the administrative agency to have complete control over controlled substances. So here you have a plant in schedule one that's exempt for non-drug use by a church and they're saying that they don't have any way to create any exemption for schedule one plants, which they already have one. <laughs> and then they say, um, so anyway, we filed this other petition and now we've asked the DEA not to rule on the state's um, requests independently from ours because we filed with the DEA and the state is making the same argument that we made and plus, if you go through the whole history of everything, my name is in the records. The uh, Medical Cannabidiol Board picked up this exemption argument because I suggested it. And also on uh, May 21st at the last board meeting, the board voted to take this issue up in August at the August 20th board meeting. And uh, the topic is going to be contacting our six federal legislators and asking them to get involved because it is so peculiar. We have 47 states with medical marijuana laws. And yet, if you look at the federal legislation, well, I mean, the states haven't applied for federal exemption and their federal legislators are going to Congress and they're not sponsoring any legislation to give the states a break from federal drug law. And there's 47 states doing this. It's like, Unbelievable. So we're going to take that up with our six federal legislators at the August board meeting. The state is going to officially ask them to represent our state. This is popular, like 80 percent of the public supports medical marijuana in Iowa. And for our federal legislators to go to Washington and represent the pharmaceutical companies and the alcohol industry or whoever they're representing besides us is intolerable. <laughs> but it's going on nationally and they're obviously thinking well everybody else does it so what's wrong with it if we do it so um if i don't know if you can see this link on that on the, that i have here but the, this document has um footnotes with uh, web links to all the different things i just talked about and then here's the, here's the de here's the statute the controlled substances act talks about exemptions and down here it says, um, now this is about drugs. This is not about plants, but drugs are far more dangerous than plants are. So if this could justify an exemption for a drug, it could certainly justify an exemption for a plant. So um, they say that the particular drug product is manufactured and distributed in, in a manner that prevents diversion. Well, we've got that in Iowa. And then the packaging size, the manner of packaging, distribution, advertising, diver ex evidence of diversion, we have none. All of these things we meet in spades. <laughs> so we're gonna give these guys a tough time. Now I realize this wouldn't cover personal cultivation, but the feds are not, the problem is, is that when these kids go to these schools, they want to take these highly refined ex extracts. Our law allows any cannabinoid so any extract, pharmaceutical grade cannabinoid is allowed. And that is what uh, they want to, the, 
they're having problems using this in schools and healthcare facilities. And so if we could get an exemption for that part of it, it would reduce the cost. The manufacturer wouldn't have to pay this crazy federal tax penalty. They could do the banking. They wouldn't have to do the cash only. They wouldn't lose the federal funding. And so this would protect a huge majority of patients and the people that are growing cannabis at home are not going to be paying this crazy federal tax. And they're probably not going to try to grow it in a school or a healthcare facility. So even if that wasn't exempt, those people would still be far better off if, if the patients who need these highly processed pharmaceutical grade extracts could get them without being considered federal criminals. The stigma of being a federal criminal is just unbelievable. So it's time we stood up for our rights and demanded the federal recognition and the state is, it's nice to have a state law, but we need to complete the other half and get the federal protection. So I think that's it for me. Happy cannabis day, 21 years old. You can go in and buy now. No, I, I would like a, a couple of things. Uh, to be known by the other organizers and patient advocates that are on the call today. And that is that our local legislators um, answer the call. So what I mean by that is if you are in another area, if you're in another state and you'd like to get um, your own event going, something like this, reach out to your legislators um, especially if you're a constituent, if you're not a constituent, find a constituent for each legislator that you would like to invite to an event like this. It's, it's very important. Nothing happens without them. So thank you so much, um, Representative Capella, Representative Illigan, uh, Senator Ocasio, Senator San Blaine of Ventura. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, we're going to move into a round robin style, um, and we've got a, a question to sort of open up the discussion today, and we'll we'll go in in order. So, um, let's start uh, with you, Senator San Blaine of Ventura. Uh, can you can you just tell us, a, you know, your perspective on uh, Medical Cannabis Day and and how this might uh, be helpful? So I, I'm really thankful, Brent, that you're doing this and that we need to keep it up. Um, some of you have been with me since 2015 when I first got into legislature. I see Costa Nato, I see Nurse Wendy, I, I've seen, and of course you, Brent. Um, and the I am disheartened this um, this session and the last couple of sessions that we have not moved forward and Clifton knows this, Dr. Otto knows this, as well as um, Nurse Wendy, as well as yourself. Because when I first got into office in 2015, I was part of the um, conference committee where it almost died, where we finally got medical marijuana dispensaries. And at that time, the plan was to have over 20 dispensary licenses, okay? And that every two years, there would be at least two to four more licenses other than the initial eight that we got. Um, it is, so every session, I introduce a bill to increase the licenses pursuant <laughs> to that plan. Um, that hasn't happened. Um, I was hoping that because of cannabis and we've got, I, I'm really glad that we've got these freshman legislators here today. Um, and that basically that we should, we need to diversify our economy. I sent out a survey of my constituents, over 50% want legalized cannabis, okay? I mean, they disagree about gambling, okay? But they, over 50%, 54, almost 60% were for legal cannabis in the state. And I think even um, Honolulu Advertiser, put out a, and usually their readers are more conservative and they are overwhelmingly for legal cannabis. So it surprises me that we haven't moved forward, but um, that's my view. And, and, and I'm really glad that we have freshman legislators because hopefully they can help me continue on with the fight to legalize cannabis. Aloha. 
Thank you so much. And Representative Capella, did, did you have some insights you might want to share about the last session and Medical Cannabis Day? Absolutely. First off, Happy Medical Cannabis Day, everyone. So exciting. I'm so glad we are doing this and that we're connecting and sharing this space because at the end of the day, this is what it's gonna take in order for us to, as uh, Senator Senwood Ventura said, move forward, not just to assist our medical cannabis industry, but also to move towards legalization, which ultimately is what we need. Um, second, I, I'm really excited about Medical Cannabis Day because I think this is an opportunity for us to really celebrate this incredible plant and plant medicine and what that brings into people's lives um, and just different ways of moving away from big pharma and huge pharmaceutical companies and moving into the space of how do we protect people and how do we um, help give people different options on how they can benefit themselves and their body. Um, and one of the most important things I think that uh, Senator, Senator San Buenaventura brought up was just diversifying Hawaii's economy. And I feel I totally share the sentiments, um, kind of, of the disappointment of this past legislative session. Um, as a freshman legislator, of course, I come in with big, bright, shiny eyes um, and lots of hope. Um, <laughs> and I think you know, every single no is always kind of the same no's that we've been getting year after year. We can't do something because of the banks. We can't do something because of federal airspace. And I think the reality is that by sharing spaces like this, we're able to connect and create a movement on um, just pushing back on those no's and debunking the why that doesn't work um, and just creating something different for our economy that really uplifts both people and our planet. Um, so I'm excited for uh, just this space and for the conversation that we're going to have um, because we're not only celebrating a plant, we're also talking about the things that need to happen in order for us to move forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Acasio, thank you so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate your involvement. Uh, can, can you give us some uh, insights into the last legislative session also and, and you know, perhaps your take on uh, Medical Cannabis Day as well? Aloha. Yes, thank you. I definitely, my sentiments um, are very similar to Senator San Buenaventura as well as Representative Capella. Um, I am really honored to be here today in this, in this capacity as a lawmaker um, and as a freshman lawmaker as well. And same thing, you know, just a little bit disappointed, as, but at the same time, looking at it in the positive sense of continuing the conversation so that we can remove so much of the stigma that is still attached. And, um, and, but is very much feels like in the, in the, in the not only in the Senate, uh, but it, just in the eyes of, of um, the community is that the stigma is already um, lessening. And so to continuing this conversation is really important and really wonderful. Um, it's definitely a time to acknowledge and be grateful for everyone who's put, um, you know, tireless, tirelessly track issues related to medical cannabis who work tirelessly to ensure the rights of patient that they remain and their continued advocacy. Um, you know, it's really an honoring today of the more than 31,000 patients registered in the medical cannabis program here in Hawaii and, and celebrating that and, you know, really looking at that as, um, you know, a celebration of that this is an accepted medical use for patients to utilize this natural medicine and this beautiful plant. Um, and so, you know, really embracing that and um, it's an opportunity to share um, that all of the knowledge and experience around this important topic. topic um, I'm really le learning a lot today. I was extremely moved by the testimonials, of course, um, and and just knowing that you know people's lives are really involved in 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 all of the work that's been going on. So I just want to continue to honor that. Um, keeping up with the issues um, that matter to my constituents and to folks here um, on this presentation, it can be a challenge especially when there's an opportunity really to focus on one of them like this. I'm extremely appreciative of all the efforts that everyone's put in into this uh, webinar. So I want to say I want to thank you, um, Brent, and us as well as all the organizers and the participants involved. Um, just let you know that the efforts you've made to research this issue and network with each other are extremely valuable, very helpful to me as a as a legislator, um, also as a community member. So let's stay connected. Um, I'm listening, I'm learning, I'm committed 
I'm very committed to sharing what I'm learning today um, with my colleagues in the Senate, yep. as well as to advocate. So, um, yeah, I'm here to champion the cause of herbal medicine, self-care, um, the right to grow medicine for yourself and for your loved ones. Um, medical, this Medical Cannabis Day um, really makes me a better champion for these causes, so I'm really um, grateful to be here. Um, in terms of the past legislative session, it was already, um, you know, brought up that, you know, it, we would like to see more things move in the near future. I would really like to see Senate Bill 64, um, the bill that would prevent discrimination against cannabis patients out of the judici Judiciary Committee in the Senate. Um, and we know that um, Senator Rhodes was a sponsor, so it makes sense that he would support this intention and to keep, you know, continue to put more efforts towards this. Thank you so much, Senator Acasio. I really appreciate your manao. And we'll ask that question again about uh, your thoughts on Medical Cannabis Day and, and your insights, uh, Representative Illigan, into the past legislative session. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Brett. Well, first of all, I just want to say that um, hearing all the stories from the patient advocates and all the patients that needed, the, needed a plant-based medicine for their care was really touching. And it really centered on why we're doing it. We're doing it for the patients. We're doing it for, for that access for the patients so they have a quality health care. And I just want to also really commend Senator Joyce Anaventura because she is really the like the champion when she was in the house. There's she left some big shoes to fill if there's any shoes um, to fill. And I know Representative um, Janae Capella came in running in the house, and she's definitely a strong advocate. And there's different approaches. Um, that we have as legislatures. And my approach is very similar to why everybody's doing it. it. It's centered around the people. And each legislator, are, it has different um, philosophy, different beliefs. And I'm very, um, I try to be mindful of what that is and also be able to educate them on what's going on. So one of the steps I actually tried to do, which I did, is to bring a couple of legislators on the Big Island and visited a medical marijuana facility. And after that visit, it was great to hear from the legislators that, wow, I didn't know they were so um, high, their technology is so high class when actually cultivating um, medical marijuana. And that's what I'm trying to do. My, I'm very um, soft-spoken and I'm very people-based. And that's really how I approach things, especially legislation. And I know there's a lot of things to do um, and centered around patients. For example, I know some legislation was um, put, put forth for patients being able to transport their supply into island and some of the problems with um, allowing dispensaries to be able to supply more than just their um, island. For example, Senator Sabantura mentioned that there was, she was aiming for 20 licensees down to eight. Well, sometimes it, uh, right now, the dispensaries are capped within their jurisdiction. Why can't their jurisdiction be statewide? So we could supply more patients. Um, as well as being able to safely operate and having maybe a state bank in the future so dispensaries are able to safely um, manage their facilities as well as be financially stable. There's, there's so many aspects in this issue that I'm really in a learning stage coming in as a freshman and I have a lot to learn. And thank goodness there's um, senators and representatives that have set the foundation already. I, I saw um, Senator Russell Ruderman as well as Senator um, Will Express, Express, um, Express X Perro. Um, I shouldn't ever butcher his name because I kind of look like that guy. <laughs> anyway, I just want to say 
there's a lot of people here who has done a lot of good work for medical marijuana. And I just wanna, um, when I, the reason why I reached out is because I wanted to show my support and you will always have my support. Definitely reach out to my office and make sure that you can educate me on what's going on because as a vice chair of transportation, I have at least some influence on trying to make sure that we can transport medical marijuana from island to island and in a safe manner. And someone said it right off the bat, we shouldn't be looking at criminals like patients. They're people, they're patients, they just want care and they want a plant-based medicine to have that care. Well, thank you for having me and looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Representative Hill. Again, I really appreciate your manaho. And uh, up next, let's, let's start um, the next question with Senator Ocasio. Um, what should patient advocates do to prepare for the next session? Oh, mahalo nui. Uh, for that question, uh, there, I really feel like it's important to get familiar with the system for testifying. Uh, now that we have the ability um, this past year to remote testify from outer islands, we really can gain a lot of strength from the neighbor islands and advocates on neighbor islands. And so to get familiar with um, the, you know, Hawaii capital, um, gov website, capital Hawaii gov website and, and how to submit testimony and how to apply for the Zoom um, and then to show up and to give testimony is important um, to know who your, uh, your representatives are and how to email them directly and get that information out to them. A lot of times it's really just a matter of um, folks recognizing that this is important to the community. And so once that, you know, once that testimony uh, starts flowing in, they realize, oh, this is a, of importance to the community. Uh, so the testimony we receive on these bills this past year um, felt somewhat limited. I know there were a lot of valuable testimony that folks did provide, um, but if we can um, increase that would be wonderful. I think it's, it's important to hear from patients. These, the testimonials today, for example, really profound. Right and and moving um, and we those there's, there's folks that are willing um, they need to know that their input is is highly valuable so there's nothing more pow powerful that I think we can do than hearing from patients themselves uh, working together like I said to move SB 64 out of committee would be really wonderful as well. Um, Let's get more support for the idea of petitioning the DEA to remove cannabis from that Schedule One list. Um, I feel like you know there's been a sea of real change in attitudes towards cannabis. At, again, like I had said earlier, and so to you know to continue on that and undo the harm that's been done through this whole criminalization scheme of the past decades. Um, I believe that there is sufficient support in the Senate um, at this time and. And we'll continue to develop that ourselves as well. Um, but there needs to be more lobbying as well in the house. Uh, beyond that, I really would like to just send folks to check out um, uh, solution120.com. Uh, the website is put together by a group of really bright and devoted uh, cannabis advocates um, who've come up with a plan. Um, it, it ties into what both Senator San Buena Ventura and actually everyone has mentioned in terms of boosting our economy and the well being of our state. Uh, specifically in 120 days, the harvest period, right, for this amazing plant. So um, I'd like to really see us be proactive with um, plans like this and, and even coming up with more plans because we really do have this at our fingertips and to help introduce legislation um, that supports hemp economy and cannabis. So I'm here to help and that's, that's all I have for now. Mahalo. Thank you so much. Um, and for for the same question, what could patient advocates do to prepare for next session? Let's jump over to Representative Illigan. Thank you. Um, so what I've witnessed in the House is that, um, and Senator Ocasio nailed it, it, there is support on the Senate. The House that needs a little bit more work. And there's 25 in the Senate, 51 in the House. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the key is to really get the bills that we want to push heard. With that being heard, then you can actually testify. 
some of these bills just doesn't even get heard. So making sure that your efforts are concentrated on the people that actually um, is willing to hear the bill, to me is key. And right now, I, I have, I'm kind of doing a different approach because um, like I mentioned before, some rep representatives and legislatures already has their beliefs. And I'm, I'm very um, focused on the long term. And what I'm trying to do is educate the legislators that is currently within my network and who I build up friendships and relationships with. And what I've realized, and between you and 46 other participants, <laughs> and probably a lot more, is that there is support. I've talked to them individually and they want to support it. It's the fact that it's not being heard and not really even on the battlefield or on the table, it's hard to do anything. So to me, that is the first step. And um, like for example, ever since uh, today, I haven't really had a strong uh, relationship with any of you guys. And I think the first step is having a relationship with you guys. And at least I can know what I really need to advocate for and what bills I feel is important. But that's, that's my perspective. I, I do know a little bit, but I don't think I know enough. And I definitely want to um, help and support uh, Senator Santa Ventura because she has fought the fight and has really pushed it and she knows some, uh, most of the issues that we need to fix. So that's, that's my point. Thank you, Representative Villigan. I really appreciate that. Um, so let's, let's switch over to you, Senator San Buena Ventura, um, to sort of help us understand what patient advocates can do to, to get ready for this next session. So, um... Thank you, Brent, and, and thank you, um, Representative Elagan. Um, so you're right. I mean, there, we, when Senator Espero, who is a participant, is no longer a senator, uh, it's, it's up to a lot of you freshmen, which I'm really happy for that you folks are participating in the Zoom call, to help um, the remaining legislators who are, who are in the fight to continue the fight. So here's the reality, okay? And uh, the reality is our governor's against us. And, um, and I know what Representative Ilagan is talking about, about the hearings, but um, being a former House leadership member, I know that like next year, because it's gonna be an election year, if they feel that the governor is going to veto anything, they're not even going to put members, um, they're not even going to hear controversial bills next year. So I hate to say it, probably we're gonna to need to sit out next year and really redouble our efforts in 2022 to make sure that um, that the people who are elected, and that is really where the fight should be, the people who are elected um, are aware of the issues and will, will promote um, medical cannabis. So, I mean, that's a sobering thought. And that's just from my years of experience in the House and um, my one year in the Senate. So um, Senator Casio is correct. And, and as you folks know who have been watching this, we passed a lot of progressive bills in the Senate just to have it die in the House. Um, so you folks need to educate House members, but I don't expect it to end a election year. And Willis Sparrow knows this, and I, I didn't see, um, former Senator Ruderman um, being there. But you, you can even ask Senator Willis Farrell. 
in an election year, controversial bills are not going to pass. So what you need to do is do the homework, which is what Il Senator Ilagan has done, which is getting freshman legislators more um, aware of the issues. And the issues, as you folks know, because you folks have been doing this, are complex, okay? It's not just um, helping patients, which we know is helpful, but it's also getting the banking together. It's also getting the DEA, um, you know, applying for the DEA exemption. I mean, at least this session, we allowed for one cabinet oil um, drug to actually be exempted. I remember last year when I just said, well, as soon as you pass DEA, you should be automatically approved in the state of Hawaii. And that didn't pass the house. You know, it seemed, so there are multiple levels that need to be passed. And, uh, Expediting that would be terrific because, I mean, if we could just even get cabinet oil, I mean, just CBD approved, that would really help the economy. I mean, right now you could sell it, but we can't even make it, which to me is ridiculous. Uh, you know, um, I'm preaching to the choir. You folks know I'm an advocate. I'm just letting you folks know where, what to look at and Representative Logan is correct. Um, informing, educating freshman legislators, especially House, because the House has more turnover. And surprisingly enough, and this is what I pointed out to Colin Moore, there is a one generation difference between the average age of a Senator and a House member. That's 20 years difference. And yet the senators are far more progressive on a number of issues than the House members. So we are electing conservative young House members, which is kind of weird to me. But um, so we, there's a lot of education because they're young, okay? They haven't fought the fights before. They need to be educated. Okay, so um, that's where I'm at. Thank you, Brett. Uh, thank you so much, Joy. I appreciate that. Um, Representative Capella, um, so patient advocates want to get involved. We want to testify. We want to, we want to work on what patients consider our priorities, and we want to constantly drive that message uh, from patients with the most debilitating conditions. Can, can, you, can you give us some insights how patient advocates can work better with uh, house and, and maybe house leadership and yourself? Absolutely. I love this question because I feel like there are many parts of it um, that really matter in, in how we move a movement forward. And at the end of the day, I think that medical cannabis and legalization in itself, it's a movement. As all of my colleagues on this call have said over and over, people want this. Here in Hawaii, many people across our state want it. As a state, we're losing out on money because we're choosing not to legalize. We're choosing to push that part of our economic sector away. We're pushing away all the possibility, as um, Senator San Buenaventura just said, you can make um, you you can't make the oil, but you can sell it, or things like that. The reality is that if we were to create a legalization model where you are making um, all of your different products and your <clears throat> excuse me, have the opportunity to grow, have the opportunity to sell or, or bake something or whatever it might be, you're opening so many different jobs and so much money flow to our own economy. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that the House is um, much more conservative than um, the Senate. Obviously, the Senate passed out things like a living wage. Um, they passed out a legalization bill. It needed a lot more work to be a lot more robust, which is what we need, but they still passed it out. Um, and these things came over to the House and they didn't even get a hearing. So the reality is that every single one of your members, every single patient has a voice and they are a part of this movement. Um, and they're located across our entire state. So everyone has a different legislator. Know who your legislator is. Get familiar with the website, as Senator Ocasio said. Get to know 
who it is that's your senator and your legislator. Go and look up because all of our votes are public. You can see whether or not su someone supported something, whether they spoke on the floor for or against something. And it's not, I think the reality is that why can't this be, as we head into an election cycle, why can't this be an election issue? Getting things together, putting out um, candidate interviews and maybe, um, endorsing certain candidates, if that's even a possibility for you folks, so that people know these are the legislators that are going to publicly fight for and say that they support medical cannabis, the multiple issues that's needed in the medical cannabis is, um, issue and industry, and then also supporting legalization, because ultimately we know that we need legalization in order to help the medical cannabis industry thrive. Um, and I think it's also making sure that we're not just educating um, and pressuring and knowing where freshmen, new incoming legislators stand. It's also making sure that we are putting pressure on current legislators. So many legislators have been in office, honestly, longer than I've been alive. And many of them are very anti or publicly anti legalization or medical cannabis, hence why we have such a hard time getting these pieces of legislation through. So we need to make sure that we're educating those people as well. Um, earlier this year, I introduced a bill, House Bill 7, to legalize cannabis, uh, recreational cannabis use. And when I asked the chair that I sit on the committee for, the health chair, um, I asked, can we please hear the bill? He said, no, because the medical cannabis industry doesn't want legalization. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. So oftentimes we have legislators um, and I think we, we all give people think that we are much smarter than we actually are. And the way that we change that is by having your membership, every single one of you using your voice to really educate and express why these things are so important. And next year, when we do put up these bills, because they will be put up again and again and again, because champions like uh, Senator San Buenaventura and Senator Ocasio uh, and myself and Representative Illigan, we will continue to put these things up because that's what we believe in. Even if we know it's an uphill battle, we need your support to email the chairs, call their offices, and also be a part of that movement and that fight to have these bills heard. So um, I hope that you folks will, will be involved because um, the reality is that movements are about people and people are where the power is. It's not just about the power that lives in that big square building. We all have the power to make this happen. So let's do it together. And at least this is a fun movement. <laughs> right, yeah, this is, this is a, a, a very fun industry. You know, access to medicine is a really big deal. Doctor relationships. Um, clinical medicine is, is a really important, a, a key component of this. So, so when a, a patient with a debilitating condition um, needs medicine, what we're seeking is a patient's first approach where we could allow patients um, to be involved in the medical program in a way where they're not being arrested. Or in the case of like Oklahoma's unity bill, uh, they cannot be arrested, right? So their new law says that if you have a license, you're a licensed patient, you cannot be arrested for having cannabis. And I think that's a really big step. And, and this is really what people who are, are suffering want is they just don't want any additional fear. Um, and so it's also, you know, when we look at the Oklahoma Unity Bill, for example, um, it's really important to point out that in Oklahoma, a patient can drive to a neighboring state or better yet, they can drive to a neighboring county that may have uh, different rules or regulations or a different dispensary that may have an appropriate strain there for their particular condition. Like Jari Sugano was mentioning, it took years of her own personal research to find a strain that was a, appropriate for their daughter. Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious um, if, if, you, if, if you have had a chance to look at the Oklahoma Unity Bill and those patients' protections and, and how you feel about um, medicalizing the current program uh, while looking to the future for uh, full legal, uh, legalization for adult use and, and recreation. Um, and, and for that, we'll, let's, let's change it up a little bit. We'll uh, start with you, uh, Representative Illigan, if, if you could. So I haven't um, dove into that. 
I am a proponent for better loss for the patients. And for example, being able to transport it even inter-island, as I mentioned before. Um, so I'm, I, I feel like I definitely want to hear um, Joy's perspective on this because I, this is the first time I've heard of um, anything regarding that. So thank you. Sure, sure. And uh, let's uh, jump back over to uh, Joy. Um, thank you, S Senator Sambainaventura. I, I can see you uh, squirming there. You want to you take this on, so. Um, I also want to do a shout out to Lynn, um, Senator Ocasio, because I think you forgot her in the second round. So I just want to do a short thing on, on the whole idea of medicalizing, because I do agree. And I am going to let Rep. Capella know um, um, Chair Yamane is correct in that the existing dispensaries don't really care much for increasing competition, right? So that's where, um, because some dispensaries are still losing money. Anyway, that's what they tell us. Um, the big island dispensaries, however, are doing quite well. So um, it's, I think, Oahu, um, and, and basically because they probably got into it uh, not knowing the industry before they got into it and just think, thinking of it as a money-making operation. But, um, you know, I, I'm in agreement with that to medicalize it, to, to allow for prescriptions, to have doctors prescribe. Uh, but then we're going, we're back to doctors are not going to let their licenses get um, be liable and be pulled by prescribing uh, illegal substance. So we're back to what Dr. Otto is referring to. We got to get, get it out of schedule one to deschedulize it and really need to focus on our federal um, law legislation in order to do that. We get it out of Schedule 1, and frankly, as soon as you get out of Schedule 1, all of, a lot, I think a lot of it will open up. I mean, then we don't have to worry about banking, because a lot of bankers who I've talked to really want to get into um, the banking, but they're concerned about losing their FDIC insurance, and they know that there is money to be made. Um, and also, then we don't even need to worry about recreation, I mean, legalizing recreational. Even if, even if we remove it from Schedule 1 and make it a medical, you're going to start seeing prescriptions. You're going to see long drugs selling, you know, selling cannabis. And we're going to start seeing grades of cannabis, specifically like what you said, I mean, Brent, you know, for different types of symptoms with this kind of, this kind of cannabis would be good for it. And you're gonna start seeing advertisement for it. I think a lot of, a lot of doors will open. We really, but let's get our federal um, legislation together. Thank you. Thank you, that, that's super helpful. Um, and we'll jump over uh, to you, Representative Capella, to sort of address this issue with patient protections and uh, medicalizing the program, Oklahoma Unity Bill. Um, yeah, if you could provide your insights, thank you. Absolutely. And then also just to very quickly clarify um, from my, my last um, response, I think the reality is that in, in some of the conversations that I've had with different dispensaries, um, I agree with uh, Senator San Buenaventura, but I also, I also realized that when we legalize, it's not about the competition. And I think that the Hawaii um, Cannabis Industry, Cannabis Industry Association, HICA, um, has really done a good job of trying to coordinate a lot more with the dispensaries um, as we move towards this model of legalization that really uplifts everyone. Um, and getting everyone on the same page, I think, is one of the biggest issues that we're going to have to work through. Um, when we do go towards legalization, we have to make sure that we're not pushing dispensaries to the side, that dispensaries are really, it, they're going to benefit the most because they're going to be able to expand first and that will help that, that will help uplift them. Um, it'll also help take away a lot of the restrictions that DOH has put on um, 
the dispensaries and the issues that they've had to deal with. Um, but as, as far as the Oklahoma unity model is concerned, I think Senator Simon Ventura really hit it on the head. We have to move away um, from this schedule one classification and um, really open it up. I think the second thing is that it's a lot different when you're just driving from point A to point B and you're not getting into federal airspace. And that's one of the biggest issues that we've seen. And that was also one of the things that we tried to work on this past year of taking, um, it was dispensaries that really wanted to be able to fly product from one island to another. So, because there are certain dispensaries that can't grow as much as you can say specifically on the big island where there's a lot more land and space um, and their production operation is something that's incredible. And they have the opportunity to be able to move enough product from one place to another. But unfortunately, because of the federal regulations that we have, we're not, um, they're not able to do that. And I think that's something that the state also really needs to step up to. Um, I think one thing that I would also like to add is that while I love the Oklahoma unity model, I think the reality is that we also have to not just look at like a one-stop shop for this is what's going to work here and it's going to work here in Hawaii as well. We have to be able to look at what are other states doing that are successful. For instance, um, I think Alaska is doing some really great work where they've been able to partner with their um, with their local law enforcement to do um, transportation a little bit easier, considering they are dealing with a lot of air and water space as well, which is oftentimes federal jurisdiction. So I think it's not just looking at the Oklahoma model, it's looking at other models and seeing what works and taking those bits and pieces and bringing it back to our state um, to kind of formulate and create something that works here in our islands, because we are since we're separated, it makes things a lot more difficult. We're not just driving over a county line, we're flying through air. And oftentimes if you live on the big islands, particularly you're driving through and you live in my district in Na'alehu and you get your medical cannabis from Hilo, you're driving through Volcanoes National Park, which is once again federal jurisdiction. So you're, it's very difficult. And I think we need to be able to work specifically. And maybe that's some of the things that um, my colleagues and myself on this call can really help champion is working with our own local law enforcement to see what we can do specifically to help protect our can, um, our medical cannabis um, patients quicker on the on the shorter term because we all know that this is going to take unfortunately quite a bit of time. Absolutely, and and we in the patient community we have a guiding principle, and all we do is we simply put ourselves into the place of a patient who is in bed or moving in that direction. And in doing so, all of the questions to all of these answers, which it's, it's incredibly multifaceted, right? It's cannabis is as big as everything all together when we look at the demographics. That's why it's so difficult to have events like this where we want to target everyone, but really we choose to just focus on patients. Uh, Senator Acasio, I apologize for missing you if I missed you in the last question. Um, but please feel free to address uh, what patient advocates can do um, in the next session and uh, your thoughts on uh, patient protections and medicalizing the program and the Oklahoma Unity Bill. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, I, I started off that question, so you didn't miss me. Um, and I agreed with, I definitely agree with all of my colleagues. In fact, it's wonderful to hear them speak as well, just because it brings up so many other points that um, while I may think about them in the big picture, you know, it's easy to forget in the moment, um, but it is really important then to make sure that we elect folks that represent our views. And um, so the more engaged we can get in this civics aspect, um, the better off really. And I think that's my lesson as well in terms of, um, you know, how I even got into um, this position to begin with was just to continue to advocate and stay involved in this civics process. Um, on all levels. Um, at any rate, um, as far as medicalization, you know, I actually am, it's, it's very new to me, so I won't speak too much um, to it specifically. I will say that I am absolutely here to learn. And as I can hear from my colleagues, as well as everyone who shared today, there are many aspects and a lot of intricacies to learn. Um, I do know for 100% um, I'm an advocate for patients and want to hear it's really about um, my, even myself becoming more educated about what the community who knows this through and through from different angles, whether it's from dispensaries or from, uh, from being a patient, um, I need to hear all of these different aspects because there's many parts like to the banking uh, issues, for example, that I'm, I'm really new to. Um, and so 
So for myself, I'm just open to continue to learn and to continue to advocate for the voices that that are, you know, in this um, forum and also throughout the rest of our community. I, I do agree um, with everything that my colleagues have said um, and Representative Capella um, really nails it. I think when we say we look at these models, they're really important. There's a lot of good to so many of them. And then we really have to say what will work here in our islands. Um, and of course, you have similar, um, the comparison to Alaska is very similar in terms of that FAA, um, you know, uh, barriers um, that perhaps we can find a way to move through that. And so um, our office will be um, prepared to help in that. I look forward to having further conversations with colleagues in terms of how we can find solutions, because that's really what this is all about. So um, I will also look more into the Oklahoma Unity Bill and, and educate myself as well. I make that as a commitment. Um, however, I, I don't feel like I can speak to it specifically at the moment. Is there conversation in the House or the Senate about uh, offering uh, additional licenses for things like uh, craft growers that want to um, participate in some of that business that we're alluding to, right, that income? And, and other people have, have said it this way. They, they've said um, if, you know, 70% of the market is um, in the patient community, um, maybe that's where we should look to pull small amounts of taxable income from like Oklahoma, um, as opposed to relying on eight businesses to deliver all of that tax revenue. So I'm wondering, uh, the, the question I guess is, um, how do you see um, licenses emerging that may be like some of the other other states. And, and this is really a big deal because it's very um, prohibiting for anyone that doesn't have a lot of money. So um, that's what's interesting to me is we would all like to be involved, especially our legacy growers. I'll, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Senator Zambueno Ventura. Okay, so I'm, I'm in agreement with this. In fact, um, being a lawyer, I was really against and, and Senator Sparrow was in it. Um, with a, this vertical model we have. And those who are unfamiliar with a vertical model, it's basically where the dispensary is required to be responsible for the production, the growing from, the, from seed all the way to sale. So this last, so I've been trying to at least move towards horizontal, which is um, less, to me, antitrust, less monopolistic than our current system. And I, 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 the health chair in the Senate was in agreement with this, but the AG doesn't like the idea of having more licenses and moving away from the vertical model. So the idea for, um, for those who are new, the horizontal model is what, 90%, almost all the other states, I think we're the only state with a vertical model where you have wholesalers, you have growers who are able to sell to the dispensaries themselves. So if even if we keep the eight dispensaries alone, at least the retail level, at least growers who are able to grow more than what they need you know, and have the, figured out the kind of strains that would help different patients will be able to at least sell to the dispensary. So you'll have growers, you'll have wholesalers, you will basically be able, so we can expand the market. Um, my bill kind of died. So I am pushing for that, uh, not just craft licenses, but at least allow for growers who have more than their share to be able to, to sell to existing dispensaries. And I also still want to increase the number of dispensary retail licenses because when you limit it to just eight or nine, you're basically letting the black market flourish, right? Because I mean, like, like represent Capella says, why would somebody from Kau drive all the way to Hilo, which is two hours away, or Kona to get their medicine? You're basically, so um, 
I do not have much hope for it this session, but hopefully the next election, we can have more open-minded people in the House because it passes the Senate. It's the House that we keep um, getting a stonewall in. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that perspective. And uh, Representative Capella, I, I, I think you you would like to address this one if I'm not mistaken. Um, please, please, uh, looking for your insights. Can you repeat the question one more time so I know that I'm getting exactly you? <laughs> yes, and, and it's my fault. The question was not very clear, but um, it's related to, um, for example, we have a lot of specialty licenses in the California model, Washington model, Oregon model. It costs tens of thousands of dollars to get involved. Our, our craft growers here that have been supporting our patients and our patient community for the last 20, 30, 40 years are wondering um, what um, a licensing model might be like here. And will they be excluded? Will they be unlicensed? Will they be called black market? Or will they have a chance to, uh, to operate similarly to the 10,000 businesses in, in Oklahoma that started up in their first year? Absolutely. Okay. I love this question. Um, thank you for clarifying. I think that uh, Senator Sandra and Ojua really hit it on the head. When you talk about the model that we implied when we created the medical cannabis industry itself, it is this very top-down vertical model. That doesn't work for the industry. It's not helping patients. It's not helping growers or legacy growers who've been doing this for generations. Um, it's not helping the strains that we have here in Hawaii that are world-renowned, really, that are being grown in places like California now because it's just what's happening because we haven't really implemented a market of legalization and we haven't jumped on that train the same way that other states have done it. So now they're profiting, literally their states are reaping benefits by taxation because unlike Hawaii, because we chose not to legalize. So I think the reality is that when we're talking about these craft, these craft um, licensures, it's not just about that model itself. It's about changing our entire system and the way we view cannabis. It's about making sure that we are opening up our economic base to the possibility of a full legalized, uh, legalized cannabis um, industry. So that once, I, and I talked about this earlier, but just making sure that we have people that if you wanna grow, you can grow. If you want to grow and then sell to a dispensary, you can do that. If you want to make fancy special biscuits, you can do that too. Whatever it is that you're good at, um, in that product line, you don't have to do it in this top-down model that's very inaccessible to the people around you um, or to everyday folks who can really make a good living off of um, really utilizing this plant um, and selling it and helping other people benefit from it. So I think it's this model that we, we have to just, we have to move towards legalization if we want that. And that's just the reality. It's not, it's not about just expanding licensure. It's about moving towards a model that really uplifts the industry as a whole um, and opens up this whole new economic opportunity for our state to continue to benefit. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you. The, um, I'd, I'd like to switch over to you, Senator Ocasio. Um, the, now, now the, I'm going to go back to the Oklahoma model because that's a, that's a medical model where this is flourishing. Um, and the uh, legalization market in California did start off by offering all of these licenses with 50,000 participants in the first year. Uh, the second year, it was down to 9,000. So there were 41,000 uh, craft growers that were uh, considered black market by the second year of legalization there. And so patients, um, I'm just going to put my patient advocate hat on here. Um, we don't care when we're sick, right? We, what we are concerned about is access to medicine without being arrested. And then we need these strains that are of a particular configuration to treat our particular symptomology. So um, I'll, I'll push that over to you, Senator Ocasio. Um, can, can you offer any additional insights or, or perspectives there? And I know we're, um, We've got a lot going on. We, we've unpacked a lot. I'm not trying to put it back in the box necessarily, but if you could help sort of bring us back to um, 
how you feel uh, patient advocates could get involved and, and be effective at protecting patient rights in light of these uh, questions about licensing and, and how people can participate in the industry. Um, so it sounds like, um, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, but it's, it's like the prime importance is making sure that patients can get the medicine that they need. Um, and so looking at all the different roadblocks um, that exist within you know, our, our legal system and also the distribution, um, you know, thinking about trickle down or top down as opposed to horizontal, I don't know when trickle down or top down has ever worked. Um, for the people and for and for the majority, and so my approach to it all is is to be looking at, oh sorry, uh, looking at what what really will work uh, for the majority of folks who need this medicine. Um, when we think about when I think about the question that uh, Representative Capella was just addressing, it really comes down to this economic justice piece as well. When you're looking at, um, you know will the specialty licenses be cost prohibitive to um, some artisan growers or smaller scale farmers? You know, there's these different ideas. And so really need to look at all of those protections that would allow for uh, a really just system that then continues to allow the fundamental thing, which is patients to get their medicine. Um, and so, like I said, as, as, a, as, a, as a new lawmaker, you know, this is all of these nuances are really important, but coming at it from the perspective of economic, of a, of a really just system, rather than this vertical um, top down situation where it's really about profit and not as much about advocacy for folks who need the medicine. Um, and so holding that in the, in the, in the prime light, really, and in, in all of the decision making, again, all of the nuances being so complex in some ways, but I know there are models that, that we can design um, for, for Hawaii that really match what we need. And so that, so that we really can see all these small scale farmers growing. And it goes, that just goes right back to the diversification of our economy, which is so unbelievably necessary in all forms. And to make sure that growing is legal, selling is legal, uh, utilizing the medicine is, is legal, you know, and so, you know, putting all of these into place so that we really have a robust system and we and you know, our state and our community can be profiting not only certain businesses. Super helpful. Thank you, Senator Casio. I appreciate that. Um, and we'll, we'll jump over to you, Representative Illigan. Uh, can you uh, kind of give us some perspective there from the House? Yeah, of course. And not from the House. This is one representative's opinion. <laughs> so I don't speak on behalf of the other 50 representatives. But I just want to say my my base is pretty simple on how to do it. I want to focus on quality and access. And quality is pretty much for the patient, the safety for the patient. We're looking at THC levels. A dispensary is like heavily regulated. They would know how much THC percentage is in the medicine that they're providing. When we're looking at craft um, production, we might not know. We we have it's it's a different market share too. But we have to look at the safety of the patient, and it's also dependent on the decision on the patient whether or not they want a. Um, medicine from a dispensary or they want it from a homegrown farmer. It's different types of um, flavors that should be available. I, I'm a big advocate for competition and we should have it. And the other elected officials mentioned about access. We live on a big island and the few licenses that's needed on that's, ha that's on the big island doesn't um, take into account the geographical barrier that we have. We can fit all the islands on the big island. My district and Senator's district is the size of Oahu. It's 500, I, I think it's, um, Kauai is 500 square miles. Um, Puna is 550 square miles and Oahu is 600 square miles. We're talking about a few licenses for the Big Island, 
where we have to also look at Oahu where there's the population base. Um, but access to the medicine, whether it's a farm to the medicine cabinet or a dispensary or however you wanna purchase it, it goes back to patients shouldn't be looked at as criminals. They should be real patients who's just just wanting to have medicine for what they're going through. And if we continue advocating that we're pushing for plant-based medicine, that we're allowing them access to medicine that they want to partake, then I think that would go a long way with the elected, elected officials that's coming in or in existing. The existing part is hard to change somebody's belief, but it's it might be a slow process. And at least the new electeds that come in, they might be open to new ideas, um, depending on their age. <laughs> but I just want to say that quality and access is definitely key to setting up any sorts of legislation here. And we do have to take into account the geographical um, barriers and the population base. But why should we also limit that um, selling when we should be able to sell throughout the whole state? Uh, so there's, there's many things that we could do better. And I honestly feel like there is a lot of things that we could push. And, Mind you, I don't want you guys to feel discouraged that um, you are you don't feel like you're getting any progress uh, because you didn't push a legislation forward. I honestly see progress. Before the, percep um, the perception of marijuana, just medical marijuana, wasn't even above 50%, that there's progress happening. We just got to take it one step at a time, meet the people who we know, continue convincing them, continue educating them, and continue sharing what the patients are going through and that they want an option that's plant-based. So I want to say we're making progress. Let's just continue moving along. Is it possible that a committee or a group in the legislature might be able to come up with the educational points that a patient advocacy group could provide uh, to help inform and, and educate on the issues that patients are facing. I definitely know um, some people in the house that I would love for you guys to talk to and allow me to set a meeting with a bunch of legislators and for you to invite the patients that's that has that cannabis has helped and continue just focusing on how they are helped because otherwise I wouldn't be pushing this if it's not helping it's helping and so focus on the fact that it's providing um some relief, we're talking about cancer all the way to pain. So I just want to say, I'll set that meeting up. You, you already know my email, so I don't have to share that with you. Um, and um, if you don't mind, can we do this in a month or two? Just because I actually um, have some other things that is currently going on. And so if you allow me some time to um, bring those people up, um, I can at least do that and bridge yeah, it, the conversation. It, it would be a pleasure to join uh, you and and uh, other legislators in a in a super productive sit down meeting. Absolutely, I'll follow up uh, with a with an email afterwards. Um, thank you for that. Who would like to go next with that question on education and knowledge sharing and and how we can best serve you? I really think you folks should take up Representative Ilagan's offer because as you folks know, um, these progressive bills die in the house. And if we can get these um, house freshmen who are younger and more open to new ideas into um, to be educated as to why it's not, why the current situation, 
was good as a starter, but needs to be expanded to be able to help more um, and not just profit the few, the eight, there's only eight, okay? There's only two on the big island. Um, the, the, two, the eight dispensary licensees, how we need to be able to spread the wealth. And if the whole idea is economic diversification, enriching eight dispensaries is not economic diversification. So um, yeah, uh, the, the, basically I think educating the young legislators who are in and will really help motivate more. The other thing that needs to be, um, we need to really work on the governor, okay? Because basically that is the problem because the house is not gonna push a bill that the governor is gonna veto. And the governor right now has a very conservative attorney general who is basically telling him that this is not the way to go. Back when it was um, the prior AG who was a little bit more liberal and how I was able to get my uh, decriminalization of paraphernalia through, um, I don't think I could have been able to get it through with this current attorney general. If we are able to get the governor to move on the subject or at least be open to the idea of a horizontal, I mean, allowing for growers to be able to sell to retail dispensaries and at least move forward with increasing the number of dispensary licenses to just more than eight. I mean, it's an infinitesimal move. I, I agree, it's just an infinitesimal move towards full-blown legalization. But I can't even get the governor and the house to even make that infinitesimal move to allow for production licenses separate from dispensary licenses so that growers will be able, you know, so that we could spread the wealth and the other and increasing dispensary licenses, which we had envisioned when we first passed the bill. We, I can't even get them to do that. So, you know, um, baby steps is good, but get, get him to at least move off of this 2015 era that eight dispensaries is enough and we should keep on with the monopoly. So, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Um, Representative Capella, would you like to share your insights with the education or education and knowledge sharing mandate, I suppose, is what we're talking about. Absolutely. Earlier, I think, so first off, I think this is actually a really good step coming together, creating spaces like this with legislators, with industry experts, with um, community members, with cardholders is really important. Um, being able to get people all on the same page is a fantastic move in whenever you're putting any type of legislation forward. Um, I think another really good step is actually something that HICIA did this past year. They had put together this really nice flyer that had different points of um, just debunking some of the myths or the propaganda I saw in the chat over here, the many years of propaganda that many legislators, that's all they've been fed and that's all they know. Um, so debunking some of those things, putting together those types of sheets and then sending it to different legislators is really key. And then I think another really important factor, and I'm going to go back to this, is go and create a capital login so that you can testify when legislation does come out. Um, I know it's easy to, to say, oh, I'm gonna do it, but the reality is that if you don't share your voice, legislators don't know. It's up to the public to hold people accountable. So as cardholders, as, some, as people that want to move towards um, a better industry that actually supports and protects patients, then we need your very vital voice um, at those tables. Uh, the last thing that I also wanna say is that um, Having one-on-one -on -one meetings or large meetings with legislators, anytime you get an audience with a legislator, take it, utilize it, um, share all of the information that you can. Um, 
And this one thing that my office is actually going to start working on um, over the interim, probably starting next month uh, in July, is what we have planned, but is to actually create more of a working group. My background actually is in anti-trafficking efforts. Um, and years and years ago, um, we worked with a number of different organizations, um, including the AG's office, to work on specific legislation. Oftentimes, I think legislators are approached um, in like January, right before legislative session is starting with different ideas of pieces of legislation. And the reality is that that's too late. Legislators need these pieces of information. They need to be reached out to, especially if it's a bill, very early on. Like we're starting to put together our package now. So it takes a lot of time to put together different issues um, and different ideas. And you have to reach out to your legislator early on. Um, so we're going to start working on a, we're going to create another working group so that we can actually work alongside industry experts, hopefully with the AG's office, but also with Department of Health, along with a number of other legislators um, to actually get information and to put together a bill that actually is something that maybe we won't all agree on, but at least we can hash out some of the arguments early on before we're hashing them out in front of the committee chairs. Um, I think that that's just one of the things that we need to do. And there's many other things. I think the reality is that we just need consistency. Know that just because you're gonna get your bill heard once, it has to go through at least six more hearings and multiple times on the floor, and it can die at any point in time. So your advocacy really needs to follow the piece of legislation as a whole um, through the entire process. And that's something that I think people can start learning about now and how to do that and how to be a successful advocate. It, and we're gonna do that in about an hour with former Senate Majority Leader Gary Hooser giving us a little primer on Advocacy 101. So thank you for that advice, we're, we're on it. Thank you. Um, Senator Casio, uh, can, can we get some of your Manalo on that? How, how do we, um, you know, of course, we, we want to set up meetings, um, of course, but we're not lobbyists. We're, we're patients. And uh, to get patients to show up uh, on Oahu, we have some special challenges, right? Um, for one thing, how do you medicate uh, between your home in Puna and the airport? How do you medicate between the airport in Hilo or Kona and the airport on Oahu? Like, how do you keep that pain down or how do you keep what your doctor is recommending um, the level of cannabinoids in your system while you're traveling? With it? That's just one issue, right? Maintaining dosage over, a, you know, traveling to Oahu. We have patients on Oahu, of course, who can participate, but they wouldn't be your local constituent. Is there a way um, where we can provide some of this education in a, um, that is encapsulated? Is it more Zoom meetings? Is, is that possible? I'm looking for any ideas that you might have for, for a knowledge exchange. Well, honestly, um, that's one thing that I was thinking that right now, being that folks are getting more and more familiar with Zoom every day, and this is, I mean, even right now, we have folks from all over, probably um, all over Hawaii and definitely all over the United States even. So um, we have this opportunity and this um, at this forum to do exactly what you're, what you're speaking of, is allow folks to come in and give testimonials from Kauai um, and from elsewhere, you know, all over without having to navigate the challenges that you're speaking of in terms of medication <clears throat> and those... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, those different barriers. Um, and so um, taking advantage of that. <clears throat> and so to really, um, in, in doing that, I'm, I definitely would love to host and put together um, and, and help more of those, um, these kind of conversations. I think this is a hugely rich start. Um, and <clears throat> you folks have been doing it for a long time. So it's not even that it started yeah, today. I just, uh, so uh, another thing just to, to um, add on to Senator San Buenaventura's um, Manao about our governor is then to really focus on who our next governor will be and what, uh, you know, what values they hold, of course. It, it, this is just the natural part of this civics education piece too, where um, like Representative Capella said, follow legislation all the way through. Um, and it really does, in a, for a first time legislator, being in a hearing and having had a lot of information already coming to me is, is much more valuable 
um, and also having advocates on on testimony um, <clears throat> that can support my vote and vice versa, right? Because it's really, if I'm representing my constituency, then, you know, how do I know that if there's no testimony? How, of course, I reach out into the community, I'm, I'm accessible, I'm in touch with my community, uh, but where's the evidence? And so when we have that kind of evidence, it, it drives that conversation even more because I can be in meetings uh, with my colleagues and say, actually, we're all getting these 5 million emails. Um, so it's not really, there's not really a question of where our constituents are standing and who they are. Okay, when you look at it, it's like, okay, these are the dispensaries giving this testimony. These are the patients giving this testimony. And if they're up opposing, then it's very clear we can kind of look at why. Um, you know, same thing with anything with the uh, tourism industry, for example, you're going to have you know, one voice coming from uh, those affected by certain aspects of it. And though you're going to have uh, perhaps a differing testimony from those that are providing those services, maybe hotel industry versus, um, you know, locals being affected uh, in, in a local, com in a small community, you know, those kinds of things. And so it's really important to be able to differentiate and look at who's giving the information and why and what they're, you know, what the value they bring to it. So yeah, I just think it's really important to continue to advocate throughout the whole thing. I'm definitely willing to host and um, share this information. I know folks throughout this whole event have been speaking to the point of it's really about educating, re-educating, um, breaking the stigma and um, giving a, a, a different view than the pr propaganda than, that folks have maybe uh, grown up with. So mahalo, thank you for sharing everyone. Deeply appreciate that. Thank you. And as um, representatives and senators, you certainly have the ability to convene. And so we're, we look forward to that. Uh, thank you, Senator Acasio. And, and we're, we're right up against our time, 129 on my clock. Um, if I could, um, our, we, we've got a senior senator here, with Joy San Buenaventura. Did you have any, can you, can you leave us with some last words of wisdom? Yes, yeah, so um, what I wanted to point out was back in the 90s, um, Roger Christie was very successful with that Open Sky initiative, but that was only our island. My suggestion is it's an out-of-the-box thing because is especially when we're looking at the new, the next election, let's do an open sky initiative part two. Tweet that and make it not only for the big island, but coordinate it with all the other islands so that we can all speak with one voice. And it's not just the medical marijuana dispensary people. It's not just the medical cannabis people. It's not just recreational marijuana, et cetera, okay? That's my suggestion, because when you speak out with what, I mean, that Open Sky Initiative was wonderful for the Big Island, but we need to do it statewide. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I totally agree. Um, I, I hope that uh, everyone that's been watching today has expanded their consciousness and, and their awareness of, uh, of what patients need. Thank you all so much for for making that happen and with any success through these educational initiatives i hope that we won't have the need to um, focus so much on patients and that we can all join together in legalization day at some point um, but for now we're going to stay a patient's first organization and, and we'll bring that information to you well, we're um, the ladies from the maui cannabis guild and we're here to welcome you today as we stand witness to the success of mar medical marijuana in the United States and the Hawaiian Islands. You'll hear today how this industry not only grows the economy, how it reduces our medical expenses, how it provides an alternative to opiate drugs, and how it eases the pains of our loved ones in time of illness, and so much more. The states with exemplary dispensaries increase all of the above qualities in their state. So states that we never dreamed of are opening their doors to complete legalization. Beginning with states like Colorado and Washington, Oregon, all the way to most recently Virginia, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and even Alabama. It's in these places that the medical marijuana industry has also boomed. 
what we'd like you to take away today from our pre precious time with you is that on Maui, we really don't have adequate medical marijuana. We don't really have a program for our patients. When you go, like I did, to Arizona to the Mayo Clinic and they give you your, your license and you get to go to a dispensary there, you walk in and there's a case that shows a, for anxiety. There's a case of products for dis depression. There's a case for insomnia and for many things that people suffer and take many pills for. I can go in and there's an expert there to help me with these products. Sometimes maybe it's better to eat and have an edible Sometimes people prefer to smoke or vaporize. All these options are available in the clinic when I was there in Arizona. And they made me my own personal items so that I knew I was getting the right medication. Here on Maui, that's not necessarily the case. There are no small farmers and small producers providing the dispensaries here with the same products that we got in Arizona or California or any other place that has regular dispensaries. Our dispensary is limited. It has a limited amount of product that you can't smell, you can't unwrap. You go in and you buy, but this isn't a choice. We need more product and we need people to be able to sell the dispensary's products. We need medicine and we need real medicine. We don't just need to smoke a bowl. Right, we need to open it up. That's right. It's a we need to make right more, now. it's a closed loop and we need to open it to our precious small farmers and to our patients so we can get them the correct medicine. The bills this past legislative session would have sought to close down our patient rights. These bills would bring an end to our right to grow for patients. And we can't have that either. So all these things are a pressure on our medical marijuana system here on Maui. And we'd like to ask you, to consider what could be for Maui in its economy and in its wellness if we expand what our dispensaries provide as medicine to our people here on this island. Thank you. Mahalo. All right, uh, that was uh, Tara and Beth from the Maui Cannabis Guild. Thank you so much for sending that uh, video in. Um, up next, we're gonna bring back uh, Dale Rosenfeld. Aloha, Dale. Aloha. And I understand you have a special guest from Kauai uh, that you would like to introduce. I'm so grateful to Justin Collar, who is our prosecuting attorney and an understanding person of what medical cannabis really is. Justin, are you ready to come on board and let us talk with you and hear what you see going on from the legis from from the prosecuting attorney's point of view? What any personal stories that you have? And folks that are watching right now, anybody who would like to ask a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box and I'll follow through and make sure that those questions are sent and asked of Justin Collar. Thank you. Justin, take it away. Okay, so just talking about a view from the prosecutor's office. And let's see here. Medical use of cannabis in Hawaii. Uh, who can use cannabis for medical reasons in Hawaii? Uh, that's a qualifying patient. And we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. A qualifying out of state patient that is legally authorized to use cannabis for medical purposes in another state, US territory or the District of Columbia. Minors under the age of 18 can also be qualifying patients. However, they must meet additional requirements to be a qualifying patient. And that is whether uh, in-state resident or out of state. Uh, we'll talk about the definition of qualifying patient and debilitating medical condition because those are always the subject of contention. Uh, a qualifying patient is a person who has been diagnosed by a physician or advanced practice RN as having a debilitating medical condition. And that is defined in the Hawaii Revised Statute, Section 329.121, with a non-exhaustive list. An unlisted condition can be approved by the Department of Health uh, in response to a request from a physician, a PRN, or a potentially qualifying patient. 
how much cannabis can a qualifying patient have? Uh, a qualifying patient has to have and cannot have more than an adequate supply. And that's another definition that is somewhat uh, uh, varies from state to state, let's just say. Um, and an adequate supply is an amount jointly possessed, no pun intended, between the qualifying patient and the primary caregiver that is not more than is reasonably necessary to ensure uninterrupted availability of cannabis for alleviating symptoms of the debilitating medical condition. The total amount uh, cannot exceed 10 plants, whether mature or immature, and four ounces of any combination of usable cannabis and manufactured cannabis products. So that's, that's a fairly substantial amount, um, far higher than um, our state's threshold for decriminalized uh, possession, which is three grams, which is a very small amount. Uh, the adequate supply definition for a qualifying out-of-state patient is different. And you can, again, get more on that in HRS 329-121. So for an out-of-state uh, patient, the amount individually possessed by a qualifying out-of-state patient or jointly possessed by a qualifying out-of-state patient under the age of 18 and the caregiver uh, of the qualifying out-of-state patient that is not more than is reasonably necessary to ensure uninterrupted availability of cannabis for alleviating symptoms of the debilitating medical condition. It would be nice if legislators could uh, work on brevity in writing these definitions so that they make more sense to people. Uh, the total amount, again, cannot exceed four ounces at any given time of any combination of cannabis and manufactured products, and living plants cannot be possessed by a qualifying out-of-state patient. When does the authorization not apply? Under Hawaii law, authorization for medical use does not apply to use that endangers the health or well-being of another person. And the authorization also does not allow the use of cannabis for purposes other than medical use. Uh, medical use is not allowed in a school bus, a public bus, or any moving vehicle, including your personal vehicle, in the workplace of one's employment, on any school grounds, at any public park, public beach, public recreation center, recreation youth center, or at any other place open to the public except for transport. So you can transport it from place to place. It is okay, uh, as I mentioned, to transport cannabis in any public place by qualifying patient, primary caregiver, qualifying out-of-state patient, caregiver of a qualifying out-of-state patient, or an owner or employee of a licensed medical cannabis dispensary, of which we have one here on Kauai. Uh, the transport restrictions under the law the cannabis must be transported in a sealed container, cannot be visible to the public, cannot be removed from its sealed container or consumed while it's in a public place. If transporting the cannabis to a certified laboratory for testing, only up to one gram per test may be transported. And then only if they have an appointment, the confirmation was obtained with this time and date of the appointment, a detailed description of the product and amount to be transported and has that confirmation with them uh, during transport. So again, they wrote these rules to be uh, very narrowly tailored. Allowable transport does not presently include inter-island transportation by any means or for any purpose between a qualified patient, primary caregiver, qualifying out-of-state patient, caregiver of the out-of-state patient, and any other entity or individual. So that presents a potential problem in an island state where people um, move about frequently. Some protections for patients and caregivers, uh, both in and out of state, they can assert medical use as an affirmative defense, but must strictly comply with statutes. This is HRS 329-125. Schools cannot, public schools cannot refuse to enroll or otherwise penalize, and landlords cannot uh, refuse to lease property to a person solely for their status as a qualifying patient or caregiver, unless failing to do so would cause the school or landlord to lose monetary or licensing related benefits under federal law or regulation. Uh, for purposes of medical care, qualifying patients use of cannabis and compliance with the law shall be considered the equivalent of the use of any other medication. So um, at least for purposes of this law, cannabis is treated like any other medica medication that um, and would not be considered use of an illegal substance. And again, there are protections uh, regarding custody, visitation, and parenting time with a minor uh, based on um, medical cannabis. No, no presumption of neglect 
uh, of child endangerment for conduct allowed under the medical use of cannabis statutes unless their conduct created danger to the safety of a minor. I have not seen that situation arise in my time as prosecutor. Um, real briefly, give you my position on legalization for recreational use. I do support that. I am the only law enforcement official in Hawaii to testify in favor of legalizing cannabis for recreational use in the past session, as well as increasing the threshold for the uh, amount of that may be possessed um, under de the decriminalization statute. So I, I think at this point, we've seen enough states uh, that have done this and that have done it safely and that have done it effectively. And it's been beneficial to the state in terms of tax revenue, uh, resources for education, and ending uh, failed mass incarceration policies in the 1980s and 1990s. So with that, um, you know, I'll note that we currently prosecute almost no cannabis related offenses. Uh, we do not see cannabis as a major public safety threat to our community or even as a minor public safety threat. We don't see it as a threat in our community. We um, see very, uh, al almost no violent cases that involve possession or consumption of cannabis. So uh, with that, I'll Open the floor up for questions. Let me see what we've got in the chat, if there's anything. Uh, where's the chat? I will turn off screen sharing. Uh, that, was, that was incredibly helpful, Justin. Thank you so much for that. Um, I. I honestly believe that that was the most information ever communicated verbally about the medical cannabis program to patients. Um, we've had to rely on uh, the written or uh, digital documentation for this, which um, those of us who have been medicated when trying to learn more about the program find it extremely difficult to navigate the myriad of laws, um, rules, and regulations that we have to adhere to, to access medicine. So thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for sharing that in a way that it reaches a lot more people. It's very impactful. Sure. And, you know, the, the laws have been getting better incrementally over the years. Um, you know, the program as originally conceived, you, I'm sure you remember, made it impossible. It said you could possess X number of plants, but there was no legal way to obtain the plants. It, it, it was intended to be uh, inaccessible and opaque. Um, the laws have gotten somewhat better uh, over the intervening years, but there's still, um, it's still a tough uh, road to navigate for a lot of people. And, you know, part of my job is keeping the community safe. And that means helping people understand what the law is because um, most people want to comply with the law. Justin, thank you so much. I have a couple questions that have come up here. Sure. Uh, the first one is, what personally led you to support medical cannabis or cannabis in general? Um, just my experiences seeing, um, you know, knowing, knowing people in my life that have benefited from it. Um, the, the, the studies that I've read that explain the medical uh, benefits, the... Um, you know, just lived experience, I would say, of being somebody who's uh, almost 48 years old and has, has been around and seen a few things. So, um, you know, it just, it just makes sense that we treat this um, like the medicine that it is, like that recognize the benefits that it, it provides for people. And, you know, we, we want to help people be healthy. You know, public safety and public health go hand in hand. And to me, um, you know, the, 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 the argument's not even a close one. Thank you, thank you. Um, wondering about a compliance check. So this is a question, let me see. To count plants and check labels and licenses, yes, they show up with a SWAT team. They've actually shown up at my house with this huge SWAT team from Maui with bigger people than I'd ever seen. Uh, is there any way to change the style of inspections so they're not intimidating patients? I mean, it, it certainly, I would think so. I mean, um, that, that would be a question that I think the police chiefs would have to answer. I've, uh, I've advocated for 
removing funding from the Green Harvest program for, for years now and directing those funds to other areas where they could actually benefit the community. Um, I don't feel that the, the current system of, of uh, using the helicopters, it's they're very intrusive. Like you said, the militarization of the, the compliance checks, um, it's, it, it seems um, excessive to me and I would like to see that change. Thank you. Uh, last question looks like here is, if you have any insight into the four ounces versus 10 plants, how is it that we are allowed to grow 10 plants per patient, but only hold four ounces? Yeah, and um, that I, I don't have a lot of insight into how the legislature arrived at that particular number. Um, I am not a horticulturalist myself, so I don't have a keen understanding of the yield of, of each plant. And I suspect the people who wrote the law also did not have an understanding of that. And that's how we ended up with what seems to be an uh, incongruous uh, result in the statute. So, you know, I'd rec there's, there's a lot of uh, open-minded and smart people in the ledge, uh, especially these days. And I think if if people go to them and advocate for a more sensible um, balance, that's something they would take a serious look at based on my interactions. Great, thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to say to wrap it up? No, I just wanna say thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I've appreciated being uh, parts of these conferences over the years and um, just hope you all have a safe and healthy week and uh, take care. Thank you so much and, and back to you, Brent. Thank you so much, Dale. Thank you so much, Justin. Deeply appreciate your, your sacrifice of your time. Thank you. Uh, Next up, Senator Hooser or former Senator Hooser, could, uh, could we get your insights into how patient organizations and patients could advocate on our own behalf to sort of bring about some of this change we've been discussing today? Yeah, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Brent. Thank you for the very gracious uh, introduction. I appreciate that. I appreciate the invitation and the ability to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. It's uh, essentially how private citizens can, can best impact public policy. And just one second. I, I do have a, a, my regular presentation, but today I'm going to kind of go through just some high, highlights of it. And if there's time, we can take questions. Uh, before I start, or as part of it, uh, words matter and messaging matters. Uh, and so when, as I'm listening to the conversation, when I hear the words recreational use, I kind of cringe a little bit, and I much prefer responsible adult use. Uh, and I think that that wears a little better in a public discussion uh, at the legislature, responsible adult use. Who could be against that? Uh, the other thing that struck me from the earlier conversation when I jumped on is the importance to have a unified message. I've been to at least one other conference similar uh, to this, and I was involved a little bit lobbying on behalf of uh, legalization for responsible adult use in, in the Hawaii legislature. And it became real clear to me that there were three different groups, there may be more than that, but three different groups all have a, a strong voice. And it's essential, absolutely essential that these three groups get together and have a unified message. And one group uh, in my mind, and you, you folks all know more about this than I do, but one group is the user, the patient, the responsible adult, the person that grows in their backyard or grows a little bit here and there, they just wanna be able to use it and not pay an exorbitant amount for it, not get arrested for it, not have to hassle with it. They just want to use it. The other group are the commercial businesses uh, in Hawaii. No, those are the ones that are permitted to sell legally. And the third group would be the, uh, you can call them black market, gray market uh, users who want to make money, who want to get in on the business of it. And so you have those three groups pushing and pulling on the legislation. Uh, I think uh, Senator, former Senator Sparrow, who's a, a colleague of mine when I was serving in the Senate, in the chat, he mentioned uh, one paragraph, which I agree with, is that 
a way forward is to, I'm talking now on legalization, is to give the existing permit holders some space to make money, whether it's two years or three years, and then open up the business so everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but many more people from growers to retailers to processors uh, can have, uh, uh, can participate in the industry and preserve the right to grow. So preserving the right to grow uh, is a line in the sand for myself. And so those, those are the three, three elements. Uh, to, to be effective, and, and sometimes it's almost embarrassing because I'm talking to people here who obviously are involved in, in government, and, but some of the, the mistakes that people make are so routine and so obvious. Uh, when I was in the Senate, I served in the Hawaii State Senate for eight years. I would sometimes get hundreds or thousands of emails. And many of those emails would not have the person's name on the email. It would be a message telling me to vote yes or vote no, but it wouldn't say John Smith or Mary Jones and it wouldn't have their address on it. I wouldn't know where they were from. I wouldn't know who they were. Their email address would often say surferjoe at hotmail.com. And so it sounds ridiculous, but come up with an email address that says who you are, in my opinion. Mine's garylhooser at gmail.com. Uh, and Make sure you sign your emails when you're, when you're reaching out to legislators. And, and again, I, I don't want to dumb it down too, too deep, but uh, you would be shocked at the number of emails I've gotten. And another one for local residents, I know not everybody here is a local resident, but if you want to be effective, you have to have an 808 phone number. Okay, so if you're contacting a legislator in your district and you've got a 504 or 714 or something, they know you don't live here. Or they know that if you do live here, you just got here, and you're probably not going to stay long anyway. So it, it vastly increases your credibility if you have an 808 number. Uh, so th those are some of the, the basics. The really important thing is to know who exactly represents your district. Most people, I talk to these groups all the time, most folks cannot tell me who's your state representative, who's your state senator. Uh, they, they, they either will quote the, the federal senator, the U.S. senator, U.S. House member, but they won't know who their own representative or their own state senator is. And that is the most important person to you, and you're the most important person to him or her. They cannot serve without your vote or your support, and they darn well don't want you running against them or supporting your, their opponent. But if you don't even know who they are, you, you can't even start, you can't even have a conversation. And at the legislature, I think every legislator on the call here will agree, it's about relationships. It's about knowing relationships, people in your district, people that you're doing business with on a legislative level. And if you don't even know their name, you can't have a relationship with them. And so job one, find out who your legislator is. Job two, call them up or email them and ask to meet with them. Ask to meet in the district. We're outside of the legislative session. It is difficult in the legislative session because there's so much going on. It's difficult to get a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Outside the session, the member of your state house, your state senator, they should say yes to you. You call them, say a couple of people in the neighborhood, we'd like to meet and have coffee with you. We'd like to come go somewhere and meet with you and talk to you about this issue. They should and they will say yes. If they don't, then they're asking for you know, trouble in the next election. We are blessed to live in a state where you can have a personal relationship with your senator or representative the, at the state level. You can't do this in California or Chicago or a lot of big states. There's just too many people. In Hawaii, you can. Uh, and so I encourage you, take advantage of that. Don't, uh, don't be shy. Call them up. Say, I'd like to meet with you. And if you live on you know, wherever you live, they're, they're, they represent you. They're in your district. We are in an election year. And uh, I was laughing when uh, Justin Kohler from Kauai said that he was 48 years old and had 48 years of experience. And that's where he came to his values. Well, I've got 67 years of experience and I'm sick and tired. And I'm not gonna take it anymore. That's how I'm feeling about how long it takes 
to take baby steps on some of these important issues. Whether, whether it's having a cannabis, medical cannabis or uh, legalized cannabis law that works, we should have had this all 10 years ago or more. You know, this is, it's, it is crazy that it takes so long. Uh, and I believe we should hold our legislators accountable. Uh, there was one particular legislator on the Big Island, and I'll say Representative uh, Nakashima, and he chairs a key committee. And he said after the Senate passed the the their bill on on recreational or responsible adult use, he said flat out, "Well, that's not going to pass in the House." And so you have one representative telling the entire state legislature it's not going to happen, and so that is that's not acceptable. Uh, so the people in his district need to mobilize, need to go talk to him about that. So it starts with people, with your own representative. Uh, get to know them. If you like them, help them. So who, I served in the state Senate for eight years and the Kauai County Council for eight years. I ran in 10 different campaigns, lost four and won six. Who's the most important person to me as a lawmaker? Who's, who's got the most influence on me? No, my wife and my daughter. <laughs> okay. And next, next is maybe my neighbor. And next is the constituent who helps me. I'll tell you the truth. A constituent who walks door to door in the hot sun for Gary Hooser. If he calls me, he or she calls me, I'm going to call him back. And I'm going to do whatever I can to help them. I'm not going to go to jail for them. I'm not going to violate my principles for them. But if they need my help, I'm going to help them. Uh, because, you know, I, I love the work that I did. You can't do it without winning. You need people to help you to win. And to me, it's more, it's more than money. If someone's going to knock on doors, go on door to door, hot sun, hold signs in the highway, help me and not ask me for nothing. Uh, when they finally do ask, uh, I'm going to do what I can. So it's relationships. It's people that, that you know and trust and people that know and trust you. And if you don't have a relationship, then you're, you're, starting, you're starting way behind. And then the hierarchy goes down from there. Other people in the, in the district, it goes to uh, organizations like the organizations that are uh, represented here today, people like the Sierra Club, labor unions, uh, donors. And at the very bottom of the list are people that don't live here. You know, I've got a million people trying to call me as a state senator and the people that call so I'm gonna take first are people that live in the district who I know. And, and people that I have a relationship with. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, what's the best way to testify? Is an email work or is a, is a petition good? I, I have what I call a hierarchy of testimony. The, at the very top of it is in-person testimony. Bye-bye, good night. Okay. This is my granddaughter. She's interrupted my her grandpa at the meeting. Uh, okay, let me talk, okay? So, okay, that's good, that's good. So at the, at the top of the hierarchy are individual testifiers from the district. A lot of times young people, young people come in and testify in person. Then if you're not in person, the next would be Zoom or something like that. Then next would be email from people in the district. And then further down the list would be mass email. Uh, mass email is better than no email. So if, if, you're, if all you're going to do is push a button and tell somebody vote yes or vote no, do it. Push that button. It's better than nothing. Was I, did you lose me or am I, I'm back now? Yeah, that was my bad. Sorry. Okay. Okay. And then at the very bottom would be petitions. Petitions are okay if they're from the district. And they're, uh, they're targeted and there's a lot of people. If they're just a mass petition and, and the, the, the legislator looks at them, doesn't recognize the names and addresses, they're really not worth a lot. Uh, so I'm gonna quickly move on to the final point. So first of all, know your legislator. And they say, well, there's nothing I can do. You tell them, well, I believe there is some stuff you can do. You can go push for me. So you push on them, so they push on somebody else. Uh, and you do it with respect, you do it with knowledge, and you do it in a way that they know you're not leaving. 
You're not walking away. You're going to keep coming back and you're going to bring your friends and neighbors with you. And at some point, they're going to deal with you. You have to have your facts and you got to have passion. But it's 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 a lot more than that. Uh, so that's with your own representative. Then I, I encourage people affiliate with groups if you're not with a group. Uh, because a group would, will track legislation, a, a group will send you an email alert telling you when to testify, when not to testify. And there's key people within the system, the chair of certain committees and whatnot. So I mentioned uh, Representative Nakashima uh, as, a, as a whipping boy for this issue, uh, and he deservedly so. Uh, and rather than all of us call him, we would look to see who do you know in his district? Who do you know? I mean, find out where, where he lives and find out if you know people in that neighborhood, uh, people that work with him, uh, people that look like him, people that look like the demographics of that neighborhood. Uh, and then, then you turn on the, the fire hose and, and you, uh, you offer that testimony. But it starts with a unified message. If you all don't have a unified message, if the growers, if the small users are fighting the, the commercial guys and the commercial guys are fighting the black market guys and the black market guys when well, they want their piece of the pie too. If you don't have a unified message, you're not going to get anywhere because those that are opposed are going to point to that. They're going to point to that. Well, we don't know what to do because you guys aren't on the same page. Uh, but th that's, that's about the highlights for now. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions from anyone. Uh, you know, you have some good people on the screen today. Uh, Senator Ocasio, uh, Senator uh, Capella, I mean, Representative Capella, both of them are new. Uh, they, they deserve and need your help uh, because uh, they'll be challenged by the establishment kind of thing because they're, they're a little bit too progressive, a little bit too people on the planet oriented, I think, uh, for some in the mainstream. Other questions? Well, uh, Gary, I, I have a I have a question. Sure. Um, I, I'm just wondering uh, how um, how you're sort of facilitating that pipeline of uh, freshman legislators um, who are willing to take on the bigger questions. Um, you know, after 21 years of this medical cannabis program and patients uh, still having a, a lot of issues because the program's not was never medicalized. Uh, it's important to us to bring in more freshman legislators who are willing uh, to do it <clears throat> like the farmer did back in the uh, uh, 17, 1800s, right? Uh, where they would go in and they would become a legislator, not because they wanted to politically, but because they felt like they had to. And what? so I'm, I'm hopeful for all of our uh, freshman senators and representatives that they'll go in and, and do the hard work um, that it takes to create the bigger impacts. Um, can, can you, can you kind of tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in, in that area? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, the, a couple of different organizations uh, I work with are, are focused on this right now. And let me say, first of all, there's lots of ways to make change happen. Okay, you could take them to court, sue them the bad guys, and we should and we are. You can take it to the streets, you can carry signs, you can march, we should and we are. Uh, you can advocate down at the legislature. You can, you can submit testimony, you could be there telling them what to do, uh, and, and we're doing that. But we need to do more than that. We need to change the people that are, that are there that, have, that are sitting at the table, because some of them don't care. You know, they flat out don't care about uh, whether you're carrying a sign and whether you're writing a letter. Uh, and we need to find people who look at the world the way we do. And I say that in a global sense, you know, uh, people, uh, people that put people and the planet first over money and over their own personal self-interest. Uh, what happens is good people go to the state capitol and they get isolated and they're surrounded by people with money is surrounded by institutions and the establishment, and they're, they're driven by fear. Uh, it's gonna you know, be bad or whatever. And, and we need to find people with courage, people who have an uh, inner compass, 
uh, and people who will do the right thing in face of that fear because it's the right thing to do. And I'm going to call out Senator Ocasio right now for it. Uh, you know, we're lucky to have her there and we need to keep her there. Uh, and there's others uh, I mentioned uh, earlier. And so we need, to, we need to support our friends. And that means giving them money. That means showing up and knocking door to door. That means writing letters and, and carrying signs for them. Uh, and so I'll tell you how it works in the state house. I, my focus is on the house because that's where somebody else mentioned it. That's where a lot of our big problems are. Uh, that's where you have a leadership in the house. And it's no secret, Gary Hooser likes to speak his mind, okay? I've been doing this for 20 years. I know, my, I know what I'm talking about. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm free to be able to say it. Uh, the leadership in the state house makes unilateral decisions, regardless of what the rest of the 75 legislators uh, want, because they can, because they have the power to do it, because they're not challenged. Uh, they, they will unilaterally block bills to expand uh, legalization of cannabis. They unilaterally block bills to raise our minimum wage from $10.10 to 12 measly dollars. And they won't even have a hearing on it. And the community needs to call them out on that. The community needs to, needs to call them on this stuff, but we need to elect more people because we have good people in, in both the House and the Senate, but we don't have enough of them. And one or two or a handful of new bodies can change the conversation. Uh, change the conversation. So those that uh, support our views, our worldview, as I like to say, uh, have more courage to do so because now all of a sudden they have another senator who's willing to stand up and say, speak truth to power, or another couple of House members willing to do the same thing. 2022, in many ways, nationally and locally, uh, is, is a huge year. In, in Hawaii, every single seat uh, in the state legislature, every Senate seat, every House seat, the governor, lieutenant governor, and most of the council seats, I think, are going to be up. And there's going to be a lot of turnover. But, but we, we, I'll say collectively, need to identify and support good candidates. Because uh, what happens is a lot of good candidates don't run because they don't know they're good candidates. They, they, they're intimidated. They think, I can never do that. Uh, I can never, you know, be a senator. And then you find out when you, when you look into it that they're just regular people. Uh, I spoke, we had a, a meeting uh, a couple of days ago of our Kuleana Academy, which, which trains uh, candidates. And one of our featured speakers was uh, a Republican Senator, uh, Favela. And he talked about, I think he ran five times and lost. His background, his job was a custodian for an elementary school. And he worked really hard. He knocked on doors. He worked in his community. He got elected to the Hawaii State Senate and is serving there. And he's good on a lot of issues uh, that are important to me. So we're, we encourage people, if anyone on this panel knows of anyone in their community who thinks uh, they would make a good candidate, and, and I'll describe that briefly if I could, is someone who has roots in the community, someone who, who has an 808 phone number and they just didn't get off the plane, someone who knows their community, someone that can relate to the different demographics uh, Hawaii is made up of a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of different demographics, and you have people have to be able to relate to those folks. You can't win with just cannabis people. You can't win just with any one ethnicity or any one uh, issue, if you would. So roots in the community, ability to uh, relate to people in the district, and who's willing to work really hard. In, a, in the state house, I'll tell you a little secret. You can get elected to the state house in Hawaii in some districts for less than 1,200 votes. 1,200 votes. Uh, there's a guy, Sonny Ganadin, Representative Ganadin in Kalihi. Uh, it, it was a small district. All the districts are the same size, but some, the voter turnout is so small. So you can see, you can knock on 1,200 doors, easy. Uh, and it does, it's not that much money. Uh, but if anyone knows anyone who's willing to do the work, who shares our worldview, who's got a strong inner compass, roots in the community, and wants to run for public office, tell them to call me. GaryHooser.com, easy. GaryHooser.com, my phone number, my email is all on there, my background if you want to know more about me. Uh, and that's my mission right now, uh, really, is to identify uh, and support good 
candidates who uh, want to make change happen and and feel the same urgency. You got me on my on my pulpit here for, uh, for a second. Uh, they feel the same urgency. You know, our our planet is burning. We got people living under bridges and in weeds because they can't find a job that pays a living wage. You know, we get people getting shot by the police. We've got, a, you know, cannabis laws that are way, way old. Uh, we got housing nobody can afford. Uh, we, we, the, the earth, the planet, our community needs help and we need it now. And so you, you, anybody there that feels the same way I do about this and wants to help, you call me up, please. Or if you know somebody feels the same way, uh, I'd like to talk to you or to them. So with that, I'll, I'll say aloha. I know I've talked too long. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm going to sign off. I'm going to sign off. I'm, I'm actually visiting with my, with my granddaughter and my daughter. And uh, so I'm going to go visit with them again. But aloha. Okay, we'll connect later. Thank you so much. Okay. Aloha. Up next, we've got the founder of Medical Cannabis Day. This time, uh, Dr. Otto is coming on to provide us with more information about what he hears that are patient priorities. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll echo some of the questions uh, that we've been receiving in the chat. Dr. Otto, thank you again for, for your time and for still being here in the event and uh, being able to present. We really appreciate you and I'll jump off the screen. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. And uh, <clears throat> thanks again, everybody for for all your help in making this happen. And I'm glad that so many people have been able to watch today. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in because I'm gonna try and stay on track and keep, and keep us, uh, give us a chance of still catching up. So I'm going to, uh, okay. So as Brent mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about um, some of the patient priorities that um, have been brought to me. And, and I've tried to organize these into three main categories just to try and help us all kind of wrap our heads around where we might be able to put some of our, our effort into, into this. And, um, and I really appreciated Gary's uh, talk, especially what he had to say about creating a unified message. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and get back to that a little bit later. So just uh, some disclosures, I'm a certifying physician for Hawaii's program. I'm not associated with any dispensaries, no other financial interests. A little bit about my background. I am gonna put this up on my website. So uh, if I go through this kind of quickly, don't worry. Um, got into this because of a friend who had colorectal cancer, which uh, motivated me to learn about the science. And then I started learning about Hawaii's Medical Use of Cannabis Act. That's when I became a real advocate for the program. Uh, and, and this is uh, right out of the archives. There is a uh, Governor Cayetano's signature, June 14th, 2000. That's why this is such an important day for our patients and for our state. And it's all based upon state authorized use. This is uh, an authority, a constitutional authority reserved to the states that allowed our state and all the others to decide how cannabis is used. Then the state, our state decided uh, that medical use was appropriate 21 years ago uh, on this day. And uh, you can look it up right there, chapter 329. This is part of what's called our Uniform Controlled Substances Act uh, that actually is not very uniform. Hawaii changed it when they adopted it from the commission. But you can see it actually says medical use of cannabis. It doesn't say medicinal use, does not say botanical use. This is medical use, and that's what we're trying to focus on today. So the number one priority, I, I, it seems so simple, but I just have to, to say it, patients are the number one priority. And if we make patients the number one priority, everything else is simple. It will just follow. We don't have to worry about whether there are gonna be enough customers or there's gonna be enough money. Uh, there is huge medical potential in this state. Unfortunately, the program is a pseudo medical program because probably half of the agencies that I've talked to in the state don't even believe in the medical use of cannabis. They, don't, they think it should go away. And so in addition, there's this uh, misconception that our program is violating federal law. And so that is uh, putting our patients at risk. It's promoting all kinds of illegal activity across the state on many levels. And so uh, that brings us to what, what I think is the first number of priority. That's end the discrimination that our patients are facing every day. I get calls from patients almost weekly telling me their, their horror stories, uh, you know, firearms permits, employment, uh, life insurance, medical insurance, TDI, uh, federally getting evicted from federally subsidized housing. 
it is just horrendous what our patients are being exposed, exposed to every day. Um, luckily, uh, we had a major breakthrough in this session, and you've heard a lot about what's possible and how to approach the legislature. Um, we had some, uh, some federal exemption resolutions that made it all the way through both chambers. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm giving uh, notice of uh, note to the representative Nakashima and Senator Keoho Kalole, who were instrumental in making this happen along with the other chairs along the way. But, but this is significant. Um, this is the first time that our legislature has expressed its will on the federal conflict. And even though it is a resolution, uh, it is not binding upon the Department of Health, it tells the Department of Health and the executive branch, the legislature uh, feels that this conflict is unacceptable and they want it to be addressed. And so this is now sitting on uh, Director Char, Char's death, uh, Director of the Department of Health. It is a request and so now we're waiting to see how that's going to move forward and there are a number of ways to, to help uh, move that. Um, also, there are four federal exemption bills that were introduced last session. Um, and as uh, Senator uh, San Buenaventura referred to, sometimes there's not a lot of will to move a bill forward if it's felt that the governor will veto. And, and that was part of the reason these bills didn't move. But also, uh, it was felt that they didn't want to tell the Department of Health what to do. Let's, let's ask them first, see if they comply. We've got four bills that are still alive because we're in a biennium right now. And these could all be uh, revived, assigned to committees, and, and be moved forward. Number two, um, number two priority, as I see it, is safe, affordable medicine. And, and what does that look like? Well, I think, first of all, we need to look at the regulatory scheme of the current dispensary program, since that's what a fair number of our patients are depending upon. Currently, uh, it falls underneath the uh, director of CHAR in the Health Resources Administration. And then the Office of Medical Cannabis Control and Regulation fall under that, uh, that branch. Um, the problem with that is, is, last time I heard it spoke in public, they only have three staff in one CCR. Um, and supposedly funding is limited. And um, we don't really have any cannabinoid specialists on board. That's a huge problem. We need somebody in there with knowledge of this subject uh, who knows how to regulate this. So what we also have is there's another branch, the Environmental Health Administration, which has the food safety branch within it. Uh, and that, in my opinion, it might be a better place for the program. It's certainly something that could happen. It could be moved over to that branch and, and perhaps we could install a cannabinoid specialist there. Right now we have a bit of a closed loop involving the Office of Medical Cannabis Control Regulation and the Dispensary Trade Organization because dispensary rules are interim, meaning Chapter 91 has been suspended. There's no way for the public to uh, petition the Department of Health to adopt rules or regulations that affect what's happening with the dispensaries, what new procedures are being adopted. Uh, and that's keeping our patients providers outside of the loop. And that needs to change. Interim rules are not set to, uh, I mean, final rules, final dispensary rules are not meant to be adopted until four more years, 2025, unless the Department of Health wants to adopt them sooner, but I don't see that happening. This is something we need to push for. We need patients, providers need to be involved in how these dispensaries are changing. Um, so the other issue is funding. Uh, there is the Medical Cannabis Registry and Regulation Special Fund. Right now, 3850 times 30,000 patients is over $1.1 million annually. Well, if there's only three staff, I mean, we can't pay those staff. Are we are we paying for other regulatory provisions uh, excessively? I, I, I think we have a right to, to see that and see how those funds are being used. And also, if we're really going to treat this as a medical program, we need the medical board on, uh, on board. Um, we need formal guidelines for certifying providers. How are they conducted? What are the requirements? We have some general things within the statute, you know, doctor-patient relationship and discuss the risks and benefits. But that's not enough. We need formal guidelines that could be acted upon if they're being violated and certification requirements, certain basic uh, levels of competency that, that providers must pass if they want to be able to certify patients within the state. And research also falls under uh, safe access because there's a lot of research we could be doing to make sure that the products are being made safely, uh, that they're appropriate for certain medical conditions and patient cultivation instead of trying to destroy this option, I think it's something that needs to be 
protected but properly regulated, and it may hold the key to doing away with this broken vertical model and getting us more towards a horizontal model that the dispensaries recognize is not working for them right now. Um, and number three, I broke this out, uh, inter-island transportation. We are a very unique being an island state. Um, and uh, you, know, you can't expect patients to go to a dispensary on another island and find medicine that works for them. Some patients will spend months coming up with a formulation and a ratio and a, and a strength that works for them. And they need to be able to carry that with them when they go to, to visit families. Um, we have, uh, as has been mentioned, this federal aviation uh, regulation has been on the books for, dec uh, for decades. And uh, it's pretty clear there. I think most of us could read that and understand that, okay, if there's a state law that, a, uh, that allows cannabis to be carried aboard aircraft, then it should be exempt, right? And we have our existing law that very clearly allows for the inter-island transportation of samples for dispensaries, uh, something that is critical for outer island dispensaries. So it seems to me that all the pieces are in place. I think the problems are more uh, a willingness on the part of our state agencies to address this issue. So it's really about healthcare. What is that going to look like for our patients? Uh, inevitably, THC will be involved. I think we need to get over that and, and realize that we need to do what's best for our patients. You know, I quickly, just, just to kind of get a feeling for how many patients should we really be serving? I, I looked up this, uh, this re review or these latest statistics actually from the CDC. They're saying 20.4% 20, 20 adults had chronic pain in the US 2019. Another 7.4 were what they're calling uh, a high impact, meaning it's, it's uh, significantly affected their, their ability to work and, and, and different activities over the past three months. So that's 20, about 28%. So if we extrapolate that to Hawaii, let, let's be conservative, okay? Let's just say 20%. Well, 20% times 1.4 million, there's, there's the current number, 2021. That's 280,000 people. And I, I looked up uh, last night the current stats for registered pain, severe pain patients. Uh, coincidentally enough, it's 28,000. So one-tenth of the patients who could probably qualify and, and potentially benefit are currently registered. And that's not looking at other conditions, PTSD, HIV, cancer. So there is a huge population that is not being served, that is relying on treatments that are potentially toxic. Um, and um, all because uh, I believe in large part because they don't wanna be uh, doing something that they think violates federal law. This is keeping a large percentage of potential patients away from a potentially helpful uh, medicine. So I've been at this for 10 years. At some point, the baton is going to need to be passed. And uh, I think more than ever now, uh, patients need to organize. There needs to be a unified voice. I'm seeing a lot of confusion still about the difference between doing something like getting an exemption versus rescheduling. They're not the same thing. Uh, and I would say an exemption is, is, is not something that's, that's been tried before. Iowa is the farthest along uh, but it's in some ways the simplest because it doesn't require any change to state or federal law. Uh, I'm a proponent for medical use. As our keynote speaker noted uh, at the beginning of the day, cannabis is medicine. I think there's far more potential, even from a uh, economic side, if we develop this as a medicine uh, within the state, uh, protect it, develop it, allow the research. We could make FDA quality products within the state, have, have a flourishing medical cannabis tourism industry that was well-regulated and safe for patients. So that's all I have for, for now. Hopefully that kept us on schedule. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today and for, for everything that I hope this event's going to do. So aloha, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Otto. Really, really appreciate your time. And, and thank you for uh, catching us back up with our time. I really appreciate that. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll jump into our, our next presenter. Uh, happy Medical Cannabis Day, Cliff. Thank you so much. Up next, uh, we've got Mary Bailey uh, from The Last Prisoner Project. And Mary is going to give us some insights into um, uh, The Last Prisoner Project. So Mary, if you're ready to go, aloha. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm here to talk about 
uh, a criminal justice reform nonprofit um, that I work with called Last Prisoner Project. We are absolutely dedicated to helping to release cannabis prisoners uh, around the country um, and beyond. We um, are absolutely, you know, a criminal justice reform nonprofit. Um, when it comes to clemency, we both work towards uh, releases at the state level and as well as the federal level. Um, even though cannabis has been now deemed an essential business during a global crisis, unfortunately, there's still over 40,000 people incarcerated in America today. So um, we have created several different programs to help people. Um, we, of course, are in clemency initiative, actual release. Um, we have a very robust compassionate release program where we actually match pro bono attorneys with inmates to help them file for their compassionate release. We also do uh, different release campaigns that highlight especially egregious cases. Um, for example, if uh, anybody is interested in learning more, of course, follow us on social media, Last Prisoner Project. Um, or you can visit our website, which is lastprisonerproject.org. And we also realize we can't just help people uh, regain their much deserved freedom. We also, uh, you know, because recidivism rates in America are so incredibly high, we also really want to support people upon their reentry. So we do have um, different reentry resources. Um, so if you know of anybody who has previous charges uh, for cannabis, they are definitely eligible for our reentry resources, which are, we definitely have um, different um, scholarships for say for Oakshire Dam University, Greenflower Media. Um, and so we do have a very simple application process on our website. And we also have um, financial assistance for people upon their reentry as well. One thing that one of our programs that's really dear to my heart is our family support fund. And we know that many people who are incarcerated, most of the people that I work with who are incarcerated for cannabis, they are parents. And so now their children are living in single parent households. So we do have a support fund set up for the children of those who are incarcerated. Um, again, they can fill out the application form, which is located on our website. And if anybody has any questions, they can always email um, inf our info account to get more information as well. So um, also wanted to go into a little bit more on um, our awareness campaigns. So we do work with a lot of different celebrity ambassadors, um, very closely with Jim Belushi, Damian Marley, Stephen Marley. Um, and one of the reasons that it's been so helpful working with all of these celebrities is it helps bring attention to the cause. Um, they're able to use their platform to share information because it is um, a misconception that when states go legal, they automatically release cannabis prisoners. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, people are getting left behind in this green rush and it's not okay. So we all have to work together to first educate the public, make sure that everybody knows that this is still an issue. Um, and so it's definitely um, something that all of you can be a part of as well. So again, I welcome you to go to our website. I'll leave it in the chat. And uh, if you wanna learn more about the programs that we have, if you have anyone in your family, your friends that have been negatively impacted, um, please feel free to visit the website to learn about more about our programs um, and how we can definitely help. One thing that we tell people that is so incredibly impactful um, that people don't realize is sending letters to people who are currently incarcerated. Um, all of the prisoners that I work with that have been released tell me time and time again that receiving those letters while they were in prison um, really helped them keep going, help them keep the faith, and, you know, we want to make sure they know that they have not been forgotten, that they are, you know, people are on the outside fighting for their freedom. And, you know, it's just so important that they receive those reminders. So we do have um, a prison letter writing guide on our website. If you go to the take action page on the Last Prisoner Project website, um, there are petitions you can sign. There are graphics that you can share on your social media as a way of educating your network. And then it's also um, 
our prison letter writing guide is located on the bottom. So definitely suggest visiting that. Um, and if anybody has any questions, of course, you can always reach out to me directly. And my email address is mary at lastprisonerproject.org. Thank you. That was awesome. Uh, I, I did have one question um, for people that are currently, um, uh, if they have a, a drug record, right? Or do you guys work with anyone on expungement? You know, we absolutely, of course, expungement is so incredibly important. Um, there are other groups out there that focus more on expungement. Um, and I did host an expungement clinic here in Hawaii um, of several years ago, but we as an org try to stay in our lane and focus on actual release um, and not so much expungement. But if you go to National Expungement Week, um, which is an org, uh, there's much more information there for people to learn more. Fantastic. That's super helpful. And, you know, I just want to say mahalo for, for taking time out of your schedule. I, I know that um, we were lucky enough to get a break in your schedule and I appreciate you hanging out with us. We, we've run past your time. Thank you so much, Mary. And, and thank you, Last Prisoner Project. Yes, no, my honor. And thank you, everyone, all of the organizers behind Medical Cannabis Day, you guys have done such an incredible job. I've learned so much in the couple hours that I've been tuned in, um, even being in the cannabis industry here in Hawaii. So again, thank you for all of the work that you guys are doing here at home. Well, thank you. And, and thank you also for submitting that proclamation to the mayor's office on Maui. That was incredibly helpful. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. Uh, we're going to switch gears. Um, we're going to Keep this rolling. Uh, May Fui Maono Po is up next, and May is a, an absolutely amazing guest. I'm so so blessed that you are here, May. Thank you for waiting for us. Take it away. <laughs> so I I really want to thank Brent and Dale um, for for organizing this, and really Cliff, Dr. Otto for creating this and making it happen. If it wasn't for your persistence in our state, um, we we really appreciate you. I especially appreciate you. Um, so I am going to be talking, um, basically, uh, this is her story. It's a, a divine feminine history of cannabis. Um, so I'm going to be really talking about kind of um, the, the role that medical cannabis has had for, uh, for women. So let's see here. There we go. So um, this is what I'm going to be just kind of talking about. Um, the different uh, ways that cannabis has been used pre predominantly uh, for dysmenorrhea, painful periods, infertility, pregnancy, menopause, and um, kind of the future. So when we look at uh, cannabis, um, it has been used for, for really for millennia and especially for women. Um, so some of the earliest writings out of Egypt, it was referred to as Azalu. And um, I love this, uh, this preparation. So it was cannabis with mint, saffron, and beer. And this was for a uh, difficult childbirth, also for um, the stain of menses. So if you are having like a prolonged, uh, you know, menstrual cycle, it was administered almost every single way that you can think of orally, uh, vaginally, rectally, also through fumigation. And I thought that it was really interesting that they had a lot of um, different topicals for, uh, for eyes. And that was part of uh, the Egyptian pharmacopoeia where cannabis has um, actually never been taken out of, uh, unlike uh, here in the United States and in other places. Um, so Persia re was called Banga. Um, some of the more interesting preparations were uh, internasal, uh, and you know where the sea juice was mixed with a variety of herbs to to treat migraines um, and also 
for, again, we see it for, for dysmenorrhea, for painful periods and to um, prevent miscarriage. Also used for, um, for gonorrhea, for anal fissures. So that's, um, you know, if you've had any tears after uh, childbirth and um, poultices were uh, used also for, uh, for hemorrhoids. Um, China referred to as ma, this is the symbol for it. And this is actually two um, cannabis plants hung upside down to dry. Um, so the female plants were, were, again, this is when we started to see a little bit more of the differentiation between male and female. And, um, you know, where they're starting to, to note that the females have a stronger concentrations of uh, cannabinoids. Um, and it was used, again, for uh, menstrual cramps um, and also for postpartum uh, difficulties. And um, the, the cannabis juice and the root was used for re retained um, placenta and postpartum hemorrhage. So, you know, if you, you know anything about historically speaking, uh, childbirth was one of the number one, uh, you know, reasons for death in women and uh, retained placenta and, and hemorrhage were, were really large factors in that. Um, and so this was something that was, that was used to help um, moving on to Europe, it was referred to as a uh, HeyNep, and um, this is a really interesting uh, topic because this is when we're seeing them uh, kind of talk about uh, breast cancer. Um, so they're saying rub the herb with fat, lay it to the breast and it will disperse the swelling, and if there is a gathering of diseased matter, it will purge it. Um, and then hemp seed was also used to increase breast milk production and to help with um, amenorrhea, which is when you're not having your period. And O'Shaughnessy, uh, you know, who was uh, really one of the first European physicians to, to write extensively about cannabis, um, use the resin of hemp uh, for, for uterine hemorrhage. So again, we're seeing it for, for hemorrhage and um, and also with childbirth. Uh, so the United States. So this is one of my favorite um, formulations that I have seen when it comes to for, for menstrual cramps. Because if you look at it, um, this is dysmenine. It has uh, not only does it have cannabis, um, but it also has capsation in it. And so, you know, for all of us who, who study cannabis and cannabinoids and cannabinoid receptors, we know that um, that's directly related with the uh, TRIP-V receptors. So, so having that included is, is really super interesting. Um, so again, uh, we're seeing it used for painful periods, but also for hyperemesis gra gravida. So that's when you have excessive vomiting during um, during pregnancy. So this is where, you know, we're seeing it used actually during pregnancy um, and where there's indications for it. Um, and again, during labor. And this is uh, one of my all-time favorite um, quotes about about cannabis. Um, cannabis indica does not paralyze the nerves, but strengthens them directly. It does not constipate by paralysis. It cures by its beneficent virtues. And um, you know, I think we we see a lot of that uh, today. Just in in medicine, cannabis has so uh, few side effects and and such a good safety profile. Um, and then this is just some of the, the historical uh, uses of cannabis for women. Um, so again, we see it really, really heavily used um, during uh, menstruation uh, for, for dysmenorrhea and for uterine uh, fibroids. Um, 
and also nausea and pregnancy and used a lot in labor um, as well as in the postpartum period. Um, nipple cracks, fissures, mastitis, um, and then for uh, menopause, uh, cystitis, and um, urinary retention and incontinence. And, you know, this is a lot of also what I um, see in my clinic uh, with my patients who are using it for, for painful periods. So I think it's really cool that um, it's something that we've, we've really never stopped doing. Um, so when we kind of look at where we're at today, um, when we look at painful periods, this is something that affects almost all women at some point of their life, 84% of women. So everybody who is in this meeting today, you know somebody, you might actually have painful periods, but you know, or you definitely um, have crossed paths with somebody who has painful periods. 43% of those women have painful periods every month. So about half of the women um, are having painful periods and one in 10 women um, have been clinically diagnosed with endometriosis. Uh, cannabinoids have been shown to decrease pain and also decrease the spread of endometrial lesions in the pelvic pelvic region. So this was an animal study and I think it's, it's really important because there's not a lot of uh, really effective treatments out there for endometriosis. So, so really exploring that a little bit more would be great. Cannabis and um, infertility. So women who have unprotected sex, who don't become pregnant, who want to become pregnant within a year, uh, typically have some, some form of uh, infertility. 12% of all uh, women in the United States have difficulty getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to term. And women who are trying to conceive should um, seek treatment. Uh, and if they are under 35 at one year, if they are over 35 at six months. Um, THC can in inhibit the implantation of the embryo in the uterus. So I think that using cannabis, if you are trying to conceive and you um, are having difficulty with con conception, it's something that you um, might consider um, either cessation or, or using it differently, like topically things like that, something to discuss with your provider. Um, cannabis and pregnancy. So as you know, it's very controversial. I uh, get asked about this um, on definitely a weekly basis. Somebody is asking, hitting up my DMs on social media. Um, so it's, it, it is very controversial. I have always said the most dangerous part of using cannabis in pregnancy is um, the involvement of CPS. Um, it's definitely the most dangerous part. Um, but, you know, there are things to consider. So when we look at the research and there's no other co-founding um, co -founding factors like alcohol or tobacco use, uh, what we see is that um, it can decrease the, the birth weight by about 79 grams. So, so not too much, a, a little bit of a decrease in, in birth weight and it may contribute to ADHD. Um, cannabis can also aid in uh, hyperemesis gravidum and that's where I've seen it be most effective uh, with women who are, uh, who are pregnant. Um, cannabis and breast, breastfeeding, so again, kind of limited, um, smaller smaller studies um but what they've shown is that there's no difference in growth mental or motor development um the half-life of thc and breast milk is about 27 hours um and estimated intake uh for infants is about 2.5 percent of what um the mother is ingesting so really the take-home 
message is that dose matters when you are using THC in breastfeeding because the larger amounts of THC that you use, then the larger amounts are going to be um, passed on to your infant. And so, so typically, um, you know, we do recommend uh, decreasing the amount of THC that's used and just using it in, uh, in moderation and just kind of as needed. Um, cannabis for menopause. Uh, so CBD, CBG, um, and THCV can, can strengthen bones, kind of decreasing the risk of osteoporosis. This is some really compelling research um, that I, I think has a lot of really, really um, good potential. And, you know, as we know, cannabis can uh, increase serotonin levels, which can help to, to decrease uh, hot flashes. And some cannabis products can be used for lubrication. And that can just help if, you're, if you have painful intercourse. Um, so the future is female. So when I was doing a recent PubMed search, um, there are basically zero articles on cannabis and dysmenorrhea, even though we know that um, there is a, a ton of, of reasons why they should be doing this type of research, um, even less, uh, you know, only three articles when it comes to cannabis and, and menopause, 34 articles on cannabis and breast cancer, and 644 articles on cannabis and pregnancy. And a majority of them, um, you know, were, were focused on, um, you know, some of the perceived uh, negative impacts that weren't necessarily true, but were, were based more on um, stigma. So what would I like to see moving forward? Really product, really good solid product development for dysmenorrhea, um, Foria in California, I know they were doing a study um, and how can you know we be a part of supporting uh, women in cannabis? You know, there's a lot of cute shirts going around that say buy weed from women, but just really supporting women in this in this industry is super important. Um, and that's it. That was awesome. Thank you so much, May. Um, we, we, we we're over our time. Um, no I like you did great. Thanks for helping to catch us up. And I just want to say thank you to the other presenters who are standing by. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, look to our next presenter, James Trice. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and then um, jump into your presentation? And uh, we've got two more presenters after you. Thank you, sir. I am also, also a veteran, uh, hall to Army uh, birthday today, 246 years. I um, did about nine years in, uh, six and a half of those years as combat medic. Then I also did years over at Womack Army Medical Center where I worked in the emergency room. Um, when I was stationed at Schofield Barracks, I taught combat life service class and emergency medical evacuations. So um, trauma medicine and dealing with trauma has pretty much been my life. <laughs> Outside of working with trauma and patients with trauma, once I got out of the military, um, dealing with my own PTSD, looking around for help, there really weren't too many places that were available um were what that we're giving out knowledge to patients um which is ultimately how i bumped into theo um once we went together we started looking for answers together um after coming up short we decided to create our own organization to create our own answers for ourselves rather than looking at other places so that's kind of how we got to here um I do want to say thank you again to you, Brent, for the for introduce uh, for bringing us in, and Dr. Otto for reaching out, uh, linking us all together uh, behind one you know central flag under medical cannabis. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everybody that has taken time out to tune into this event, and I hope that you have your families and your caretakers within listening distance because this information is not just for three two nine card holders, but their support systems as well. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, not only is today Flag Day, but it also marks the 246th birthday of the United States Army. So big hug to all the Army veterans. Uh, as you may have seen, have seen earlier in a presentation by our brother Theo, we lost a very important piece of our camo puzzle recently with the passing of our near and dear friend, Marsha Rose Joyner. And as you probably still see from me earlier in the video, we're still healing from that. Um, but through the pain of losing others, we tend to find a lot more strengths within ourselves. And we are using that strength to continue to push forward and tackle a lot more of these bigger issues plaguing our community, not only veterans, but members in our local community. We'll continue to produce Cannabis Chronicles with ThinkTech, and we have a nice list of guests already lined up. We'll continue to go to the Capitol and Honolulu Hale, visiting the legislatures in person to get answers directly like we do. We will also continue advocating for civil rights, human rights, and plenty of issues such as breast cancer and patient education, just as our dear friend intended. However, we do not have all your phone numbers, so we will not be sending out group texts each morning with lovely nature photography and greetings. So, um, she is missed beyond explanation and verbal expression, so um, we'll continue to let our efforts speak for us. And thank you again to Mrs. Joyner, Mrs. Marsha Rose Joyner, Mr. Candace Joyner, and their loved ones for sharing her with us and for sharing her with Camel. Moving forward, not only do we have patients' rights and community advocacy, but we've also been developing a couple more events and services for you in the near future. Through the, I'm sorry, though the 329 Veteran Stand Down and Medical Cannabis Research are two of our most recognizable activities, a big part of what we do is helping patients remain compliant through mentorships, uh, follow-up assessments, and our patient referral services. Um, you may have heard about CAMO providing financial assistance towards the cost of doctor's fees for elderly patients on fixed income, or maybe CAMO um, teaching vape education out the dispensaries or giving classes on proper uh, how to clone or making soil for patients and beginning caretakers. Uh, all these services primarily out of pocket. So we are currently fundraising and we do accept donation. If you go to our website at 808camo.org, you will find a donation button there um, to help support these services that so many people have been benefiting from. Also, next to this, someone stressed the need and importance of patient caretakers to speak up and out in the hardships of their loved ones that they're facing while navigating their 3 to 9 experiences. Whether it's the price of the medication, the lack of proactive care related to patient follow-up, or even the fighters, whether it's about how they and your family members are treated when you visit places such as a VA or a care center. For instance, on 31 May, I saw an elderly lady get out of a handy van. I'm sorry, I saw the handy van drop an elderly lady off at the dispensary. I won't tell you which one but he dropped her off at the street on a sidewalk um, on Cam Highway. The lady had a foot injury and she had to argue with him about why he would not pull into the parking lot, I'm sorry, pull the handy van into the parking lot of the dispensary. And after about five to 10 minutes of watching this old lady, I went to get out my car, but she had already started walking with her foot injury to get into the dispensary. That's not right. Not only safe access to medication, but patients and caregivers deserve opportunities to be thoroughly educated on the effects of cannabis concentrates versus the effects of smoking or consuming edibles when transitioning from new medications or between different methods of intake. We need to keep asking the tough questions and not be afraid to speak out loud about cannabis due to an instilled sense of fear due to cannabis prohibition and the war on drugs. Also, this month marks the 50th anniversary of the war on drugs. So how historic would it be to get the medical cannabis exemption or even get it rescheduled as a schedule two or completely removed altogether? And from dispensary rules need more attention. Patient follow-up needs more attention. The DOH needs to hire more current industry advocates to advisory positions, similar to how CAMO has had our agreements with local dispensaries and apothecaries. If you need help advocating 
or submitting testimony at capital.gov or you need ideas where to start, please feel free to contact us. I'm available on Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> however you need to get a hold of me, Carrier Pigeon, please do that. Um, but do not stop advocating for your loved ones. Do not stop when searching your due diligence for your family. If you need help, it's here to help. So please reach. Mahalo for having us. And aloha, everybody. Mahalo nui, James. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here the whole time and helping to organize the event today. Um, Not ever a problem. That's exactly what we're here for. Patients first. Right on. Really appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, uh, another one of our favorite uh, medical professionals serving patients who require cannabis medicine. Wendy, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for being here throughout the whole day. Uh, look forward to, to hearing your presentation. Thank you again. Wendy Gibson. Aloha, everybody. Thank you for everybody who joined in to be with us on this historic Medical Cannabis Day. And I don't really have a presentation as much as I just want to say thank you to everybody who has been participating. Um, I've, for the past seven years, I've been working with the Drug Policy Forum and the Medical Cannabis Coalition of Hawaii, and we've been working on changing drug laws and educating legislators in Hawaii since 1993. Well, they have. And they helped bring the medical cannabis program to Hawaii in 2000. And I've been working on making fixes to the program ever since. And by working with them, I came to realize that the only real way of making any good changes in Hawaii is through the legislative process. So I'd like to say a special thank you, mahalo nui, to all of the medical cannabis patients and advocates who have spoken up about patients' needs over the years. You helped make the program better. You helped thousands of patients by passing the dispensary bill and by bringing lab testing and the dispensaries to four islands. And this year, hundreds of patients, or I don't know, patients, but advocates, raise your voices about House Bill 477 and help hundreds of patients who are growing in collectives by allowing them to continue growing their medicines, at least until 2023. And I saw the patients or advocates raise their voices during COVID, asking Governor Ige to please help protect patients by allowing the dispensaries to deliver medicines and to allow telemedicine to, for the providers to certify patients. And unfortunately, the governor didn't allow it, but it was, it was just really nice seeing this raising up of the voices and just know that the people who are raising up their voices, you're providing the voices for patients who are not able to do that for whatever reason. And I just wanna say thank you for being resilient and persistent. Your voices are really important. And going forward, I'm really hopeful and, and <laughs> grateful to Dr. Otto and hopeful that his success is in getting the governor and the mayors to recognize the state's accepted medical use of cannabis um, is going to make some big differences. I'm hopeful um, about the passing of the resolution HCR 132. I think it could help lead to some real meaningful changes in the way that we practice medicine, maybe make it easier to do research and to address some of the patient issues that we've had a hard time making headway on for the past 21 years. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and I will do my best to try to keep you informed about what's going on with patient issues and the bills during the legislative session through the Medical Cannabis Coalition's Facebook page. So happy Medical Cannabis Day, Hawaii, everybody. That's all I have. Yay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Wendy. Really, really great message. Gratitude and hope. Thank you. I'm hopeful, too. We've got another presenter, our next guest. Jason, are you, I'm, I'm looking for you in the lineup. What's going on up there on Oahu? Yeah, you know, um, this, this is the last, the last show here. So I'm gonna give it to you guys hard and give you my feelings and uh, give you the pros and cons of what's been going on in my life and patience. And um, 
let me just see if I can. So this is a beautiful new greenhouse in the background, uh, patient based all day. I mean, just a beautiful thing of seeing people come through our yard, taking care of people. Um, it's interesting because I sat around all day and heard things like THC content and medicinal and medical. And, you know, I've, I've been around this for a little while and been following it for a long time. And I'd like to just say first and foremost that all the mentors and martyrs that are involved in this program right now basically built drug test programs and gave the state a model that was horizontal to move on with. And this is way back in the day. We had it all set in place. And then we ended up with something that was vertical. So that'll show you where there's a lot of energy that needs to be put into something. Okay, so let me see if I can just get my little share content here and see what goes here right. Okay, here we go, peeps of the world. Uh, my name is Jason Hanley. I run a Hawaiian-based Hawaiian -based, patient-based cannabis farm in, on Oahu. It's a compassionate and enforcement medicine model. I'm stoked to be here. I'm happy to be here on Medical Cannabis Day. We've been fighting the fight. Uh, it's been super easy because the patients are running it and they need help and they need affordable meds. So I know it's the end of the day, so I'm going to boogie through this. And then if anybody has any questions, we go from there. Okay. Uh, what is a patient-based cannabis farm? Um, it's a farm formed to allow Hawaii 329 card holders patients a place to grow their cannabis plants legally. A 329 card holder may join a patient-based farm by changing or adding their new growth site using the DOH growth change packet. The card holder is not limited to just growing up their own residence. Why? Why do 329 card holders join a patient-based farm? The biggest one in the world. It's unaffordable to purchase medicine from dispensaries. Always has, always been. And I'll hit that a little bit longer at the end of my PowerPoint and tell you why. Uh, they want to learn to grow their own medicine. They don't have a place to grow. They have a condo, a small yard, et cetera. The neighbors are complaining of smell, possible security issues at their home residence. We know all this alive and well. They need assistance in growing due to health problems. A lot of people who are on medical cannabis are sick, wheelchairs, health problems, all kinds of stuff. And the most important part what we're seeing right now with these, these patient-based farms is they enjoy the farm environment and growing with other card holders. Just so much euphoria going on at our farm. It's just ridiculous. There isn't a bit of what you would feel like criminal or anything like that. It's just very, very beautiful. Okay. What are the benefits of joining a patient-based farm? Well, I mean, really important is, you know, if you're going to grow a bunch of plants, you got to share those costs together and they're related. It, the farm is a very efficient model and saves the patient money by sharing resources. Sweet and needed to grow with other patients. The farm site is secure and provides a safe environment for the patients to grow free from the stigmatism related to cannabis, a caring environment. The farm model provides education and compassion to patients by helping each patient to understand the different uses of cannabis and providing each patient with a cannabis profile that helps them with their ailments. Patients join these sites through a lease mechanism, gaining them control of the site. The lease spells it out all the way by laws. Keep your plants tagged and in compliance. Keep your 329 card in compliance. Medicine grown on the farm will not be distributed legally outside of the farm. And the lease fees established. These are super, super simple laws, super professional. And uh, it just makes it all work. Why the need for patient-based farms? The reality of cannabis use of medicine is caused, has caught most states and politicians off guard. People cannot afford cannabis at the dispensaries and they need the medicine for health and life. Our data has shown that a medical cannabis person uses between two to four ounces a month in a combination of flour, tinctures, and edibles. This would cost them approximately $800 to $1,600 a month per person and is not covered through health insurance. If all 3,000, 329, if all 30,000, 329 cardholders went to dispensaries, the dispensaries would run out of product in a week. The dispensary system is not geared towards medical patients' needs and cannot offer specialized programs. Can you guys still hear me? We good? Yes. Want to make sure. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> it's weird talking off a of PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, why the need for patient based farms? Patient based farms do put out a safe product out to their, their patients. And do test for pesticides and targeted molds. This is super, super easy stuff. 
we don't need dispensaries. I am all about dispensaries and sharing everything with dispensaries. But as far as testing cannabis, this is what Steep Hill does. This is what laboratories do. You don't need a dispensary to do that. You need a laboratory to do that. A laboratory tests flour. You can build all your different tinctures and your potencies through laboratories. These are really, really simple things that I think a lot of people are getting caught up on as far as safe medicine. We know how to do this without a doubt. Patient-based farms provide a growing support to their patients as most have a nine to five job and cannot simply grow cannabis all day. Growing cannabis is a full-time farming job. Our patient-based farm goes beyond growing and looks to help educate people to better understand cannabis and health. We relate to every one of our patients and our Ohana. This is our family. This is not just people coming and getting medicine from us and walking away. We have built a strong family together that when people leave our farm, they leave with education, kindness, and sharing that with the communities and saying, hey, how do we move forward on this medical program in a professional way? Here we go, guys. What are the patient-based challenges currently? Well, you saw it in the Department of Health in 2021 ledge session. They attempted to restrict the number of three to nine, card, three to nine card holders at a farm site to two cards per site. This bill, SB 89, was slid into HB 477, unbeknownst to many people, including dispensaries owners that were looking to pass HB 477, and caused a lot of sadness and chaos with patient-based farms. Very, very upsetting. Here's the numbers for you. Hawaii currently has about 30,000 three to nine card holders. 60% of those grow at their own site, 60%. 10% of those card holders, 3,000 people are on a site with more than two cards. The DOH simply stated in their testimony, this would only affect about 12% of the people. That is 3,000 people. That is a large number of people that would be affected. If such a law would have been passed, over 3,000 people would have actively grown in a farm, would have lost their growing rights and their avenue to their medicine and their health. In testimony submitted by DOH regarding decision to limit the amount of three, time, three to nine cards per site, the following was submitted. And you can kind of go through this. There's complaints about uh, uncontrolled cultivations under the guise of home cultivations, uh, coercion uh, to signing their growing rights over to collectives. Um, and the list goes on and on, medical use certification in exchange for their growing rights. And then the last one of all of them, noxious smell of cannabis plants. We're going to limit a site because the smell of a plant, and that's more important than the health of our patients. I mean, this is our farm. <laughs> There's no way you can get around uh, what they would say, coercing people. You can't do that. This is an Ohana. This is a family. This is this is legit. I mean, there's just, we don't even fall into any of these categories. And if you're talking about smell, then we're out in the middle of a agriculture place. And I don't know, maybe the other farmers care about the smell, maybe not, but we're a good two miles away from any home residence. Oh, and here we go back to dispensaries. Um, you know, I, I like to support dispensaries and I hope this all works out for them. And I hope we can all work together and make this a horizontal model. Um, I met with HCIA before HB 477 went through, a couple, two or three dispensary owners, and it seemed like they supported um, patient-based sites. Um, and then when it came down to it and given testimony, you can see what's going on right here, a dispensary owner on Kauai. We don't need to name any names, but he basically said, we do support five cards per site, but we don't believe stacking 500 cards on a site. And I'm gonna define what 500 cards is. That's 500 patients in need of medicine. And this, in his opinion, was creating a large scale production center that is outside all of regulations, is an abuse of the program and needs to be reined in, which appears to be the intent of Bill HB 477, which really wasn't the intent of HB 477. It was the intent of SB 89, which was established a long time ago when we didn't know anything about anything. Dispensaries choose to support a vertical model and have made no attempts in the last five years to include outside farms and growers in their model. None. And I know that personally as I have reached out to most of the dispensary owners to have these conversations and to try to start writing bills and get this going so we can support and educate our ledge. And it's just not there. Lastly, what are the patient-based challenges currently? Compliance checks. And boy, I can tell you what, guys, if you've ever been on a compliance check on my farm or anybody else's farm, it's downright threatening, scary, and you never get used to it, no matter who you are and how tough you are. 
I've had them come into our place, take plants under the guise of three to nine car compliance, carrying automatic rifles with up to 15 officers, helicopters flying all around us. And I'm only thankful that a lot of our patients were that, weren't that day because they might not ever come back with their PTSD and stuff. They have taken plants and flowers without providing reports for countless farms in our area. And when law enforcement is questioned on the spot on certain laws, they have stated, if you give us any problems, we can turn this into a compliance check into a federal case and take everything on your farm. We can flip our badge from state to federal and we will shut your whole business down. So how's that for just total intimidation? So how do we deal with that? Well, you get a lawyer and this is a really bad picture and I'll try and blow it up a little bit, but basically it just kind of goes through what to do if compliance checks come onto your property. First of all, it's a no-no not to even step onto on someone's property without a, a, without a search warrant. That's just a huge no-no. So this is kind of a bad screen, but it'll show you what's going on here. You know, if you if they come on your property, you're supposed to let them know, hey, do you have a search warrant? If they don't, they're supposed to leave your property. And then if they just keep moving, then you just video and film and do the best you can. You talk to your lawyer. And then a lawsuit's probably going to take place after that. And you're probably going to get everything back because they've been doing everything the wrong way. My first compliance check was in a small farm in Pahihi a long time ago. Two helicopters, 15 officers came down on us really hardcore. We were out there in the open, very, very open to the public. Very, everybody knew about us. And basically, when the gentleman stepped on my farms, he goes, this is a narcotics investigation, sir. And I said, but sir, this is a 329 cardholder, patient-based farm. He's like, I don't care what it is. And after that, I must have said aloha 50 times. We figured out our differences and he walked away understanding just a little bit more of what a, a 329 car based farm is. Still a lot of learning though. Didn't know how many cars are supposed to be on site. Didn't know that you didn't have to have the names on the cards. Didn't know you didn't have to have the registration cards there. Didn't know that a simple tag with a number and a expiration date was all that was needed. So a lot of learning going on there. All right, let's see what we got here. Touch, maybe going. All right, we're getting stuck now. Don't stick me. Interesting. Don't get stuck now. <laughs> I know. What's up? Ed? Okay, we're going. Okay, um, don't get stuck on me, baby. Okay, she's moving. Okay, so I'm just going to bump back to the sunshine analysis, and I'm going to try and keep this short. This was brought into play to build dispensaries, and you can kind of start reading language here. You know, they wanted regulation to deal with uh, safe medicine is how they looked at it. Medicine is medicine for us. It's ethnobotany. It's medicinal. It's how it should be looked at. Once you start regulating everything, you turn it into something that isn't. It's very simple to give people safe medicine through cannabis. It's very simple. Uh, this is where it started. And this is what happened. So within the sunshine analysis, state law also specific, specifies that regulation should be avoided if it artificially increases the cost of goods and service to the consumers. Well, I would say at four or $500 an ounce, we've already beat that in the first year. So this needs to be reviewed and understood that, hey, this testing happened through dispensaries doesn't need to happen. It needs to happen at a different level. And we need to move on and, and, and take a look at this sunshine analysis that was done very quickly. Obviously, there's a lot of people in this room that were involved with this that had the horizontal models in place and, uh, and it didn't work. So this is a really quick document done quick. And it, uh, it, it, it didn't help anybody out by, by doing things fast and quick and just throwing dispensaries in place. You've made it more frustrating for everybody and more difficult for anybody to even understand what's going on and then how to proceed forward to help people and, and follow laws and be safe. So what is the future for patient-based farms in the cannabis industry? Well, in my opinion, patient-based farms should be allowed into the system to flourish. The result will be thousands of small farms across Hawaii providing Growing facilities for local 329 card holders, needed sustain sustainability farming practice and agriculture jobs, which if you're going to start a new agriculture industry, you need to have everybody on the same page so we're not ruining the INA, using chemicals, using pesticides we don't need. And our farm has that. We have a protocol and a blueprint in place that can let all small farmers succeed. We love it. It's efficient. It's affordable. It allows for capitalism throughout all farms and everybody can be on the same playing field. This needed tax and revenue is for the state. It comes from that, and we can do that all day. It's honesty. It's moral corridors. Everybody gets taxed. Everybody pays taxes. That's the way it works. It doesn't matter if it's cannabis, alcohol, or clothing. We're all responsible for paying taxes and being 
setting that moral corridor, moral corridor and being honest. That's what it's all about. We can, we can take that honesty to a new level. We can have thousands of farms across Hawaii providing these documents for taxes and everything else. It's a super simple thing to do. Not only that, but by providing these thousands of small farms across Hawaii, you get rid of the black market. You bring the black market people out of that crazy world and that criminal world and bring them into farms where they enjoy to do the things they do and don't have to sit around thinking of a criminal things to do. It's just not necessary. And then, of course, it provides cannabis from, from local patient-based farms to dispensaries, allowing the dispensaries to tap into the 30 million tourists that we see every year and letting them purchase from them. They're the brick and mortars. They're the sites that already have, have won their, that won their licenses. However they got them, I wouldn't say it was fair, but they did. And they look to make money from that, but they need to support the small farms to get them the flour so they can do their thing. We can do we, our thing. We can provide local flour to our patients and our people of Hawaii safely and still get the excess flour if we have any left to the dispensaries and let them deal with the tourism and that, that quick hit that they come in, just grab something and go. We're looking to build relationships in Hawaii with people. That's what it's all about. And that's what a 329 car site does. It builds relationships. Okay. Uh, what is needed to reform the Hawaii cannabis industry? In my opinion, you know, you guys started a board, but a board is what it's going to take. And on that board, it's got to have all the cannabis stakeholders. It can't just be the DOH and the, and the dispensary owners. That's not going to work. And it's not working. And it's very frustrating for all of us because we just felt like we're being kicked out of the doors. Currently, the only people creating and influencing cannabis laws are dispensaries and their investors. And if you guys want to know the investors are behind all these dispensaries, boy, you can find that out. I know a ton of them, man. And if you don't think that the bottom line of making money isn't really where the state is, it's where these investors that have invested in these dispensaries that are out of state in places like California, Oregon, and Washington that want their money and don't care a damn about compassionate medicine and patients. And I can get, but got plenty of data for that one for you guys. Uh, the DOH is underfunded. Three working people running a whole dispensary system. Come on, guys. Uneducated on cannabis systems related to small farms and dispensaries. The information and the science that's out there now for small farms and dispensaries is massive. Just take a look at Beer Brothers on IG and follow them. It's happening all over the world. Everybody's having their hiccups just like Hawaii is. They're trying to develop boards and trying to figure it all out. But the one thing they're starting to realize is that as soon as they go recreational, if they don't have these systems in place, big business steps right in and they run it all. And that's the way it is. So we need to be building this from the bottom up, get our small farms going, get our sustainable jobs going through cannabis and attack this like we need to. So big business can't come in and take care of this. I heard things like we should let Long, Long's Drugs deliver our medicine. Guys, Long's Drugs is a big monopoly. That's not the people we want doing this stuff. So. But I also heard a lot of great things from our state representatives and our senators, lots of good stuff that I know is in their minds. And so I think just a little more education would be very helpful for people who have been involved in this for a long time and live here in Hawaii. I've been here for 16 years. I grew up here as a Hickam Air Force Base kid and I have aloha gleaming through my heart. I can only step down the moral corridor and help people and do things right. And that's who I am. Hawaii can become the best model for cannabis in the world. Start with some pilot programs. Give it a chance. Reps, congressmen, give it a chance. You have nothing to lose. And this is the most important part for everybody in Hawaii. There is a wealth of local growers here that have tons of knowledge. There is a ton of local growers here that know how to make THC percentage products. I mean, this stuff is very, very easy to do with just a little laboratory like Steep Hill. That's all it takes. And I think that's it for me. I'm going to pop back in here and hope I can find you. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. I'm back on. I think I pulled it off. That was fantastic. There you go. There you go. Really appreciate the, the information, your manaho. Um, this is what I hear from every grower that I talk to, you know. Um, unfortunately, the information, I think, um, makes it so that only the most brave among us will step out and welcome the regulation, right? There, right. there, there needs to be a pathway for regulators to be involved in our small family farms. Okay, fine. If, if that's what we have to have. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for taking those chances and just following the law, following your your moral and ethical requirements. Um, 
I, I, I did have a couple of questions for you. Um, what, one question is, um, you know, I, I know that you guys are growing a lot of plants because you have a lot of registered patients. I'm wondering if any of the dispensaries on Oahu have reached out to you to try and uh, develop uh, different strains for, for some of those symptoms that your patients are experiencing. Yeah, I mean, the problem is um, dispensaries have no connections with us at all. And to be honest with you, the DOH and the laws that are in place really constrain them to do anything with anybody outside of dispensaries. Because, you know, you see some of the bills that were trying to be passed, like, okay, if we're going to open up smart, if we're going to open up small farms, and they're going to be just like dispensaries, we're gonna have constant team wire, we're gonna have all this crazy stuff going on. So in my opinion, you know, um, my opinion is that dispensaries don't want to reach out. And I've seen that over and over again, because they're businessmen, and they don't understand that we can help their business flourish. That's the first and foremost thing. Second of all, you go back to the regulations of even trying to pull cannabis from a farm like mine to a place like that. It's just there's no laws in place. Third of all, in regards to plants and plant counts for what we have in our patients, we can pretty much grow any level we want to keep our patients happy. For example, a, pet, a patient might not need 10 plants. They might only need one plant. You know? So when you start gaining more patients on a farm, you just down it a little bit. You don't need to grow thousands of pounds of cannabis. You need to grow what you need for your patients. And it's super simple from plant size to everything else. Anybody who's been growing for a long time knows what sea of green is. It's a plant with two ounces on it or a plant with one ounce on it. So now you have, let's say you have, let's pretend we have 500 people at one site. Let's pretend. So now you have 5,000 plants. Do you think our site is growing 5,000 plants? I mean, that's not even realistic. So you dumb it down and you go, maybe we only need to grow 1,000 plants or maybe we only need to grow 500 plants, you know? And that's where we start with everything going. Now, if dispensaries want to open it up and say, hey, we'd love to have you guys as small farmers, then we can build models for farms and say, hey, well, what is realistic for a farm to grow to get plants to dispensaries? And how do we make it equity, equal for everybody to start these farms? Do we want a 20,000 square foot growing space, you know, and things like that? So I, not to go on a tangent too much, but it's very doable. We have the models in place and, you know, I think, we just need to get the ledge and the congressman to these sites and see what's going on and just let them know, hey, it's okay. You're treating this like a drug. You're treating it like a, uh, you know, a person in the closet. And that's not where it is anymore. This is a very fun and exciting time for Hawaii. And they've got to let loose a little bit and just see how it goes. Look at Oklahoma, you guys. 6,000 cannabis licenses. Their businesses are booming. The black market is no longer existent. They have seed to sale tracking for businesses. I mean, it's going crazy and they're not seeing this. Now they're still running into some little laws like metric and stuff, which we don't really feel is needed. You start tagging plants and marking plants. You're just, you're putting yourself into the same old situation where you have to go back in and, and, and check all that stuff and comply with that stuff. That's not what you need. You're building a place to get medicine to people and you need people with good moral corridors to say, hey, this is what we have. This is what we're making. This is what we're going to patients. Let's move on. I mean, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I think it's it's fair for regulators um, to do some form of a compliance check without guns. Um, because now, have any of the cannabis plants at your farm attacked anyone? I don't know. I, some of these with this new soil we're making with the soil science we have. Man, they're like, they're like uh, fly, they're like Venus fly traps, man. I'm like, holy shit. We have, we have seen such cool stuff happen lately with soil science and getting away from off the shelf nutrients and teas. It's been amazing, man. And, and so no, no, we haven't anybody attack them, but they look like it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so the, the safety is there the, with, with a uh, number of patients um, registered at your site and uh, it, it would probably be a pretty easy task for someone from the Department of Agriculture, for example. I'm, I'm not sure if the Department of Health is qualified to look at uh, plant biology, but it would seem like it would be a fairly easy task to come out and see if the plants were attacking anyone. Um, for sure. Of course, of course if, if your plants were attacking anyone, then maybe the police would get called. But um, <laughs> providing a path for regulators <clears throat> to, to be involved and, and feel welcomed, um, yes. I, I think is super important. But 
But more important than providing that pathway is this shift that I think we need to make from this hiding. Everyone yes. is hiding. And yes. I don't know if they enjoy hiding or if, <clears throat> I, I don't know, but I know our craft growers are like you as well, where they don't have to grow thousands of plants. They, they can, they can grow, you know, they can practice their craft. So thank you. For yeah. And I just, I'd have to say, just to interrupt you real quick that we did have DOH finally come out to our site the first time ever in five years, they came out in December and we felt like everything was cool. You know, the law enforcement stuff was a little heavy and it was very confusing. If it would have just been the DOH ladies, I think everything would have been a little more easy to understand, but they came onto our site. They saw the plants tagged and labeled. They saw what was going on, but then they come back and report that we're abusing the system. It's very, very frustrating and confusing when that's not what we felt at all when they were there. So I feel like the DOH has been driven by dispensaries to say, hey, we want these small farms shut down. And I've heard that over and over again from reliable sources that Vertical, vertical, vertical. Nobody else is getting into this game. And that's unfortunate because we can help them be millionaires if that's what they really want to be. Me, myself, I don't need to be a millionaire. But those guys want to be millionaires and appease their investors, then support the small farms and open this up, man, because we're going to help you do that. You know, and it's just very, yeah, it's very frustrating to see, you know, even like, you know, the, the dispensary owner from Kauai just saying, hey, you know, have an email conversation to him to say, hey, I know you're growing more than you got. You're putting it in the black market. I'm like, why do you think that's who I am? Why, why would I come forward and talk to you if you think that's the person I am? Well, I know how much you can grow per plant. I'm just like, come on, man. I'm like, <laughs> I got everything in the world to risk. I don't want to be there. So, you know, and uh, that's the way we've been carrying ourselves. You know, we don't want to risk anything. We want to take care of people and feel good about it. And that's where we've been for many years now. It's much appreciated, and 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 thank you for sharing the SOPs on co compliance checks. Um, is there a way that uh, someone could get those SOPs uh, from you guys uh, if they wanted to come out of hiding? And oh yes, most definitely. And I, you know, I don't know if you if you ever call it come out of hiding. You know, because I imagine that those will be challenged as well. I think what's good about it is our our lawyer Joseph Rosenbaum is always on that. He's done a lot of investigative work pulling search warrant stuff pulling cannabis stuff and this is what we've come up with what is by law and so that's what you have to follow you have to follow the law and just if they come in and take everything then they're going to come in and take everything and then it's called a lawsuit so you can get everything back so um that's on them you can't scare them there i've had plenty of people say do you have a search warrant and they're like out of the way man and so it's very you know it's humbling. It's scary. It never stops, you know? And then you got guys on your, your, uh, the last people that came to us, they had Pacalolo badges on with crosses on them, like Ghostbusters. I mean, this is like the Reagan days. They had patches on their flag vest that had a Pacalolo leave with a cross through it. This is December, 2021. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> We, 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 hear, we hear a lot of stories, and yeah. uh, unfortunately, there's no reporting uh, when this happens. Um, Correct. We're only left with uh, going to the police commission, and that doesn't work, and there, there's Correct. really no way to uh, require someone to follow the law that's responsible for following the law already. Um, and our and our lawyer has won some successful cases, a case in YPO where they broke into the house and did that kind of stuff. They got all their stuff back in their licenses. I mean, it caused chaos, but lawsuits do work. And so you need to make sure that if you are worried about those things to find a lawyer, he's very affordable. He's, you know, you pay him when you need him. And so when those guys come in, that's when you probably need them. And, you know, we want to share that information with farms across the Oahu and Hawaii. We want to share everything we're doing. So we can pass this energy on to many people across Hawaii that we respect and our growers and our people that want to get into the growing industry to let them know there's a safe way to do this. And it's, it's very tough right now, you know, and we, you know, I, I can't do this by myself. This has got to be done by thousands of farms. And that's what we're all about. As soon as we get this going next, who's the next family that wants to run a farm next, who's the next family that wants to run a farm. I mean, let's, 
we're going back to Hawaii ag and now we're going to have something sustainable that works. You know what I mean? And, and with all the, and then with all the rules and the, the protocols in place, so you can't fail. And we, we help each other out as Ohana's and a hui of cannabis growers. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of us on in the event now still. And, and I, I think a lot would agree with your sentiments. Um, does, if, if anyone has any questions for Jason, uh, you know, you can go ahead and unmute yourself up. I'll, I'll ask one more question while people are getting their questions ready. I think um, these guys are ready to go home. <laughs> it's been a long day and I've, I've allowed us to run over time and I, I hope it's working great. Um, I'd like to just make one comment real quick with hearing the ledge speak and the senators and stuff like that, that there is still a lot of education that needs to take place uh, with, with our younger and older educators. Um, I like a lot what they're saying, but I'm still hearing a lot of the same stuff about THC potency. And that's, we already understand a lot of that stuff. I mean, you know, and, um, you know, and, and medical and getting it tested and stuff like that. I mean, that is the whole problem that that kind of nuance of, it must be tested to be safe. When you take it to the level of FDA and go to that high level, you've now brought so many things into a medicinal world, an ethnobotany world, a flower world, that you've changed the whole dynamics of it. So you have to come back off that a little bit and understand really what you're dealing with. And what you're dealing with is a medicinal plant that has uh, drug properties. And so, you know, and that's, that's what we're dealing with here. And that, that needs to be highly educated to people or they're going to be stuck. Even Colorado right now, the millions of billions of dollars they had, you think they, they would have already lobbied out and taken care of everybody. And they're now running into THC percentage problems. They've already been going for five years. And so to understand what rosin is at 60%. And, you know, I think that my, probably my take home biggest thing is cannabis does not kill people and patients will learn the medicine they need from the people that are around them. And if they need a microdose of five milligrams, we can make that for them. If they need rosin at 75% THC, we can get that to them. If they need a distillate pen that's 92% THC, we can do that for them. It's all just levels, but it's really healing people and where you are on that whole level of what does the medicine do for you and not get so caught up in, oh, it's got 30%, so that's dangerous. That's not even the science is there for that. Nobody's even listening to that stuff. So that's really difficult for me to understand that. I'm a biologist and a scientist. That's who I really am. This is my second job. So we use science in everything we're doing. And you can start pulling the data left and right for science and biology and what this is all about and make really, really good programs. Or you can sit up there and make stuff up and not know what you're doing and come up with a program we have right now, which is not, not, not good for anybody. So... Yeah. Right. It's not good for anyone. And it's, it's not good for the, the state or the country to Correct. make these uh, false accusations about safety yeah. uh, when we know what's going on with alcohol and, and other drugs. It, it's Correct. almost as though um, there's, there's two realities and or two perceptions of reality so uh, does anyone have any questions for jason and okay. i open my hands and arms to anybody who wants to come visit our farm you can i can give you my information you can email me it's uh if you've ever been on our farm on a patient uh, it's just it, the euphoria is just insane you will float around like you got snow underneath your feet it is the most amazing thing to see people coming through our gate it's the amazing thing to see families coming through our gate, older people. Our dynamics, our farm is probably 30% over the age of 60, another 40% vets. You know, it's just, it's just an amazing dynamic. And when you see auntie and uncle walk through that gate and they're just like, well, I heard about this. What's it all about? And you sit down and start talking to them and you ask them, well, why do you use cannabis? What do you want it for? You know what I mean? And you get them from like turning them into smokers to now taking like microdose honey on their toasts. They are floored, man. And that's what it's all about. You know, you, it's just amazing, man. It's just amazing. Yeah. Can, uh, can you provide your contact information? Um, we, can, we can publish it later. You can provide okay. it now. It's up to you. Yep. That's easy. I'm an easy text person. I'll give you my phone number and text away. Okay. 
Um, so uh, I'm not getting any questions. Are you guys yeah, waiting? I've for got me? a question. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a question about the business side of it. Like you, you have a farm business that's registered with the BREG and GE taxes and all of that. Correct. Were there, were there any extra steps that you had to take or like any resistance? Um, you know, it's not really, I would say no. There's no resistance because there's no laws in place, right? You have to, you have to figure it out on your own how you want to do the business part of it. You know, we kind of run a lease system um, where people lease the land and that kind of works out very well. But, you know, the, the taxes and the, the taxes and stuff aren't talking to the laws of Hawaii. And so that's a very different, for me, it's just honesty. I claim it, I, what I'm doing, a lot of the money that we get from our farm for leases goes back into the farm for more patients, yada, 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 yada. Um, because, you know, it kind of settles itself right now because it's not a money-making thing. It's a compassion medicine thing for right now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I only think it'll start becoming a, a money-making thing when the laws are in place. And they are, they do allow us to kind of, you know, be those people and, and step up to that world. But yeah, it's very, um, there's a lot of gray area going on and that's the problem. Yeah. Were you already a farm business to begin with? I was not. No, I was not. No, no. Okay. Are you listed as ag land are, and are you operating on ag land as, as I am, which is Correct. wonderful. Yes. This is agriculture too, where we're at right now. Yep. It's massive. Yep. A two acre parcel of land, we can build a 20,000 square foot greenhouse under exemption. And that 20,000 square foot greenhouse could take care of thousands of patients. We don't need thousands of patients, but that's the model, right? If you want to put patients on farms, you need to have the space, but it's very easy, very easy, but it's ag too. And for the gentleman that was just speaking before, if you'd like to talk off camera and talk more about how we set up our lease program and how we set up everything for safety and stuff like that, I'd be more than happy to do that. It's very honest and straightforward. It just gets yeah. a little more time consuming talking about it on, on this, on this forum for sure. Yeah. I'd be real interested in talking. Yes. About no that. problem, man. Easy, right. easy. I'd love right. to. Cool. Well, I, I think we're, we're not exactly hitting attrition and I hate to shut it down, but I did make a promise that it would run till three o'clock and uh, I really appreciate everyone being here after the, you know, I've been in a lot of zoom meetings and no one stays after the meeting. So um, I think it's a real testament to what you've got going on, Jason, and, and all of our interests to work together. And uh, are there any more questions before we give our closing gratitude? Yeah, I have one question for you, Jason. Can you just quickly um, go through the patient education process for some people that's listening? Yeah, sure. That's no problem at all. Um, basically, if you have your 329 card or if you don't have a 329 card, uh, the way it kind of works for us is you basically join our Ohana, our farm, come on our grow site and you grow with us. And that's, it's simple, man. And, and um, you know, it's always, our whole farm has been established by uh, patient to patient relationships. We've never reached out and said, Hey, we want to bring on all these people. It, it didn't work like that. I mean, you guys, I started this five years ago with 20 people trying to do cancer stuff. And now we're like in the hundreds and I'm just like, what the heck? is going on here. You know what I mean? And it's just like, you can't stop this flow because what happens is, is people need this medicine. They're like, well, what can I do? What can I do? And so, you know, you just, you go with the flow. You know, there was a point in time where we thought, well, let's limit it to a hundred people. But when you limit it to a hundred people, then there's a thousand people suffering and you go, well, if we can make it work and we can make it for 500 people or 800 people or 2000 people, then why wouldn't we do that? You know, it's like if we can make it a safe place and a growing place and an educational place and a safe medicine place, how can we turn people away? You know what I mean? And so that's what turned me into who I am now. I was just a grower. I didn't have a voice. And then falling around like Wendy and all these guys, Dr. Otto, yourself included, it's turned me into um, a patient rights advocate, you know, whether I wanted to be one or not. So there it is. <laughs> so yes, yeah, they can join our site. Yep. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Don't be shy. 
if you got a farm and you want to know the deal, ask a question. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jason. Um, I really appreciate you coming out and providing some, a, a very clear message about what you're doing and the need um, to be out in the open, I think is, is really important. This is how we grow our, our small craft industry is by doing it. And so I really appreciate what you're doing and the number of patients that you're supporting um, is incredibly helpful. Um, like to thank uh, the Department of Health uh, for listening in today. Like to thank um, anyone that may still be on from the Department of Public Safety. Like to thank all of our state, county, federal workers. We hear your voices as well. Um, I know it's tough in those unions. Um, like to thank our patients um, who are in the hospital. Um, who are at home, who may be dealing with things that uh, we can't possibly imagine, but uh, they took the time to check in with us today. Um, I'd like to thank all of our legislators, Joyce Ann Buenaventura, Senator Laura, Laura Casio, Representative Illigan, Representative Capella, um, we love our, our freshman legislators, we love our senior legislators, and we are incredibly grateful for your participation today to, to hear what uh, patients are doing. Thank you again to all of the organizers on each island that have helped uh, make the event possible, um, for bringing in your presenters, for attending endless meetings, for um, all of the work that you're doing individually on your islands. And I'd like to give a, a big thanks to Dr. Clifton Otto for creating uh, Medical Cannabis Day and his work at the federal level, his work at the state level, and the results that we're seeing at the county level. Um, so I would like to thank Governor Ige um, for proclaiming today, June 14th, Medical Cannabis Day. I'd like to thank all of our county mayors, uh, thank you, uh, Kauai Mayor Derek Kawakami, uh, for your heartfelt message this morning. Uh, you really made patients feel good. So thank you for that. All of our presenters, Justin Kohler, for uh, your mana'o on Kauai, uh, deeply appreciated. And don't worry, I'm not going to go through every presenter, but um, please know that I'm incredibly grateful. We're all incredibly grateful. We are one big ohana. And we are a driving force for every single one of us that anyone has seen in here today. There are at least a thousand more behind us that have your backs. So thank you. And with that, uh, hui ho. Aloha. Thank you.